Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Rafael Espinon. I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Thank you all for attending today's hearing on intro 1476A, which bans the sale of fur apparel in New York City. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues. We have, of course, the City Council Speaker, Corey Johnson, and the sponsor of the bill. Uh, we also have uh, Council Member Adonis Rodriguez, Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and Council Member Francisco Cabrera all with us today. Uh, with that said, I would like to turn to the speaker to give a few opening remarks on his bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Espinal. No, 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 no clapping here today, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon. Uh, millions of animals are killed every year for their fur. It could take hundreds of lives to make a single coat. While New York is the fashion capital of the world, we are behind the times when it comes to this issue. Other major U.S. cities in over 20 countries around the world have, bur have banned fur farming or the import and sale of animal fur products. Stella McCartney famously said, fur is the most unnecessary thing in the world, and she is not alone in her beliefs. Donna Karen, Michael Kors, Diane von Furstenberg, Tommy Hilfiger, Gucci, Burberry, Chanel, Armani, Furla, Philip Lim, Vivian Westwood, and the list goes on, have all taken steps to eliminate fur and institute fur-free policies. This bill that we are hearing today will ban the sale of new fur products within the five boroughs and prevent the unnecessary slaughter of animals going forward. This bill will not prevent the selling or repurposing of used fur garments or anyone from wearing or owning fur in New York City. We are not about to raid your closet. Today, I think it's important to talk about the real truth behind the so-called glitz and glamour of the fur industry. Despite their claims to the contrary, there is no such thing, in my estimation, as ethical fur, or ecological fur, or excellent welfare fur. That is marketing language aimed at hiding the brutality of this business. In fact, those claims are so misleading that advertisements making them have been banned in other countries. The industry would have us all ignore the well-documented local ecological destruction and farther reaching environmental harms of fur farming and the hazards of carcinogenic chemicals. Meanwhile, the evidence of cruelty in the fur industry is overwhelming and irrefutable. Animals like mink, foxes, raccoons, chinchillas, rabbits, even dogs and cats in some countries are forced to live their entire lives in conditions no one of conscience could ever condone. These animals will spend every waking moment in tiny wire cages where their waste piles up beneath them, their feet never touch the ground, deprived of basic elements of well-being, they suffer intense psychological distress which manifests most horrifically when they attack or cannibalize their cage mates. Wounds and infections go untreated, only their pelts end up mattering. These animals are then killed through bludgeoning, neck breaking, stomping, gassing, electrocution through the mouth and, mouth and genitals, throats being slit while shackled upside down, slow asphyxiation, dehydration, and starvation after days of psychological terror in a, tr in a trap perhaps gnawing off a leg in a desperate attempt at freedom, or perhaps worst of all, being skinned alive. Death by electrocution, it's a practice so barbaric that our own state legislature banned it in 2013. Other jurisdictions consider it a best practice. Undercover footage and eyewitness accounts bring these grim facts to life. And I'd like to share some of that footage with you today, which illustrates more powerfully than words can the needless suffering of these animals. This video created by Fur Free New York does contain some graphic images of animal suffering, so people are welcome to leave the room. I wanna give everyone a second. If you wanna leave the room, you can raise your hand and leave the room before we play the video. If anyone wants to leave, this graphic footage we're about to show. Okay, let's play the video. Meet Bailey. Bailey was born on a fur farm. She has never touched grass. Bailey will be kept in this same cage until she's skinned for her pelt. 
It takes 11 Baileys to make a single coat. And that's not unusual. In fact, the fur industry kills over 100 million animals every year. 85% of them, like Bailey, live their entire lives on fur farms, many suffering from anxiety-induced psychosis and sometimes even cannibalizing their cage mates in response to confinement until it's their turn to be killed in one of a variety of cruel ways. The other 15 to 20% are caught with brutal traps, the use of which is practically unregulated. Stuck in these barbaric contraptions for days at a time, dehydrated and desperate animals will thrash around to the point of breaking their own bones and sometimes even chew off their own limbs in their attempts to escape. That's a lot of suffering. It's also a lot of damage to the environment. According to the World Bank, fur production is one of the world's five worst industries for toxic metal pollution and uses formaldehyde and chromium, both of which have been linked to cancer. Fur farming creates ammonia runoff that leads to toxic eutrophication within our own water supply, and studies show it's much worse for the environment than faux fur and other textile alternatives. And the most important and saddest fact of all, it's all unnecessary. New York is the fashion capital of the world, which makes it the fur capital of the world. Banning the sale of fur here means the demand for it in fashion stops. When the demand for fur stops, the inhumane suffering stops. The environmental pollution ends. The fur industry is claiming that a New York City ban on fur sales will cause job loss. The truth is, fur manufacturing jobs only account for one half of 1% of all New York City fashion jobs, and the skills used in fur jobs are transferable. Over a thousand of fashion's most respected designers, brands, and retailers have already moved on from fur. Innovations in material technology, including biofabrication, high-tech and sustainable recycled fibers, and plant-based organics don't involve a single trap or cage, and are creating more and more job opportunities. Good design should not only be beautiful, but ethical. This is New York. We're better than fur, and it's time we proved it. Stop the suffering of innocent animals, stop the poisoning of our environment, and support a move to more responsible, sustainable fashion by the simple act of voting to make New York City fur-free. Uh, this video is a mere snapshot of the conditions for countless animals killed for their fur, merely so that we can enjoy a coat, some trims, or a keychain. A ban on fur will mean an end to an unimaginable suffering and senseless violence. It will also be an impetus for innovation and evolution, a challenge which the creative minds of our city are well suited to take on. I take seriously the consequences a fur sales ban would have on businesses, and I urge local furriers and manufacturers to diversify and embrace innovations that are already underway in the fashion industry. Companies are revolutionizing the creation of raw apparel materials, creating faux furs and other textiles from recycled materials and from ocean plastics. Faux fur made of hemp and organic cotton is now available, and cutting edge biofabricators are developing ethical lab-grown fur. Opponents of this bill have decried the potential loss of a historic tradition that is older than the city itself. They've pointed to our city flag, if you're familiar with it, then you will know that it features a pair of beavers, symbols of the past, but also of our present. Beavers once populated our state in numbers that estimated 60 million, but colonial trapping for their pelts and trade practices decimated their numbers. By the early 19th century, they had vanished entirely from the city of New York. But through our conservation efforts and the animal's tenacity, we are seeing a resurgence. In 2007, the first beaver in over 200 years reappeared in the Bronx River. That is a legacy worth honoring and worthy of a modern day city. If beavers are a feature of our city flag, it should be because they are alive and well in our rivers and streams, not because they are hanging dead on racks in our stores. Much has changed over 400 years including our attitudes toward the treatment of animals. We no longer see animals as just a resource to exploit for any reason at any cost. 
We already ban or severely restrict the import or sale of products from several animals, including African and Asian elephant ivory, rhino horns, sea turtle shells, and leather uh, walrus ivory, several species of migratory birds whose feathers were used in hats, and polar bears, to name a few. New York City has also banned the use of elephants and other exotic animals in the circus, and we're ready and able to do more to protect them. This legislation cultivates and promotes a culture that is humane to animals. It is the moral thing to do. Thank you, Chairman Espinal. I turn it back to you. Hold your, hold your applause, please. Uh, thank you, Corey. And before we move forward, I just want to acknowledge we've been joined by Kevin Kozlowitz from Queens. Uh, we have Councilman Brad Lander from Brooklyn. We have Keith Powers from Manhattan, Bob Holden from Queens, also Margaret Chin from Manhattan, uh, Peter Coop from Queens, and Chaim Deutsch from Brooklyn. Great to see everyone here. Uh, thank you, Corey, again. Before we call up the first panel, I'd like to reiterate that I, I understand the concerns of both the animal advocates and those fighting to save their businesses. I do share the speaker's concerns regarding the inhumane treatment of animals, and it's an issue I care about. The environment's also a big issue that matters to me. I also understand the concerns of small business owners, some of whom are here today who are fearful of what this bill can mean for them and the people they employ. The goal of today's hearing is to get to the bottom of the facts. I look forward to hearing testimony from all sides that addresses the concerns over the sale of fur apparel. I know that there is a lot of misinformation that can be used to advance arguments on either side of the debate, so I look forward to hearing accurate and evidence-based claims today. Finally, as the chair of the Consumer Affairs Committee, I pride myself on making myself available to hear from people from all sides. I look around today and I see that I'm definitely going to have that opportunity. So I thank you all for taking your time today to provide your feedback. I also want to assure everyone that even though we will be setting the time clock so that we can hear as many people as possible, all of your testimony will be given equal weight when we consider whether we move this bill forward. I know I now would like to call up the first panel. Uh, we have Tim Gunn from Project Runway, Eileen Jefferson from HSVMA, Joshua Catcher from Parsons School of Design, and Ali Feldman-Taylor, voters for animal rights. So, Mr. Chairman, so this first panel is of folks that are in favor, and the second panel are going to be people that are opposed to the bill. You may begin once you're ready. Just make sure your mic is on if you hit the button. It's, it's on, yes, yes, thank you. Honorable council members, throughout my career as chair of the Department of Fashion Design at Parsons, as chief creative officer at Liz Claiborne, and as co-host of Project Runway, I have advocated against fur. The fashion business has a troubling history with animals, but it, it's quickly evolving. Believe it or not, furriers used to slide up, slice up chimpanzees, gorillas, monkeys, leopards, baby seals, and tigers for their fur. Most of that was declared illegal in the 1970s when the federal government enacted the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. Now, it's time to safeguard all the other animals from such gratuitous violence by supporting City Council Speaker Corey Johnson's bill to ban fur sales in New York City, as lawmakers have already done in Los Angeles and San Francisco. There isn't much to be happy about in politics today, but this trend towards kindness should give everyone hope. At Parsons, the fur trade enjoyed years of unchallenged promotion in which it enticed budding designers to work with fur by offering them free pelts, trips to Scandinavia, and sponsorships. I introduced a program in which PETA was given equal time to screen videos showing what happens to animals on fur farms around the world before their pelts end up in New York showrooms. Foxes, rabbits, chinchillas, and even dogs and cats are anally electrocuted, gassed, bludgeoned, and often skinned alive. 
Student interest in the FUR program dried up as quickly as enthusiasm for sustainable design increased. Consumer demand for FUR has plummeted. According to the treasurer of Greater FUR New York, just 14 retail storefronts selling FUR remained in the garment district in 2018, down from 450 in 1977. This year, there are even fewer. Fashion has evolved. Designers are finding it increasingly easy to be creative without being destructive. Hundreds of fabrics have been developed that are more eco-friendly and animal-friendly. I thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Joshua Catcher. I'm a fashion designer, author, and educator. I've taught at Parsons and lectured internationally on the topics of ethics and sustainability in fashion. The beauty of a garment should be matched by the beauty of how it was made. This is why fur is the epitome of bad design. So many respected brands, retailers, cities, and countries have already left fur behind. In this age of transparency, any positive symbol of fur crumbles when the truth about how it is made is revealed. In the past two months, five major studies and polls from respected firms like the Boston Consulting Group show that demand for fur is plummeting. Shoppers want cruelty-free products. The fur industry's profits hinge on lies they tell and truths they hide. And fur production is hidden for good reason. A typical fox or mink on a factory farm will languish. These are wild animals stuck in small wire cages for their entire lives. This is not natural. Then they are anally or vaginally electrocuted, gassed, or worse, some are skinned alive. Imagine the desperation. Consider the animal's perspective. Now multiply that by over 100 million. The fur industry wants you to think that formaldehyde, chromium, and chemically dyed fur is natural and sustainable. Their misleading ads have already been exposed by the French and Dutch advertising standards authorities for making dubious, natural, sustainable, and humane treatment claims. Those same ads are running here in American fashion magazines. Let's talk about jobs. The fur industry claims that furriers can do no other work, yet they know how to design, pattern, sew, drape, sample, merchandise, and more. Fur is simply one input. I've taught fashion students, and I assure you that every single one of those skills are valuable, in demand, and transferable. Fur is obsolete. Thank you. Honorable council members, my name is Dr. Eileen Jefferson. I'm a full-time practicing veterinarian, as well as the New York State representative for the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association. We are a national association of veterinary professionals focused on animal health and welfare. On behalf of our 9,000 veterinary professional members nationwide and 330 in New York, we support passage of intro 1476 to ban the sale of fur in New York City. The production of fur relies upon inhumane methods of husbandry and trapping, which drastically compromise the health and welfare of the animals used. Millions of rabbits, mink, foxes, and other wild animals are confined lifelong in cramped wire-floored cages on factory fur farms. There they are deprived of their abilities to engage in natural behaviors such as hunting, digging, and swimming. They are often kept in unnatural social groups as well. For example, mink are forced to live in extremely close proximity to each other despite not doing so in nature. The contrived living conditions on fur farms inevitably lead animals inevitably lead animals to suffer severe psychological and physical distress. Instances of unproductive repetitive behavior, a sign of compromised psychological well-being, have been well documented on fur farms, as have cannibalism, untreated wounds, foot deformities, and eye infections. The animals on fur farms are typically killed via medically and ethically objectionable methods, such as gassing or electrocution. Less frequently, animals may be trapped in the wild for their pelts. Animals caught in crippling leg hole traps also undergo immense compromise and suffering, which can include hemorrhage, lacerations, psychological distress, and self-trauma. These animals are often forced to spend days lingering without food or water. In addition, these archaic traps remain a public health and environmental concern, as they may injure and kill unintended targets, including threatened species, pets, or even human beings. Consumer choices have for many years been trending away from fur products. We hope the New York City Council will take a firm lead on this issue. We strongly support intro 1476. 
Thank you. Speaker Johnson, Chairman Espinal, and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. My name is Allie Feldman Taylor, and I'm the president and founder of Voters for Animal Rights in Brooklyn. I'm here as a resident of New York City, a voter, and in my official capacity to represent our thousands of supporters in New York City. We are an all-volunteer grassroots organization. Today, you will hear testimony from those who support and those that oppose. I ask that you consider the motives behind every person who testifies today. The dozens of experts and hundreds of advocates who are in this room in support of banning the sale of fur are here for one simple reason. Animals do not have a voice and suffer greatly at the hands of the very people who are here to oppose this bill. Those who testify in opposition do it because they profit from the abuse that this bill seeks to end. In front of you, you have a bound packet. We've prepared an informational packet for your consideration that I think you'll find very helpful. Inside, you will find facts and evidence in support of the bill, including polling numbers showing that 75% of New York City voters support this bill. This poll was conducted by Mason Dixon and shows overwhelming support for the legislation across every borough, every demographic, and every political party. Also in your packet is a letter of support from over 50 not-for-profit organizations that are part of our Fur Free NYC coalition, representing hundreds of thousands of supporters. There's also a letter of support from over 30 veterinarians. The fur industry cannot win a civil debate on the merits, so they resort to using their money to bully and spread misinformation to the general public and the city council, representing everything that's wrong in politics. They've hired expensive lobbyists and marketing firms to spin the truth, sent out thousands of mailers and robocalls with misinformation attacking some of you on this very committee, and have bought ads that are riddled with lies to cause fear among New Yorkers. And recently, they've gone so far as to create fake Twitter accounts controlled by the fur industry, pretending to be New York City residents and attacking Speaker Johnson personally. We've called on the fur industry to apologize for these tactics, but they've refused. All of these tactics we find ridiculous, but we're gonna take the high road while they take the low road. We're at a pivotal we are at a pivotal juncture in our society. We can either take back our democracy from unethical industries or allow those with money to undermine and destroy what makes New York a beacon of light for good. We ask humbly to reject their lies, abusive practices, and support a more compassionate New York City. You just saw actual footage of the animals being caged, killed, skinned alive, and trapped in steel traps. This bill is about those animals who do not have a voice. Fur is a relic of the past and has no place in a progressive, civilized New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker Johnson. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you to the panel uh, for testifying today. Um, so I have a few questions and anyone uh, can answer. Um, so some argue that this industry needs to be more strictly regulated, that if we created additional regulations, that uh, that would be a solution. Is it possible, do you believe, to farm animals for their fur in a humane manner that could be implemented through legislation? No. The fur industry is entirely self-regulated. Um, the auditors are paid for by the fur industry. Uh, this is an industry that um, any welfare measure cannot meet the needs uh, of, of these animals. Anyone else on the panel? I would, I would point out that there's a, a big difference here between what we might use with farm animals, using um, for farm animals that are used for food. Those are domesticated animals and they are more able to benefit from incremental change, but because we're dealing with wild animals, the husbandry of those animals is always going to have an element of an inhumane quality because we are never going to be able to keep them in, a, in an environment that even starts to mimic their natural environment while they are being utilized. Uh, Tim, I had a question for you. Um, when I have uh, talked to some furriers about the fact that some of the major fashion designers that I had mentioned in my opening statement that you had mentioned in your testimony, whether it be Donna Karen or Donatella Versace or Stella McCartney, the list goes on and on and on of folks who said they're no longer using uh, fur uh, in their fashion label. What folks have said to me is, for those fashion labels, 
fur is really incidental. It's not a major component uh, of their business. So they are able to make that decision without it affecting their bottom line in a significant way. And that they made this, what I've heard is they've made the decision based off of outside pressure, not because of their own ethical concerns related to fur. I was wondering if you had any information or perspective, given your role in the fashion world and your interaction with these major designers that you've worked with over the years, who have made this decision? Speaker Johnson, I, I would like to respond by saying that there are many people who believe that fashion and fur are inextricable, that, that basically that they're married, and I say that that's preposterous. And as in my role as an educator, I'd like to think that I educated eight years worth of, of young designers who came to terms with the fact that fashion and, and, and fur are not even related in a manner of speaking, and, and that they don't even belong together, and that anyone who wants a fur-like garment can go to faux sources. Um, I really profoundly believe that it's an entirely unnecessary waste of lives and even human labor to be supporting this industry. But that's also very, very personal. And in my role at Liz Claiborne, where I was chief creative officer, at the time that I entered the company, there were 48 brands, and we vowed collectively um, to go for free in all of the brands. And some of them were, were fledgling. They were, they were up and coming. Um, others were more mature and, and had a loyal following. Um, and in my role on Project Runway, I said that the only way that I will participate in this program is if, in fact, it's fur free. And we agreed, and it certainly has never affected the quality um, or the perception of the work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as supporters of trapping have argued that it's an important conservation method, uh, and I wanted to hear any perspective on if you believe that trapping uh, has conservation value, and what are the alternatives to trapping? I don't know if you, uh, the, um, from the Humane Society for Veterinary Medical Association, if you had any perspective? Approximately 85% of the fur that's produced is produ produced in factory fur farms, so trapping does make up the minority. Um, but the, the method used for trapping is obviously inherently inhumane. And I'm sorry, could you repeat the question one time? I was just wondering if, if there has been uh, information that said that trapping is a, an important conservation method, and if you had a perspective on that. As far as I know, the the animals that are used in fur, for that are trapped for fur, are not are not species that are overpopulated. the The ecology of of the situation it does not at all benefit from animals being trapped. And there is a very serious concern, and one that um, has been a concern to me, even though, of course, this is my bill that we've put forward and that we're hearing today, and I've said very openly that I am a um, big animal lover and want us to live in a more humane and just society and city, but there is a concern about the loss of jobs. There is a concern about um, people whose families have worked in this industry for a very long time, and their skill set is working on manufacturing these, doc uh, these, these garments and being able to sell them, what would happen to these individuals where this is their lives? And I wanted to understand uh, from, the, from the fashion side, from the, the side of manufacturing clothes, what your perspective on that is, that there is also a human cost involved here as well if we go down this route. I don't know if Joshua or Tim. I can speak to that. Um, these skills, I think, I think the mythology that's being perpetuated here is that skilled laborers can do no other work other than this one singular input, which is fur. And working with fur requires uh, many, many skills. And those skills can be used and uh, used with different inputs. I personally produce clothing here in New York City. I personally produce accessories here in New York City. And I work with 
manufacturers that use a variety of materials, some including fur, and they are very happy to work with the other materials that I bring them, and I pay them, and they make things, and I, I can't imagine a, a person who is a skilled manufacturer and producer who knows how to work with fur that can't work with any other fabric. I just can't imagine that. I mean, I agree. I, a material is a material is a material. And repurposing a, a skill set for a, a different material is, I, I don't want to make it sound as though it's um, instantaneous, but it's, it's certainly doable, and it's what people in other industries do when certain aspects of that industry disappear. So I, I would say it's, it's, a, it's easily achieved. I agree with Joshua. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members that have signed up for questions? Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Cabrera. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you for uh, being a, a voice uh, for those literally who can't speak for themselves. Um, I had a couple of questions. One was in uh, regards to um, the document that you provided. It says the People for Ethical Treatment of Animal has also shown how more than half of the first sold in the United States imported from China, a country that has virtually no regulations to protect furs, fur animals, and that those furs sometimes come excuse me, come from domestic dogs and cats and are internationally un or intentionally or unintentionally mislabeled as fox, as, as other animal species. Can you give me more, do you have any more details on that? I can, I can answer that quickly. Um, the reason that the Truth and Fur Labeling Act was passed into law several years ago was because of this very problem. There was loopholes that allowed the furs coming into the United States, over uh, more than 50% of which um, are imported and coming from places like China. Um, there is a well-documented and, and scientific and evidence-based history of fibers being found, sold at major department stores through major brands and ending up here in New York City. And when they're tested, some of them have been found to be domesticated cat, domesticated dog, or the incorrect species. So there was an entirely uh, this, this is evidence of how unregulated this industry is. And that's something that we're finding specifically here, right here in New York City? Yes. Wow, amazing. Uh, talk to me, uh, Tim, maybe, or anybody on the panel. How, do you, how, how have you seen uh, the cultural change? Uh, where you mentioned earlier we used to have 400 plus uh, uh, manufacturers are here in the city, now we're yeah. down, I think, 14. Uh, can you talk to a little bit about the cultural change, the sentiments of New Yorkers? Well, uh, there used to be 450 uh, fur storefronts. Um, I, I don't know how many manufacturers, actually. Um, and that was in the 1970s. There's, there's an erosion in the perception of fur as being a, a luxury um, item and in f fur as being a modern item. Um, I, I know that, that the, the fur industry likes to say it's not your grandmother's coat anymore, um, and there have been many attempts, and, and I won't qualify them, but many attempts to make fur more modern and therefore more um, relatable. Um, it just doesn't have the uh, sort of luster that it used to have. and. I don't believe we should return to a time when it does. And mm -hmm. the, the more support we can give to alternative um, textiles and, and in particular faux fur, um, just, uh, the better off this city will be and this country will be and quite frankly the world will be. And it's exciting to be here today and to see that we're on the cusp of that. Indeed. In, in regards to the, the trends that we're seeing coming from a business standpoint and an innovation standpoint, there are currently right now companies here in the Northeast who are growing leather in the laboratory. There are companies who already have on the market lab-grown silks. Um, 
there are companies in Europe who are working on lab-grown fur. We can grow protein fibers without the animal attached to it, and there is so much potential and innovation in some of this technology. We have companies that are making biosynthetics from algae. We have companies that are crafting infinitely recyclable synthetics from the waste of the fishing industry, from fishing nets. Um, we can make luxurious fabrics from citrus peels, from pineapple, from mushrooms, from agricultural waste. The limit is only a limit of imagination and a limit of a need for innovation, and this innovation is going to result in jobs that are here, where the innovation is happening. And as, a, as an educator, I can, I can see that these students that I've worked with, they want access to the most cutting edge, sustainable, ethical, real sustainable, ethical materials. And they don't, most of them don't want to be working with the materials of the past. It's, it's, it's limiting from a design standpoint, and there are ethical and sustainability pitfalls that are unavoidable. And so it's totally unnecessary. That's, that's the point that you're making, right? The I'm, the I'm sorry? It's totally unnecessary to... Within the context... With all the technology that we have. Within the context of a place like New York City, yes, it's unnecessary. Absolutely. And last, uh, if you could give me a little bit more of the environmental impact uh, that... Uh, that we will have if we were to have positive environmental impact if we were to have the ban of fur in New York City? What would the, what would the positive environmental impact be? Yes. Um, well, think of a, imagine a fur farm. This is a factory farm. It's uh, like any factory farm. It's fossil fuel dependent. Um, these are animals that are crammed into a very small space. The, eco the ecosystems have not evolved to handle that many animals in a small amount of space. So you have to consider the high concentrations of ammonia and phosphorus. Their, their foods are supplemented with things like this. It ends up in runoff in the local aquatic ecosystems, and it causes something called toxic eutrophication, which sucks the oxygen out of aquatic systems and kills wildlife. And then. You can't go in that water. You can look uh, in Canada, in Nova Scotia, there is a wonderful case study by the Suzuki Foundation of what, of how the fur industry has devastated the aquatic ecosystems in that area. These family farms are making the water, uh, you can't go in the water, you, it's, it's poisonous, there's toxic cyanobacteria. This is not an eco-friendly industry. Just because the fiber is considered natural, the, what goes into it, formaldehyde, chromium, azo dyes, all of these things um, are not ecologically friendly and they are definitely not sustainable. Well, I want to take a moment to, uh, to uh, commend our speaker, I'm, I'm a co-prime of this bill, uh, for really listening to New Yorkers. It's hard to get New Yorkers to agree on just about any issue. And when you have 75% of them, and I looked at the numbers, the data from the Mason-Dixon, and it's all across every borough, the numbers almost look the same. So it's not, let me just be clear, this is not a Manhattan thing. People in the Bronx, I'm from the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, Staten Island, everybody is, is echoing this voice that the time is now, and we can't stay lagging behind. LA already passed it, San Francisco, now it's our turn. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Cabrera. Um, next we have Councilmember Rodriguez. Thank you. First of all, like, I've been clear, you know, in my years serving at the council that for me, a animal rights for me as we fight for human rights. And I think that we have a responsibility to stand not only for the current generation, but for the children. That I see the youngest one sitting there, they stand for my two daughters who are six and 12. We want to be sure that everyone, especially those who represent the industry, realize that we have a big responsibility to decide the future of our city. And I think that it is important to find a way on how investors get a return from the investment that the fashion industry, industry continue being alive in the city of New York. But the question is, can, how can that happen at the same time that also we address animal rights? How can I explain my six years old, so my six years old who love the chinchilla, that I support to continue industry that they kill those type of animal only to fulfill, you know, a, what they wealthy in a, individual, New Yorkers and other places demand. 
So I think that, again, it, we've been in, in, in similar fights in the past, and I really think the leadership of Speaker Johnson is standing for animal rights, not only in this bill, but in many other bills. So hopefully we will continue working together. Uh, he will continue leading conversation, not only with those like myself, even though my name is not there, please add my name to the bill, but also continue conversation with those who are against it. I see some individual, friend of mine there, that we've been marching for human rights. So this is the opportunity for us also to, to be able to address animal rights as a top priority in the city of New York. So with that, I just had a question on, which is like, why is fur any worse than binding leather? Because that's a, a that's a, um, that question is more because those who, who been organizing against the bill, they say, well, if you are uh, working on this bill, what about leather? So what answer can we give to those who uh, are against this bill when it comes to why is for fur any worse than burning leather? Leather is, is often produced as a byproduct of other industries, whereas the fur industry, these are millions of animals that are, that are either trapped or, or maintained in these fur factory farms solely for the purpose of raising them in usually what's a truncated lifespan for the sake of their pelt. So they're really just spending a few years in a torturous situation for a wild animal solely for the sake of that fur. So there are many people who you know, for example, will eat meat and will um, wear leather who will absolutely not wear fur for that reason. It, it is a particularly objectionable m method of husbandry for animals, and especially because they're wild animals and are subject to so much more fear and stress. And it's not something that goes out of them. It's, it's something that they are evolutionarily programmed to be in a certain environment. And when they're taken out of that environment or they're never even in that environment and they're, they're raised in a situation that is so unnatural, it is, it is a particularly egregious method of producing something that is really very unnecessary and is really just for the sake of a look. Thank you. Uh, Peter Koop. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my, my question is that we have been wearing fur coat since peace, historic times. No? And I, I believe Adam and Eve probably wear fur coat or something like that. Uh, so uh, I understand you have very really good intentions to uh, ban f fur sales, because it did create some cruelty to animals, no? So if there's a way we treat the animals differently, uh, like, like we, we, we kill cows every day, thousands of them, but, but we kill it in um, a humane way, right? Uh, you, uh, so is there any way you guys can amend to the, to the, to, to the ban? The not, like if we can modify the ways, uh, how we treat animals in the farms, uh, how to uh, uh, treat them humanely, and, and uh, how we uh, kill them humanely, and things like that. You know, can you guys you know, agree to some way, some uh, other ways of, uh, 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 my, my, maybe a, a lot of compete ban, you know? We take 10 years. Uh, to table off the sales, so that uh, those in the industry uh, have a way to uh, to adjust uh, to you know, to the total ban because the total ban is uh, is kind of harsh uh, to those people who have been in uh, making living uh, on this trade for many many years for many many generations. And it's, so it's hard for us to say, hey, stop this. No, we cannot do this. So we give them, say, five, 10 years to uh, stop this uh, sale in New York City. Can you, uh, you guys amend to that? 
I would say that because this is an issue that has really been extremely controversial for many, many decades, that the writing has been on the wall for a long time about this particular product, and it's something that people have been aware that in just in terms of the market trends and consumer choices, the way it's going is less and less and less towards fur. And especially, you know, the younger generation is really, is really very disinterested in fur, which is why they're using these marketing campaigns to try to appeal to younger people. But this is something that I, I feel, and I've seen this in other sectors of animal use in society, is that as, as we go towards this direction, the people are actually being aided because we're, we're helping the evolution of something that is, is going to be going away. So I, I feel like the sooner, cons the, the sooner that the businesses get on board with this, the better it will actually be for them. And I'd just like to repeat that there were 450 fur storefronts in New York City in, 19, in the 1970s, and there were 14 in 2018. So that says a tremendous amount. And um, I'd, al I'd also like to reiterate that um, this, this industry, when it comes to conditions and welfare measures, this is um, self-regulated with uh, auditors paid by the industry. Any welfare measures cost money, and this affects the bottom line. Um, I have seen animals on fur farms that have the highest ethical standards, supposedly, in Europe with untreated infections that have been languishing. Any, any measure to accommodate animal welfare um, chops away at that bottom line and it's a fragile it's a fra fragile economic system for farms some of them the smallest the smallest increase in, in the price of food for example would put fur businesses under so what would be required um, is just not economically feasible for something like the fur industry thank you uh, Mark Levine Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm incredibly proud that the city's become more and more attentive to issues of, of animal welfare and to humane treatment of animals, both domesticated and wild. I do want to ask you just a couple of questions. I think most New Yorkers have never seen uh, an animal trap and probably aren't familiar with even how the mechanism works. And um, may believe that it's a, a quote, natural uh, way to kill an animal. And maybe you could describe uh, the impact on animals and how, how these traps work. Actually, Dan Matthews is here, and he brought a trap with him. If you'd like him to demonstrate it, he can do that right now, if that's OK. Uh, Is it not working? It works. I would just narrate for a minute that this is not like a mouse trap where the animal is instantaneously killed or even it's not a situation like that. This is something where the animal's leg will be in this trap and the animal will linger like that potentially for days. So it's, this is not something that kills the animal humanely and quickly. Uh, Dan, we can try it uh, later. Maybe you can. I, I can Thank ask you. the follow-up. They're not gonna, usually used yeah. on carpet. We're gonna, yeah. Councilmember Levine's gonna ask some other additional I, questions. I did want to ask about an issue of particular concern. Are we okay? I just, Thank you. 
This is a leg hole trap. They cost $10 on Amazon. They have been banned in over 100 countries. They are legal in most of the United States. And this, this trap is meant for coyotes, but they do not discriminate. They capture dogs and cats and owls and other wildlife. And let's take a look at how they work. There's a reason 100 countries have outlawed these traps. New Jersey has outlawed them. Uh, it's okay, Dan, we're gonna, you're gonna be on an additional panel, so thank you for showing that. And uh, let's go back, Councilmember Levine, why don't you continue to ask us panel questions? And, and we look forward to hearing more about that. J just just uh, on, an, on, a, on another matter, there is real concern in New York City's uh, ultra-Orthodox Jewish communities about traditional garb that, uh, including a hat known as a strimal, uh, that is made of fur. And I'm wondering whether, as advocates, uh, you have a take on uh, an exemption for religious garb. I'll take the real tough one. Um, I'm, a, I'm a practicing Jewish woman myself, um, but I am not Orthodox. Um, however, I am very familiar with the community, being that my best friend is actually Orthodox herself. And um, while she does not support the hats, um, I think this is a tough one in that um, you know we have to find a balance. Um, and while you know I think any animal rights advocate, we would not like to make exceptions, we do understand that that may be the reality. Um, our goal at the end of the day is to reduce suffering for the greatest number of animals possible. And if having a religious exemption means that we can have this law passed and save millions of animals per year, then of course that's something that we would support. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the speaker in the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I, I do want to start by saying that I applaud our panel and our speaker for their longtime leadership to ban fur. I support the ban for three reasons. One is uh, killing the animals is unethical and unnecessary. Two, because uh, of the work of PETA and the fashion leaders like Tim, Tim Gunn, Michael Kors, Gucci, um, yourself, Joshua, um, fur products are not available, nor as proven by the 70% figure, is there really a demand for fur anymore. And third, there is a strong exception for religious customs and that is important to me. I do have one question, and although this is not part of the bill, um, I do just want to hear your opinion about feathers, and in particular, thinking about um, Canada Goose Down jackets. Is there um, an ethical reason to uh, move to ban feathers as well? Or would you put it in the category, as you talked about before, with um, leather and the use of um, cows for meat? Uh, where, where do you come down on that issue? Thank you. Um, what, I, what I'll say is that uh, when, when garments end up on the rack, what the majority of us are exposed to as consumers, there tends to be a conflation of materials. We see the outer material with the lining, with the trim, with the feathers, with the fur, and it all seems like it's coming from the same place. But these are independent industries of each other, and I don't believe there's any reason that we shouldn't be able to focus on one industry and, uh, and make um, political and ethical decisions based on that particular industry. I will say that there is a phenomenally um, awe-inspiring history of what transpired legally and politically in the, th in the feather trade, especially here in New York City. Um, it, was, it resulted in many laws 
protecting animals from being driven to extinction and from some of the worst cruelties to animals used for the, for the feather trade. Um, so there is, there is a history there that I think is telling. And um, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. One more. Uh, we have uh, Keith Powers from your hand. Great, thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, just a few questions. M Mr. Gunn, you just had a number, I wanted to just ask if you could repeat on the, I think it was first stores in the city. Can you repeat that number? In the 1970s, there were 450 first storefronts in New York. And that means a, a store that's exclusively selling fur, or what is the definition by that? Exclusively, I can't say. I, it's it's a, a number that I got from, um, one second, from the, the greater fur New York. Okay. Great, thanks. And, and presumably there's other businesses that are selling it as part of their variety of things as well. Um, <clears throat> um, Dr. Jefferson, you had a, a, a point about the leather that I wanted to just ask a follow-up question on, which was um, the sort of byproduct nature of it. And you know, there, that's been raised, I, and I think we're gonna hear testimony as well from folks around um, sheepskin and, 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 and other forms and cowhide um, in terms of why it might be excluded, why leather might be excluded from it, same, you know, same definition applies. I was wondering if there were comments on whether that should be uh, an allowable form of, um, or not, or whether what the opinion is in terms of other sort of items that might also serve as byproducts. Do you mean fur as a byproduct? No, I think you made the point that leather, why the, separate, the difference between fur and leather here was that leather had been used for other purposes and was a byproduct. And I think that argument's been raised around like sheepskin and other, I think, I think other forms uh, as well. And wondering if you see that those as comparable examples or I, I do, uh, sheepskin would be a different a different uh, product altogether because those are domesticated farmed animals as opposed to wild animals being farmed. God, I, I guess the question is if if there was if the council was considering an exemption around that, whether you thought that was uh, a reasonable exception in the sense that there is, I think it's going to be raised earlier, so I'm just asking the Yes, question. I would say so. We would consider that separate from fur. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then um, in terms of the, I think it's Mr. Catcher, is that right? Yeah. Um, yes. In terms of the conversion of the industry that exists today, people who are selling it, maybe those 40 or something sore fronts that are selling it right now. I mean, I've, you know, you noted this as well, I think, and Mr. Gunn as well, that there will be some time to convert. It would not, I mean, if we, if we were essentially going to ask a business to shut down in 90 days or reconvert in 90 days. I, I just wonder, what are the industries that you feel like that would be, would be translatable, I guess, today to somebody who's in that business and how and and what would the skill sets need, conversion need, if the city needed to put in either workforce development or or what are the convertible skill sets if we were asking an industry to change today from one one uh, material to another? I thank you for the question. There, I I don't believe that there is that much of a skill set difference. There's there's maybe one or two things that are very, very specific, but as far as patterning and sewing and merchandising and, and draping, and these are people that are already making coats that have other materials on them. They know how to, they know how to make, uh, some of their linings are, are, they're working with polyester, they're working with cotton, they're working with these materials already, so it's not that they don't know how to use these materials. Um, I, I, I believe there should be opportunities and incentives and uh, uh, to, to help um, bring profitable and exciting innovative materials into all producers in the New York City garment district and uh, all, all fashion makers in New York City. I think um, from, uh, from a, an, over, an overarching uh, perspective, the, the entire industry should have more access to the most cutting edge uh, high-tech, sustainable, and ethical materials. And um, I, I don't believe, that, I do believe there should be, um, there, is, there is a case for a transition period, but this isn't, this isn't training somebody who's a coal miner to make, uh, to make wind turbines. It's not a completely different technology. It's, it's very similar. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call up the next panel. Thank you. Thank you all. We have Mark Oten, the CEO of International Fur Federation. Stephen Humphreys, International Fur Federation. 
and excuse me if I don't if I mispronounce your name, we have Be Bezel Bezalol Stem. Stern, sorry. Clayton uh, Beckstead from the Fur Commission. Thank you. Sergeant, we can, we can begin. Start whenever you'd like, just make sure your mic is on, the red light on your mic. Good uh, afternoon, you. council members. My name is Stephen Humphreys. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Kelly Dry and Warren here in the city, and I'm here representing the International Fur Federation, the Fur um, <clears throat> Uh, Information Council of America. Although subject to city and state environmental review laws, such as the uh, <clears throat> Seeker and Secra, uh, the council has not released at this time an environmental assessment of the fur ban. If the city council proceeds with this bill, it must comply with those requirements and take a, quote, hard look at the potential impacts of its action. Pursuant to CICRA and the state equivalent, uh, CICRA, where an action has the potential to result in even one significant uh, impact, a full environmental impact statement, or EIS, must be prepared. Here, the proposed bill has the potential to result in at least three types of significant environmental impacts. I will briefly review those impacts. First, regarding socioeconomic conditions. According to the city's environmental review guidelines set forth in the CICRA technical manual, an action would result in a significant impact if it would substantially impair the ability of an industry or category of businesses to continue operating within the city. Given that the bill would cause fur sellers, wholesalers, and manufacturers to shut down or relocate to outside of the city, the bill would result in significant socioeconomic impacts. As such, an EIS must be prepared to identify, assess, and disclose these, those impacts, and to develop mitigation measures and to consider alternatives. Second, regarding neighborhood character. According to the Seeker Technical Manual, an action would result in a significant impact where it would significantly change one of the defining elements of a neighborhood by closing the ground floor storefronts and fur-related businesses that define the fur district, the bill would result in a significant impact to neighborhood character. Again, an EIS needs to be prepared to identify, assess, and disclose those impacts, as well as develop mitigation measures and consider alternatives. Uh, sir, um, yes. I, I want, uh, we're going to have questions for you, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, panelist, but we'll come back and you can expound uh, on, on your points uh, longer. So you're not done, but let's move on to the next folks, and we're going to come back for questions, and you can continue to expand on your arguments on the environmental assessment that you believe is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and committee. My name is Mark Oten. I am the Chief Executive of the International Fur Federation. Uh, we're the organization that represents the fur industry in over 50 countries around the globe. And I actually welcome, uh, Mr. Speaker, some of the measures that you're trying to achieve because our business is also keen to make sure that we have a proper regulated fur industry. And I hope that we can enter a dialogue with you here in New York to be able to achieve some of those aims. 
The third trade uh, is worth over $33 billion and is a growing and vibrant trade. Unlike some of the testimony we heard earlier on, young people are working and endorsing fur. And here in New York, fur is sold, yes, still in the garment district, but actually way beyond the garment district. It's sold from stores such as Barney's and Bloomingdale's. It's sold on the internet. It is a vibrant fur business here in New York, not dying at all. From Canada Goose to Uggs to Fendi to Louis Vuitton, New Yorkers are buying fur and they have been doing it for decades and want to continue to do so. The next generation are designing fur. It's on the catwalks here at New York Fashion Week and around the globe. A ban proposed this way would stop the freedom of those designers from being able to use fur and more importantly, stop consumers here in New York from buying fur they want to buy. At a time when many of us are concerned about the environmental impact on society, it makes no sense to deny consumers the opportunity to buy a truly natural material, rather than pushing them towards the fake plastic alternatives. Fur biodegrades, it does not end up in landfill. And to answer a point made earlier on, 100% of the fur which comes from wild trapping is part of conservation projects, fact. News of what is happening in New York has spread around the globe, and we are in conversations now with countries such as Denmark and Finland and Greece about the WTO implications of what takes place. Mr. Speaker, I hope you will be prepared to sit down with me and look at a solution. We would like to see New York become the first city to introduce Furmark, a proper independent scientific-based certification program guaranteed that the fur sold here in New York is from the most regulated fur that we can have in the globe. And I hope we can meet to discuss that in the weeks ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. And I have some questions on Furmark, but I want to let the other two panelists uh, speak first, and then I'm happy to have some conversation about that with you. Thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Vitalo Stern, also with Kelly Dryam Warren, which represents IFF, uh, FICA, and for Commission USA. Uh, the we believe the proposed legislation. Pull the mic a little bit closer to you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. The, we believe the proposed legislation is bad policy, but uh, it is also unconstitutional. I noticed, Mr. Speaker, that when you uh, summarized the legislation, you didn't talk about the religious custom ex uh, exception. I believe. Uh, it's, in, it's in the bill. I, I know, but. Um, the religious custom uh, exception violates the Establishment Clause. But just, I want to be clear. We added it to the bill, so I don't know what inference you were trying to make by me not mentioning it. There was a lot I didn't mention, which is why we have a back and forth to talk about these things. Sure. But the bill includes a religious exemption. So I'm not sure what you're trying to infer with that comment, but you may continue. Thank you. Uh, the Supreme Court in Lemon v. Kurtzman explained that for a law to not run afoul of the Establishment Clause, its principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion, and the statute mu must not foster an excessive government entanglement with religion. The proposed law fails to meet this test. By excluding fur apparel that is worn as a major matter of religious custom from its otherwise comprehensive ban on new furs, the law's primary effect is to advance religion by allowing the purchase and use of new furs for religious purposes only. Furthermore, by acknowledging that the fur being exempted is worn by some Jews not as a matter of religious obligation, but only as a matter of religious custom, the law wrongfully advances the interests of a particular group of Jews, even though the proposed law acknowledges that there is no halakhic requirement for Jews to wear furs. In 1994, in overturning New York legislation providing special privileges to religious group, the Supreme Court explained to the per that, um, that a pr a proper respect for both the free exercise and the establishment clause compels the state to pursue a course of neutrality toward religion, favoring neither one religion over others nor religious adherence collectively over non-adherence. Furthermore, by excluding fur apparel that is worn as a matter of religious custom from the ban, the proposed legislation will necessarily foster an excessive government entanglement with religion, which is exactly what the Supreme Court in Lemon v. Kurtzman prescribed against. Thank you. Thank you for your analysis. I'm Clayton Beckstead. I'm a fourth generation mink rancher and I'm against the fur ban for many reasons, just like my father taught me. I am in the process of teaching my son about the importance of treating animals with the utmost care and respect. As a rancher, I, am, I know how vital it is that these animals receive the best possible care every day. We are strictly regulated under the Fur Commission USA certification program that ensures the best practices. Under these mandated guidelines, the animal 
The animal's welfare, comfort, and well-being always come first. Fresh water sources and finest food ingredients are always readily available to ensure a comfortable and healthy lifestyle for the animals. The animals are cared for in a clean, organic environment that is regularly inspected and regulated. I've watched my grandfather and dad spend a lifetime on the farm from sunup to sundown caring for the animals, and now my family and I are dedicating our lives to ensuring the same top quality life for our animals. Ranchers dedicate their lives to giving their animals a quality life, do the right thing, and don't kill a multi-generational family business. Thank you for being here. Um, Mr. Oden, I have some questions for you on Fermark. Um, so you had mentioned Fermark, you mentioned that you thought this would be an opportunity for the city of New York to do something that other municipalities have not done, other countries have not done. We saw that the ban uh, went forward in West Hollywood, in San Francisco, and in Los Angeles. Other countries around the world have not done full bans, but have tried to further regulate fur farming and other measures. What you had mentioned in your testimony and what I think other furriers have come to me with is is this idea uh, called Furmark, which jump in when I'm done with this, correct me if I get anything wrong. Well, the information I have says that Furmark will be a self-regulated global program, as I understand it. Oversight and enforcement sounds like a huge task that would require a significant amount of resources to be able to do that enforcement and that oversight as part of what is being formulated as part of Furmark. And I wanna understand who would be responsible for generating the standards under the program, who would create those standards, and how will fur farms and trappers be held accountable if they deviate from the standards that get set up? Okay, uh, very directly, uh, the program has not been devised by the industry, it's been devised by independent scientists, so they have been sent away and they have come up with what they believe to be the best welfare standard, whether it's to do with farming or to do with trapping or indeed dressing and dyeing. The second part of the process is that all of this has to be independently assessed. So again, the industry does not do this. It is assessed by private companies that are brought in on contract. On a farm, for example, there would be three independent assessments each year. To answer your last point, if somebody fails to actually meet those criteria, they are banned from being able to sell goods in the fur industry. They will not be part of Furmark. Absolutely crystal clear. And have, have those standards been created yet on what, yep. what is acceptable and what's not acceptable? So the program is under pilot at the moment. We're ready to launch January the 1st. We have been developing this program with the um, two big fashion groups, LVMH and Caring, so they have major fashion houses in it. Um, we've got buying, for example, from uh, Gallery Lafayette in Paris, who are going to go Fermark only. What we would love you to do is to be the first city to actually say, okay, we want to balance animal welfare with consumer freedom. And I genuinely believe Fermark is a way which we could sit down and create that freedom, but give you the reassurances you need about where the fur comes from and make sure that it's ethically sourced. And Mr. Owen, the, you just said that the inspections would happen three times a year? On the farms, it's three times a year. When it comes to the trapping, the regulation is different uh, because obviously you have uh, to make sure that the traps are checked and inspected within a 24-hour period after the uh, trapping takes place. So it varies whether you're talking about wild or whether you're talking about farmed. Each one is bespoke to make sure it's done to the high standards for that particular type of fur. I mean this with, with total sincerity. How is there a humane and ethical way to trap an animal? Well, I mean, I mean, I mean that. Explain to me what a humane and ethical way, walk me through that, because I don't understand that. Well, you will hear from scientists, I hope if they get called later on, to explain exactly how the trapping is put in place. Obviously, because 100% of these animals are trapped for conservation, we work to government, not ours, government quotas and guidelines on how the trapping takes place. Those traps are internationally approved. We sign up to international conventions on CITES, for example, on which animals can be trapped. All of those traps have to be approved, not by us, but by international government agreements. And I know we talked earlier about misinformation on both sides. That is transparent. You can read those guidelines. They are thoroughly checked, inspected, and they are humane in terms of the way the animals are trapped. I do not recognize Dan's demonstration earlier on as the industry that I work in and come from. 
But those traps exist, uh, and they're they used. Are, they will, there is absolutely no way that those traps can be used as part of Fermark. Not as part of Fermark, but they currently to. exist outside of Fermark. We're talking about Fermark as a, as a new standard that you think that we should use and other uh, uh, governments should use moving forward. I, but currently, these type of traps do exist to trap animals and then use their fur. I am not aware of that taking place in America. I stand to be corrected, but I'm not aware Not in of America, that. but in other places around the world. Uh, as Russia, Dan, China. As, as Dan said himself, a hundred countries have actually banned those traps, and I welcome that. Okay. Um, so, as part of the standards you're talking about in New York State, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, electrocution of fur bearing animals is not lawful in the state of New York. It was banned a few years ago. Would pelts from electrocuted animals be certified under Furmark? Yes, because we've based it on independent science, and so it's not for me to come in and, and, and judge that. The EU, for example, has this as the most ethical and humane standard, that electrocution is the quickest, fastest, and best way to euthanize an animal. It's not something we set, it's something the EU have independently assessed. And again, I've got a 30-page document I can share with you which sets out exactly why they believe that is the humane and fairest way to euthanize. Electrocuting animals. It is tested by scientists, it welfare make you, experts. It, does, it doesn't make you uncomfortable, electrocuting animals? What would make me uncomfortable is me deciding rather than a scientist deciding. I put my faith in independent scientists and welfare experts. That always has to be the thing to do in my judgment. Uh, both you and I are laymen when it comes to this issue. We have to trust the experts. I mean, we, we just, and, I'm, and I'm very happy to have those experts no, give no, evidence and cross-examine them. I understand. We heard from a medical expert. We heard from a, a doctor who spoke on the previous panel, a veterinarian who specializes in the treatment of animals. And she doesn't feel comfortable, I think, with what you're saying. So I don't think there's a singular threshold. You may have one scientist that says one thing, and there are plenty of other scientists who wouldn't think that that's the appropriate standard to use. And I think sometimes you're going to have some uh, vets and scientists who just don't believe that animals should be used for this purpose. So they will be against whatever method it is that is used to euthanize. What I'm talking about is that independent experts who have said, look, this is the kindest, the fairest, the best way to euthanize. And as I said, I base it on science, and I'm really happy to share that science. So, if there's alternative science, let's have a look at that as well. So what other killing methods are allowed under Fermark? What, if you could give me a list of what is allowed under Fermark to kill animals. Okay, so we base it on, as I said, the scientific uh, evidence. The, the mink uh, are euthanized within around five seconds from being taken from the cage and then put into a box where they're gassed. That is around five seconds. They're not transported anywhere. As you've heard, for the fox, that is uh, electrocution as being the best and most humane method. And then as we've talked about for the trapped fur, that will be different kinds of approved traps, which will be bespoke for the different animals that are trapped in, in different ways. So for each species, it's different, and it's based, again, on the scientific evidence that we're given. So what about for coyotes? Uh, for coyotes, that would be trapping as well. That would be, uh, a, a, they're not uh, euthanized by electricity or for gas. That is a trapped, a trapped breed. And that is done in Canada and America, and you'll hear from our trapping experts later on. That is highly inspected by uh, the, the government, uh, the wildlife authorities in Canada and America, and has been developed over for, for decades of expertise on humane trapping. So I just want to read from you. This is the, the, the Finnish code of good practice for human killing in foxes. This is what the, the code says from Finland uh, on what they consider to be a good practice of, <coughs> it's part of the Furmark yeah. uh, standard. And this is what it says. Quote, the position of the electrodes, the shape of the electrodes, and the pressure used to hold electrodes affect the efficacy of electrocution. It has been found that when one electrode is placed properly inside the rectum and one is bitten by the fox, the current passes through the fox properly. The rod electrode should be placed sufficiently deep in the rectum and firmly into the mouth. The current induces epileptic seizures in the brain and fibrillation or cardiac arrest in the heart. 
It should be checked that the restraining device or other materials in contact with the fox do not affect the path or effectiveness of the current flow. Many physiological properties affect the current flow, such as body size. Therefore, the voltage and amperage should be sufficiently high for the current to overcome the body resistance of even the largest of foxes. So you, do you agree with that standard? That's what, that's what, it's part of what the Fermark standard is. That is part of the EU standard and it's part of the welfare standard which will be part of Fermark and that as I said is based on the, the scientific evidence of the most humane way to do it. Of course, for many people the detail of how any animal is how, how put do you, down is, how do you is unfair. How do you define humane? I define it by based on the vets and the scientists who but, have but we years just, we of experience. Disagree, we just agreed that there's not a singular standard, that vets and scientists don't all agree on this. Mm -hmm. So well, I'm asking for you, which vets and scientists, what is your personal comfortability standard on how to humanely uh, treat an animal, kill an animal for the purposes of fur? I think whether I'm looking at uh, an animal which is slaughtered for, for meat or whether it's an animal slaughtered for, for, as part of leather or for whatever purpose, the number one consideration and concern I have is has that animal suffered and has it been treated humanely? And I wouldn't do this job, honestly would not do this job unless I was confident that this industry operates to that high standard. Do you think, they're cur you think the industry is currently operating on the, with that standard? I believe that it is, but I want to make sure that I do more and I push harder, and that's why I passionately want to see Fermark introduced. If because we're I want have to have an honest conversation. Sure. You think that this, the industry currently is? Yes. Why are you proposing this if you think the industry currently is? Because I want to move further, because at the moment, a lot of the inspections are done by governments, and I actually want to reach a, a higher threshold. I want to bring in scientists, independents. Okay, could you, be, could you be a little self reflective and tell me what you could be doing better to treat animals? I think the issue is around the inspection. I think we need to have more inspection. And the so second issue no is No animals in this industry are mistreated. Uh, no, I don't believe that animals are mistreated in this industry. I believe that what we need to do, however, is to have a better way of demonstrating to you, to give you confidence and consumers, that we can trace and track exactly where those animals have come from, which trapping line and which farm, and to give reassurance that the best possible welfare has been put in place. Look, science always changes. There are always new methods, and we want to make sure we're at the cutting edge of all of that, whether that's to do with the kind of feed used, the kind of cage used, the kind of water that is given to the animals. I'm never ever gonna rest and say, this is enough. We've always got to push further and find better methods. That's so, always possible with science. But traps don't discriminate. If you lay a trap, any animal could walk into that trap, right? N n again, you'll hear from the trapping experts. I'm not one, so I'm not going to give you a misinformation. But they are designed specifically for the certain animals they're trying to capture and are not, therefore, designed to capture the wrong animal. But the trapping experts will give you the detail on how that works. So I'm not the expert. I'm not going to answer a question where I don't have my facts. I mean, that seems uh, a little convenient, given that you're it's up just, here re representing... It's I mean, just an honest... You, I've said to you all along, I want to base it on facts. If you're here to represent the International Fur Federation and you're talking about fur mark, these are questions that you should be able to answer. Um, you shouldn't, if, if you don't feel comfortable and say, I don't want to answer that question, but don't pass it off to other people. You're up there as the chief spokesperson mm -hmm. here at the New York City Council for the International Fur Federation and putting forward a new standard. So if you don't, you can't say, well, someone else has the expertise. You are here proposing something. If you're coming to testify in front of this body, have the expertise to, 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 to speak on it. Mr. Speaker, I'm very confident about what we're doing in relation to traps. You asked me a direct question about whether the traps work for every single animal. So they do discriminate. The traps are figured out. They're designed in a way where uh, if a trap is made for a coyote and a cat steps in the trap, the cat's not going to get hurt. It was only designed for the coyote. That is exactly what I'm saying to you. But if you want the detail on how that works... If you want the detail on how that works, we've got some great experts coming coming to give okay. you all of that. So detail. scientists have found that death by gas is painful for mink. You said that minks are gassed. You said it takes five seconds between the cage and the gassing of the minks, and they found that it's not a, that uh, it's not immediate. It induces seizures, and it's not always effective as a means of inducing death, such as uh, animals that are skinned alive. What alternatives to gassing are there? Well, 
skinning alive is absolutely something which does not happen in the fur trade. And I'm appalled to hear some of the misinformation that goes around. I, it, it, why would that be something that anybody would do? It's abhorrent, it's disgusting, and there is absolutely no way that happens in this industry. So what about the and videos? Will, uh, Are the videos fake videos? I, I, I'm more than happy to share with you the affidavit that we have from the individuals involved who made that film who have claimed ex that it's a fake video and that this was a one-off and they were paid to do that and I can share you all those affidavits that they've made. Skinning Alive does not happen in this industry. Absolutely. So what are the other awesome. alternative the methods to gassing? So gassing, gassing is the most humane method. That is the method that we have been told by the scientists and the welfare experts is the best way for mink it is the kindest way because they are literally uh, dead within five seconds from leaving the cage to going into the gas and euthanized box. Uh, animal experts, uh, animal welfare experts suggest that even farmed animals require a meaningful amount of space to roam and that animals like mink, which are semi-aquatic, need water to fulfill their basic instincts that they're born with. In other countries like the UK, fur farming has been banned because the basic needs of animals cannot be met in farming conditions. So what conditions are provided to fox and mink on fur farms to give them the ability to behave naturally? So within the, the fur mark standard, there is a list of 22 different assessments. Uh, these assessments cover checks to see whether the animals are uh, naturally uh, happy and their behavioral measures uh, and I've been and seen what these different checks are it's important to make sure obviously there is flowing water all the time that they have forms of entertainment uh, to, to, to look after themselves within the cage these are all set out and checked against a set of criteria and the inspectors will go around and they will look at the behavior of the animals to make sure that they are behaving normally and without any uh, disquiet within the cages how big are the cages um, the, the cages vary when it's bet between mink and between um, fin raccoon and between chinchilla and between uh, foxes. So that how, how big is a fox cage? Uh, a, a f I would have to turn to one of the, the farmers on the actual sizing of the fox cages. And are animals caged together or separately? Um, they're caged together, but there's a limit on the amount of animals that can be together because when they're, um, when they're breeding and when they're having their kits or their their pups, they have to obviously be uh, together at that process, at that point. The studies have shown that fur farming, in particular, the manure produced from farmed animals has serious and harmful consequences for local ecosystems. If you could tell me about your efforts, if any, to minimize the local ecological effects of fur farming. Okay, so we're just um, completing what we call a life cycle analysis, which looks at the impact of fur on the climate. Uh, and it is true, certainly as one of the speakers said earlier on, that there are emissions that come from a farm, but that is countered off by the fact that uh, we're able to use byproducts from the farm uh, so that the, the mink byproduct will go into composting, uh, fertilizer, and so there is an offset there. There's also an offset because a lot of waste food is actually the food which is used to feed the mink. So the scientists have looked at the, the, the impact as to whether it's negative or positive, and because our product is not something which is thrown away and goes into landfill within two or three years, it's generally normally a 10 to 15 year life cycle that people will have a fur coat for, often passing it on to a generation. That environmental impact is spread out over a, a 15 year period. So we are very confident to say that when you compare it to say fake fur, we come out much, much better in terms of the environmental impact. Um, and you said that you believe that fur is a very sustainable product uh, a natural and sustainable product yes and what about chromium so we do obviously with the dressing and dyeing process put in uh, coloring and that is something where uh, there are regulations again coming in under fur mark so we will have an approved list of chemicals there'll be inspectors coming in to check those approved lists of chemicals are being used these will all be uh, REACH compliant. REACH is the uh, international standard for the chemicals that can be used. But I would like to go further and see if we can start to be able to introduce more natural-based dyes in the dressing and dyeing process as well. The, 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 the dressing part is non-chemical based. It's using salt and water. Obviously, the dyeing bit is where you bring the chemicals in. Um, and, and they are set against an approved list and independently inspected. But would you, would you consider chromium and formaldehyde to be sustainable natural products? 
Uh, no, those individual chemicals themselves, uh, you would not call natural. But they're part of they're part of the fur industry. But they are part of the fur industry, and they're part of the dressing dyeing process. And are they are they going to go away? Are you going to use something else besides them? Can we get rid of formaldehyde and chromium? I think over year, over time we can. Yes, we can move. We're certainly working already at the moment with natural dyes, and we're looking at that. What we need to do there, uh, honestly, is to have the fashion industry work with us closer because they're often the ones. But the fashion industry is moving away from fur. Uh, well, actually, uh, a lot of the brands are still working with fur. LVMH Group and Caring Group, who own many, many of the large fashion brands, have been developing this with us. They're talking to us about how we can work with some more natural-based dyes to come in for the process. So, yeah, I'm definitely keen to do that. But wh why do you think, Mark, that Stella McCartney and Donna Karen and Donatella Versace and Diane von Furstenberg and Timberland and the list goes on, every major in fashion designer maybe not every, most of them, have all moved away from fur. They've all said, I mean, I'm getting letters from these major designers in New York City who are telling me, I know the industry, I've worked in it, people like Tim Gunn and people that Tim Gunn work with saying, we, we've studied this, we know about it, it is inhumane, it is cruel, there are other ways to do this. The fashion industry is moving away from fur. Maybe you're saying consumers aren't, but, the, but industry leaders are. Why do you think they're doing that? Why do you think Donatella Versace and Donna Karen and Diane von Furstenberg are saying we no longer want to use fur? I think they've made a choice. And Why? I, and I respect their choice. Why, why do you think they made that choice? I think that there is, uh, I mean, some of the statements they made around giving up fur were very odd to me because they said they wanted to become more sustainable. And I find it odd that they're actually switching to a more But they also plastic. talked about cruelty. Well, that's a personal, that, I mean, we come back to a, you know, maybe this whole debate is framed around that personal choice, personal decisions. Donatella and others have, and Stella I, I don't McCartney know if it's personal choice. Taken, I think it's, I, I think it's living in a humane society. I think it's but, not about personal choice. It's about how do we treat other sentient beings this, that have feelings. And we've made decisions over the years on understanding that elephants have deep grief and that we don't want to uh, sell ivory and port ivory in a way for the killing of elephants to incentivize it. We make these decisions as we evolve as a society on how to treat other sentient beings. But Mr. Speaker, we also have a principle of individual choice. And so for the Donatellas who've decided to ban it, the Louis Vuittons, the Fendis, the Canada Goose, the Uggs and others are still choosing to carry on. And I guess what, what I would love to see here is a way in which if New Yorkers wanted fur ban, they would just stop buying it. They wouldn't be going to Macy's and Bloomingdale's and Barney's. They wouldn't be going to the garment district. They wouldn't be buying Canada Goose. They wouldn't be buying these products, but they are buying them in large numbers. And it's about an issue, it's, it's about, it's about an issue of choice. I totally respect the speakers here who don't want to buy fur, but just to allow me and have, my I, colleagues the I, chance I, to buy I it. Have, I have a question for you on that. Does that mean that we should allow the choice of ivory? No, I think that on, on the issue of ivory, uh, that there are uh, difficult ethical issues for me should on we that. Allow, should we allow the and, choice of tiger skin? And so, no, for me personally, I wouldn't wish to. So I then what's the difference? To. That's choice. The, it, it, is, it is choice. If the market decided that, and the market has decided in the past, there's a market for ivory. And there's a, so should we allow that choice? There's a fascinating there's a fascinating Should we allow debate. that choice for ivory? No, I don't believe in Why that. Why not? What's the difference? Because there's, a, there's, a, there's a threshold that you, you arrive at as a politician. There's a threshold. There's a threshold you arrive at a politician, I believe, where you have to take a judgment as to whether or not you feel that evidence is overwhelming in favor of a ban or overwhelming in favor of regulation and freedom of choice. On this issue, I don't believe it is overwhelming. I think there is compelling arguments on both sides, and I would like to see the solution of having it regulated to allow that choice, but also reaching the concerns that you and many of your committee have about making sure the industry is ethical and properly regulated. I think both things can be done, and you as a politician are in the business of making things happen. I know you're frustrated and want stuff to happen. This is a way in which we could do it, rather than ending up with rows, with WTO, and all those kind of things. Let's do this together and make a difference. But if this is about choice and transparency and education, there's been a tremendous amount, and this is factual, a false labeling in the fur industry. So that's not about choice. If you're giving people bad information, they don't get to make an accurate choice if things are mislabeled. And, and when you ask me, Mark, what is different, what do you want to improve on? I want to improve on that. That's why Furmark will be 
A so if you're going to be self-reflective, as I asked earlier, you would say that there is a problem on labeling. I there has been a problem on labeling. I, I would say that we need to be much better at labeling and giving consumers information. Absolutely. I acknowledge so there's been that. a problem with labeling. If you, you're, you're trying to make me say there's a problem with labeling. No, no. If, I, you, I, if, if you don't believe there's a problem, say you don't think there's a problem. There's, there's a problem because we, there's don't, a problem. we don't have clear labeling for products in New York in this country. We need to. Fermark is the solution to that. We could have a system where the individual retailers and shops have a Fermark label showing consumers. We would put in place an inspection regime to make sure that every product being shown having the Fermark label, we can trace back to make sure it really is from Fermark. So we could overcome the difficulty about labeling. Yes, I think we can. Do you live in New York? Do you live in London? Do you live in the UK? I feel an intruder here. I'm sorry. I, I I mean, I, the reason why I'm asking because I want to ask about London. I, I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, some people told me this is bad information, that London is not allowing fur on the runway for Fashion Week. That's bad information. I met with uh, Caroline Rush. Because I just read an article in the in the Guardian. I Googled it. It's right online right here where the where the, the newspaper in London says that fur is not allowed on the runway anymore. And we can phone Caroline Rush, who's the CEO of London Fashion Week, and she will tell you that's absolutely not the case. I had breakfast with her a couple of months ago. She gave me an absolute guarantee that's not the case. And in fact, at February, which just went, fur was shown at London Fashion Week. It is a myth. It's not true. You can speak to Caroline Rush yourself. I'll give you her cell if you want. Um. So what, uh, in, in, New York City, in New York City, fur apparel waste would necessarily go to a landfill when it's finally disposed of because it can't be recycled or composted. And a landfill would contribute to the uncontrolled release of methane and the release of toxins into the soil and groundwater. What programs, if any, are available to consumers to send their fur apparel so that it may biodegrade in a manner that is not harmful to the environment, given the chemicals and carcinogens that we talked about that are using? What, what biodegradable program are you proposing or currently exists? Well, I mean, number one, very, very few people People actually send their fur to landfill. It generally gets either passed down through the generations, or repurposed, or it gets re exactly remade. We just did some work um, in the Netherlands um, it, where we took um, a natural fur and uh, sent it to some labs, and it started to biodegrade within 30 days. And then we uh, took uh, some fake fur, and the biodegradable process uh, just, just doesn't begin. So actually, our product does biodegrade. It doesn't end up in landfill. Um, the one issue you raise in terms of the, the, the chemicals, yes, obviously, there is a chemical issue. But that will be the same whether you're talking about the fake fur or the natural fur. Did you, Mark, did you testify when Los Angeles was considering this a couple of years ago? No. Did you? Did your organization testify against the bill in Los oh, Angeles? So I thought you meant me personally. No, did your organization testify against the bill in Los Angeles? Uh, yeah, my colleagues from uh, the American International Fur Federation attended uh, both in San Francisco and LA. And, and my understanding is in Los Angeles, it passed unanimously. There was one no vote, but the entire council uh, almost passed it there. And, and I think they had extensive hearings like this to talk about the merits of it. Uh, they did, but in Beverly Hills, the same process happened and the council didn't pass it. Um, so, um, the International Fur Federation, uh, are, are you all funded in any way by fur farms? Yes, completely. Yes, we're funded by a levy on every single skin that is sold. So uh, to that extent, we, uh, we are receiving money from the industry. And we are the industry representatives. Yeah, yeah. We're not, so, we're not no, I, was, I just wasn't sure who, who, <coughs> may, who you, the Fur Federation, who you exactly represent. Yeah. And, and so you're represented predominantly exclusively by the fur farms themselves. No, so we, we represent um, the, uh, the fur farms, the trappers, we represent the dressers and dyers, we represent designers, we represent retailers, we represent the auction houses, they're the guys that sell the fur. So we represent every part of the, the value chain of the fur industry. And one of the things that I'm confused about is if, we're if, you're, if you're asking to set up the Furmark self-regulated global program with um, the different thresholds that you mentioned, the thresholds are different all over the world about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. So even if we were to come up with a standard <coughs> that you all said was the appropriate standard for selling fur in New York City, if you're importing fur from China or Russia or another country that doesn't have those strict standards, how do we, how do we know that? How do we differentiate? 
uh, through Fermark? How do we I, I how would, do we do that? I, I would not um, include China in Fermark. I'm not including China in Fermark. So including Russia? If you, I, I'm including some of the farms that produce sable in Russia, but they're going to be literally 10 farms that are highly inspected to make sure that they uh, meet all the Fermark standards. But in terms of China, it's not part of Fermark. And the reason it's not part of Fermark is it doesn't meet the threshold that I want in relation to the standards and the inspections. So I've heard your broadcasts on radio where you've expressed concern about fur coming from China. Fermark would mean that wouldn't happen here in New York. When was Fermark thought of? I mean, when did you decide to create Fermark? So we started working on Fermark around two and a half, three years ago. Uh, and it, as you indicated earlier on, it's, it's, it's a complicated process. Because we had to get the independent science, that took us um, a year to a year and a half to get the scientists to go through the process. They take a long time. Um, but how, so how, do you, how do you define independent? Uh, independent you, 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 is that... You guys hired these people. Uh, yeah. We, we have, a, a, a obviously, to fund them. I can't find anybody else to fund them. So as much as they can be independent, they are, except for the fact that, yep, yeah, absolutely, they will receive the money from our organization as well. And I can't avoid that. However, the check and balance in there is that each of the countries that we're talking about in relation to Fermark also, in addition to everything that we're doing, there is government inspection in pr process. And I, again, I didn't understand when some of the colleagues who oppose uh, FUR said there's no regulation in place. Listen, this is such a controversial industry, let's face it, that there is lots of regulation in place, which is government regulation. But now, that is not funded by us. We're going above that with FURMARC so that we can streamline the process. But correct, but, me, correct me wrong, the, sure. the, the information I have from the lawyers and the policy analysts here at the council through their research in preparing for today's hearing says that fur farming has been banned in numerous countries. Is that correct? Oh, so it's been banned in the UK. Why? Uh, Why was it banned in the UK? Um, well, uh, it, Why did that government make the decision to ban fur farming? Uh, it, it was a, a, a popular issue, the Labour government that, that came in, they decided to ban uh, fur. They decided to ban fox farming, they decided to ban a number of issues in the UK. And, you know, obviously they have an elected mandate, that's their choice. Uh, Austria has also banned uh, fur farming. Uh, there is currently... Uh, the Netherlands has banned fur farming. Said, there's current, currently uh, farming in Netherlands, but that will be phased out, uh, and I think in about three years' time. And Northern Ireland has banned fur farming. Uh, well, it's part of the UK. Yes. Uh, Serbia, Serbia and Croatia. Uh, yep have banned fur farming, it's being phased out in Denmark? No, it's absolutely not being phased out in Denmark. Denmark has, um, as, as you'll hear later from uh, one of the vets from Denmark, Denmark is one of the biggest uh, fur farming countries. It's not being, it's not being phased out? A hunt, absolutely. Japan? Uh, no, not that I'm aware. Okay. No. So I might have bad information here. Yeah. I, I, I see that uh, the information I have said that Denmark and Japan is being phased no, out. No, Denmark is a very, very strong uh, supporter of fur. Uh, in fact, the Danish government have expressed concerns about what's happening in New York, and we're, we're talking to them at the moment about what the, the WTO and GATT uh, implications of a fur ban in New York are. So no, they're, they're very, very supportive of fur. Uh, and again, just... On the British Fashion Week, uh, on London Fashion Week, uh, the information I have, it says, in 2018, the British Fashion Council declared that London Fashion Week would be totally fur-free. Uh, absolutely. I, 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 know, I don't know how I can say it many more times without sounding peculiar, but, you know, I, Caroline Rush is the CEO. I know her. I spoke to her. Absolutely not. And we can show you the fur that was shown in February just a few months ago. So, so the lawyers tell me that fox farming is currently banned in Denmark. Yes. Yeah, that was many years, many years ago. So partially... Uh, sorry, I thought you meant currently being phased out. No, there was a ban in the past on that. Okay. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to turn it back to you for other folks that have questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we have Keith Powers. Okay, we're going to pass it over to Peter Koo. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for coming. Um, so, uh, would you say the fur industry is a, a dying industry? Because um, uh, the previous panels mentioned the, there were 400 uh, fur uh, outlets in New York City. Now you only have 14. So, even without the passing the law, 
I mean, your, your industry is dying, right? When people's attitude change. They don't buy furs anymore, like, not like in the old times, no? I, mean, I remember people used to buy mink coat and all this. Now nobody's interested in buying mink coats anymore. No, it's what, what's happening is what's happening in retail generally. Uh, instead of having bespoke stores which just sell one product, fur has actually moved away from being in a, a fur shop, although it's still there, into Barneys, Macy's, Bloomingdale's, it's into boutiques, it's being sold on the internet. So it's just being sold in a different way, but it's still being sold in large numbers, and the industry is worth 33 billion, so it's growing and, and very vibrant. But yes, it's not sold in exactly the same way that it was maybe five, ten years ago in those individual fur shops, although they're still there. We want to protect them, but it's being actually purchased in different ways now. And, you know, the Internet is one of the challenges when it comes to trying to ban fur in New York, because are you going to stop people from being able to purchase fur on the Internet? How on earth would you control that? And patterns are changing on how people buy things, but they're still buying it. No, but I'm talking about the volume and the sales and the amount of the, <coughs> the dollars. It must have decreased a lot, right? Compared. No, the, the, the pattern of what people buy has changed. So uh, instead of it necessarily being a full long coat, uh, which maybe you'd sell a number of, now people are buying fur in different ways. Trim is really popular. Canada Goose is a huge brand. So people are just buying it in a different way. So uh, how many cities uh, or countries have banned uh, fur sales, so, uh, as, far as, as far as you know. No, that's really accurate, no country in the world has banned the sale of fur. Some of the countries, as uh, the speaker mentioned, have banned fur farming, but no country has banned the sale of fur. No. C cities in San Francisco and LA have voted to do that. Only two US cities? Only two US cities, San Francisco and LA. So as yet, unless I'm wrong, but it's just those, those two cities. Um, so it's yet to be tested in terms of international law as to whether this kind of ban is indeed legal. Uh, so uh, I understand most of the furs uh, come from the farm animals, right? Not track animals anymore. Yes. So what's the percentage? In the About 80% come from farmed and 20% come from trapping. Maybe 85% farmed and 15% trapping, actually. Okay, yeah. So who regulate the farm, uh, uh, farms? The Department of Agriculture or who? Um, it depends which country you're in, talking In USA. Yeah, uh, in, Clayton, can I, can I maybe pass on to somebody else who actually yeah. is a farmer who's, who's inspected, Clayton? It's regulated by the Fur Commission USA. It's, uh, we're actually undergoing a, a revamping of that, so it'll be an independent third party um, regulation. Independent means means what? I mean, who who anybody can regulate? It'll, it'll be um, oversaw by veterinarians. Huh. So veterinarians will come and and inspect the farms. So uh, I'm just wonder because you also mentioned there are many farms from other countries, like in China, in Russia, uh, and uh, and how do we know the quality of their furs? So um, the majority of um, the fur which comes into America comes from uh, America and from Europe. Uh, fur farming is in Denmark, in Finland, in Greece, in Italy, in France, uh, is in Poland. Uh, those are the main fur farming countries in Europe. Then you have Russia, which is a specific around Russian sable. And then you have the wild fur coming from Canada and America, and also a lot of mink, uh, which is farmed in, um, in America and Canada. Uh, so those are the main uh, sources for where the fur comes into uh, America. Most of the Chinese production actually stays and is consumed and bought within China. And as I said, it would not be part of Furmark. Hmm. Just my, just my understanding is that India has banned the importing of furs. Is that correct? Um, for products? On some furs, yes, it has. On fo fox, it has. Yes, it has. Does, not to interrupt, but does, does, does the fur mark still believe foxing, uh, fox farms and, and killing foxes is okay? Fox production is under welfare and it's part of fur mark, yes. 
production or slaughtering? Are you saying the same thing? Production. Production. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, production. Thank you. All right. My my last question is that when you mentioned before, uh, you kill the animal by gassing it. Yeah. Right. So is there any other alternative, uh, more humane way to do it, uh, like, like, like anesthesia or something like that? Gas is anesthesia, right? Okay. We are told by the experts that the most humane way is gas. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Powers. Great, thank you. Thank you for the testimony. Um, I, you know, s similar to some of the speaker's questions here, I think that um, if you believe this is unethical, it's hard to believe that the answer is to have the industry sort of police itself in terms of the firm arc. And I think that's one of the questions and the concerns that anybody would have if you were trying to do some regulation is essentially handing it over to industry and say, you know, or, or, or some third party that's affiliated with the industry to say um, that they should be, that's the way. Because that, that in any industry, it's not the fur industry, that would seem like an odd way to hand over um, the regulation if you feel like this is an unethical issue or this humanity, you know, inhumane issues related to um, trapping and, and, uh, and fur as a, um, a, entirely. Um, I just wanted to add that in because I think that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing I know for me to tackle is if your proposal here is to have the industry sort of self-regulate itself. Good to have standards. I know you want to respond, but good to have standards but, and higher standards, and I, I, I appreciate that, but hard to find that that would be the last place one would end up on that. You, you can respond uh, to that. Yes, yeah, so just to be clear, so um, this is on top of government inspection which takes place. So it's not as if we're saying the only people doing the inspection or the process is the IFF and Fermark. This is in addition to the current government programs which take place. But the reason we're doing it is because we want to go further. And the reason we're doing it, as the speaker alluded to earlier on, is there are different measures in different countries that take different approaches. But, but this is, it's already regulated. We're going beyond that. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I want to go switch to, uh, you know, I asked a question to the, the, um, the other panel, and I appreciate the, the response that was given about storefronts and stores, and I heard your answer about diversification and how people are selling at different places, but it does seem to represent something to me if there is a, you know, reduction in places that are selling it. The numbers were 40 versus what it was. In terms of usage and, you know, people you know, wearing it, uh, I know, you know, sexorization is still a, Still a, a, a way that many people have for and their things, but I mean, wh what is the I mean, what is the answer to that? It can't just be diversification. I mean, there does seem to be a trend away from wearing fur and and, and real fur in in one's life. Can you give us any data around sales in New York City and um, and what has been a change over, let's say, the last dec two decades yeah. with regard to sales? I mean, the, the change is, as I said earlier on, really, it's the, the, the model of specialist stores, whether it be to do with fur or, or other items, has, has shifted and changed. Uh, you do have this model of going into boutiques. You do have this model of Barneys and Macy's. Uh, they have their concessions within the stores. You have this shift and change from being the, uh, the full garment to the, you know, the Canada Goose style trim. Uh, you've got color, you've got innovation, you've got the internet. This has all meant that the whole pattern of how people purchase things has changed completely. Do you have uh, any data on, um, let's say, even online sales versus, uh, versus brick and mortar sales in, in New York City? I, 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 I don't. I might be able to get some to the committee. It's, it's, it's pretty tough, it's pretty hard. But if we get down to the point where you're going to be doing a ban, we'll need to get into that because somehow you're going to have to ban the percentage of people who are buying on the internet. And that is a tricky one because I'm not sure how you would enforce and stop a New Yorker from buying on the internet. I just don't know how you do it. Um, and I assume if there was a ban, people would just switch to trying to sell on, on the internet. So you know, I'm not sure how that can be done. Okay, and I've seen a number of, no, I appreciate it. I, um, and it would be helpful to, to, uh, to hear I, that number. Because you know, there's a lot of information being put out and uh, I think there's always, you know, the lack of clarity in terms of, we talk about economic impact about what really, it, it, how, you know, the, the, real, the validity of the numbers, I guess. Yeah. Is the, and, and jobs is another one that's come up, and I know there's different segments of the industry, but could you, do you have numbers around jobs and the economic yeah. impact? And, you know, I, I really hope that um, I can stop talking soon and we can hear from some real New Yorkers who are going to be affected by this, but we believe that uh, the economic study we've done is that there'll be over 7,000 jobs which will be impacted here in New York. 
Uh, Can you break down those 700,000 jobs for us in terms of where they are? You're going to hear from the individuals, but it will be people who actually own the businesses, people who um, work inside those businesses, whether they uh, work in retail, so they're <coughs> excuse me, sales staff, or whether they're manufacturing staff. Uh, whether they're craftsmen, uh, some of these have been crafts which have been passed down through generation to generation, artisans, designers. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of folk in this room that really want to tell their stories about how it will impact on them. I'll ask one more question so we can get to that. <laughs> Great. Does that number include employees at Macy's or Bloomingdale? Not to pick on those stores, and some are my district, and, um, but I just mean, do they, does that encompass all jobs at a place that might sell uh, apparel that has fur on it. I think it's, <clears throat> excuse me, I think it's an underestimate because what we've tried to do is to link it where we can. But for example, we haven't included in those figures the, the kind of impact of somebody who might be selling a, an UGG or a Canada Goose into it, for example. So we've tried to, to, to ring fence that around the, the fur industry jobs itself rather than broadening that out. If you wanted to broaden it out, yes, but I couldn't give you an accurate figure on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks to the speaker and the chair. <coughs> thank you. Uh, Cabrera? Uh, thank you so much, and welcome uh, for the full panel. Uh, I'm a little struck with the number that you just gave, 7,000, because just about every article that I have seen uh, from your side, the number that I keep seeing was 1,000. So this is the first time, to be honest with you, I heard the number 7,000, so you have a huge incongruency. But I want to address, uh, you can't mention scientists. You know, the scientist's job is not to determine morality. It, here is when we bring these issues, social issues, and we get to determine whether we want to codify these moral issues that take place. So I, I'm not going to defer my judgment to scientists because we have seen what some scientists come up with and how many people have been injured and hurt uh, throughout society. Um, the second thing I wanted to bring up <coughs> is that you talked about, uh, and I hear you trying to come out with, with, with a scenario where you have regulation, but how do you regulate trappers when trappers don't let anybody else know where they put traps? Okay, so two questions. On the morality issue, I totally agree with you. It's, it's your moral versus my world, and, and a scientist can't impact on that. I appreciate so I, that. I, I, I totally respect that and get that. In terms of the, the, the trapping, the, the trappers are issued licenses and they are regulated in Canada and, and, uh, and America and they have um, agreed trapping areas where they're allowed to trap. They have agreed and strict quotas on how many animals they're allowed to trap and we will and can trace back exactly where the animal which goes to be sold at the auction comes from, which trap line it came from, and we can check and inspect whether that trapper has got their license and whether they're working to the approved quota that the government set for whether it's beaver or whatever particular uh, animal it is. Okay, appreciate that uh, bit of information. Uh, how many mints, uh, maybe I should ask, uh, what, what animals do you deal with? Mink. Mink, yes, uh, how many you usually have in a cage? Uh, never more than two. Uh, uh, like Mark said, during the whelp, you know, when they're having their babies, you know, you can't avoid that. But um, yeah, never more than two on our farm. Uh, are there are, are there not solitary creatures in the natural? <laughs> no. They are solitary creatures. I'm telling you, they are. And so, uh, which I'm surprised. I mean, this is what you do for a living. And, uh, you know, the, to, when you put them together, you take it out of their normal habitat uh, and the normal, normal natural instinct. Uh, you put them in a situation that I, I don't even. You put them in a situation that is unnatural, and and therefore not beneficial uh, for the mink. And so I'm just wondering why you wouldn't put them in a single cage, uh, an individual individual mink in an individual cage. So we put them in, we've, we've, we've done studies, there's been studies been done where they do better at a young age with, with a pair. 
And then and once they re reach adulthood, then yes, they're in individual cage, for no doubt about that. Once they become adults, for, for their own safety and the safety of the other one, of course. Here's my last thing. How big are those cages? Good question. They're, I, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't want to guess. But wait, 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 I'm, I'm confused. Okay. You're, you're the rancher. Two feet right? by three feet? Two feet by three feet. With, with, a, with an S-box and, and bedding inside of it? Two feet by three, three feet. feet. This, is, this is the living space for their entire lives? Yes. Our yes. understanding yes. is that most mink, uh, our understanding is that most mink cages are the size of a shoebox is the information that we received. That's not correct. No? Okay. No. Well, let's suppose, let, I'll give you the two feet, three feet. Is, is that like a natural type of environment uh, a humane way to go about it when it comes to a mink? According to the, you know, like Mark says, according to scientists, that's, that's what they're... I, 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 I don't know the last time that a scientist interviewed a mink <laughs> and say, is, is this the way, you know, is this a good living? I know I'm being a little sarcastic here, but come on. Ha they excuse not me, have you interviewed a mink? No, and that's my point. That's exactly my point. But I do see the natural habitat where they live in, and they do not live in a two feet by three feet environment. Let's be real. Let me talk about the elephant in the room here. We are raising animals just for the sole purpose of skinning them for our looks. Really. That needed to be said. I just got to get it off my chest. No, no, folks, 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 folks. If you, if you want to, if you agree with something, just both sides. Just go like this. <laughs> All right? Let's do like church. So, but I, I have to tell you, I have to get it on my chest. Because really, at the end of the day, that's what it comes down to. And, and as it was said before, it's not a byproduct you know, when it comes to food, yes, I hear my colleague with Adam and Eve. I'm a pastor of a church, and there was a necessity back there. We don't need this anymore. This is the real issue before us, and I sympathize when it comes to the job. Please understand, my heart goes out. I hear you. But what I hear and what we could maybe do here, Mr. Speaker, is to be able to transfer these jobs to be conducive and congruent to what New Yorkers are asking for. We're talking about 75% plus in all of the boroughs. This is not like this borough wants this and the other one wants this. I know you mentioned Beverly Hill, but you know what? Some of the richest people, as a matter of fact, the richest, pe the fifth richest people in America, I live right here, a couple of blocks away, and they're speaking loud. They live right here in Tribeca, making $850,000. And then you can go to my district where people are making $30,000, and everybody's saying the same thing. And I think the discussion should be now, how do we transition people who are in the field and to be able to help them with the transferable skills that they have, awesome skills that they have, to be able to, uh, to, for them to have a job to take care of their families and at the same time do your main thing. Because I don't see a humane way of raising animals to be, to, to, to basically, we're going to raise you. I imagine aliens came from outer space and say, well, we're just going to raise humans just to take your skin so we can wear them. I mean, it's just like, it just doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry, Mr. Speaker. It just, I just don't see, and you can answer back if, if you want, but I just don't see the logic. It's unreasonable, and, I, and it's inhumane, you know? It just makes no sense. Councilmember, I, I want to thank you, and I want to just mention that it, it's my understanding, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, that the Fur Commission, uh, the guidelines that are developed and regularly updated by the Fur Commission of the United States advises on the ethical farming of minks that this is what they recommend. The recommended pen cage size for a female mink uh, without a litter is 15 inches high and seven and a half inches wide. That, that's the guidelines the Fur Commission recommends in the United States of America. So 15 inches high and seven and a half inches wide. 
Uh, it's only a few inches higher than a shoebox standing on its end. That's, that's, out, what we that's have. currently outdated. No, that's, that's out. When, when was that changed? Mm, Ryan, a month ago? Two months ago? Two months ago. Two years ago. Two, two years ago. Two years ago. Okay. Uh, I want to thank you, Councilmember. I want to turn it to Councilmember Rosenthal. Uh, it was, uh, so two years ago, <clears throat> uh, what's the new standard requirement? What's, I'm what's sorry, the current I didn't hear the requirement? Question. What's the current cage requirement? I, I don't have the standard in front of me right now. Do you, do you know what's the current requirement? So slightly it's larger. slightly larger than 15 inches by 7 inches. So, so maybe 10 inches by 20 inches. But just so you know, Council Member, the, the, what I was reading off of yeah. is, uh, is from the Fur Commission website, and it says this was the 2019 edition, Book One. So this was the updated edition from this year. Is what it's what it's what is on the website right now. So the Fur Commission should update the website. If the website's not accurately reflecting reality, that this is what the website says right now if you go to the website. So that's concerning. And it does also make me wonder, um, I mean, I don't know if you were sworn in, but it, it makes me wonder about your saying that your cages are two feet by three feet. But even that aside, um, I, I concur, of course, with Councilmember Cabrera that, that that's inhumane from the get-go. Of course, in the fox industry, the goal is to overfeed them so they're five times the size they normally would be to use the fur. Is that also done in the mink industry? No. What's the goal for the size of an adult mink? We don't particularly have a goal per mink. Uh, like, it's like I said in my opening statement, is we feed them, they get amount of feed to where they eat what they want, and when they're done eating, they're done eating. I, I don't know what a mink's biological impulse control is. I mean, I know with Cats Cats and and interject. What's the average? Let's what's the average length of a mink that you're raising? An adult, an adult mink. I, I don't know. You you farm them, so you would know. What's the average? What's the average length? Twenty four inches, on average. And how about a mink in the wild? Five mink. Close to that. All right, so when we get some facts, uh, we should look at those, but regar reason, irregardless. Dude, Councilmember, the reason why I asked is if it's 24 inches and we just, just talked about the size of the cage. So if the average mink is 24 inches long, and even if the cage is two feet by three feet, though that's not what the guidelines we have in front of us are, that is a very small amount of room for an adult mink to be able to move around in. And you just told us it's 24 inches. Well, so it's, it's this, this is, again, that's, that, that's very disconcerting to hear that those are the numbers. The whole thing is disturbing. Uh, I don't care if you're gonna add an extra foot to it. Uh, you know, I, it's inhumane. It's cruel and inhumane, full stop. And it looks to me like the market is recognizing that. I'm looking at an April 30th, 2019 article that says that uh, the largest fur auction house is cutting its, uh, the number of its workers uh, by between 130 and 150 employees, uh, which was on top of a 45 person cut in 2018. Um, and it's because the demand has been reduced by over 30%. Yep, yeah, that's accurate. The demand for fur soared in the last five, six years in, in Asia. 
And then in China specifically, the market for luxury goods has really tailed off in the last two years. It's a huge, huge downturn. And it's as a result of that downturn in China that the overall figures are down. That's not the picture in cities in Europe and New York. It is, if you talk to Jaguar Land Rover, if you talk to many industries, just look at the stats on the China I'm, I'm economy. I'm just looking at one stat. If you have additional statistics you'd like to supply to the council, I'd be interested. I would, would In addition to. to that, I'd really like to see the route to your number that 7,000 jobs would be lost. We, Given that the number of fur houses decreased from 450 in the 70s to 14 right now, it cannot be explained by some little pop-up shops in Macy's and wherever else. You need to show us the route to the 7,000, and I'd like to know what the number was in the 1970s. Was it still 7,000? If you, if you would uh, offer So us a route to the number would sure. mean the number of stores, we, we have a full right? You have that? We have a full um, economic study available, uh, and we're more than happy I'm to... I'm sorry, was it distributed for this hearing? Do I have it in my pile Do you give of it to us? I, I don't know whether you've got it in your packs at the moment, but I know that we've done it and I believe we've submitted it, but I, I can't say whether it's, in your, whether, whether it's in your particular pack at the moment. I don't know what you have in front of me. I have the uh. material when anyone testifies, and I think the general public knows this, I'm sorry if mm. you didn't. You come with your facts and figures if you're gonna ask the council for its time, which is what I have right now, although I'm headed down to a budget briefing, <laughs> right? Well, so now's my time for me to look at data, and I'm not seeing it, is what I'm saying. Okay, well I know so it's been- So perhaps for the second hearing, sure. you'll be able to provide some actual data to show us why we would continue an inhumane practice. I can only apologize you if you've not received it, and you will, you will receive it. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah, go ahead. The next, no. next, panel. next panel, we have Lindsay Green from the, the mayor's office. Uh, I'm going to ask the council to swear the administration in. Thank you. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to answer council member questions honestly? I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Thank you. You may begin in whatever order you'd like. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for your patience and uh, letting some other folks testify before the administration. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson. Chairman Espinal, the Committee on Consumer Affairs, and Council Members. My name is Christine Kim, and I'm a Senior Community Liaison at the Mayor's Community Affairs Unit, and I work primarily on animal welfare issues. I am joined on the panel today by two other colleagues from the administration. Lindsey Green, Senior Advisor to the Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development, and Casey Adams, Director of the City Legislative Affairs at the Department of Consumer Affairs. We are pleased to represent Mayor Bill de Blasio's administration here today. Ms. Green and I will be testifying today, and Mr. Adams will be joining us for Q&A. I am pleased to be here today to discuss animal welfare, which is a priority of this administration. Like the Council, we are committed to advancing animal protection causes, and I want to specifically thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your personal commitment to animal welfare issues over the last several years. The mayor has long supported progressive animal welfare legislation, signed many bills into law to protect animals, and implemented bold and positive policies for animals ranging from companion animals to wildlife. Mayor de Blasio is also the first and only mayor 
to have an animal welfare liaison to be the direct link between City Hall and the animal welfare community. He has been listening and responding to the concerns of animal advocates since day one. For example, in collaboration with the City Council, the mayor has invested an unprecedented amount of funding into animal care centers of New York City, which is our open admission municipal animal shelter system. Just last year, the mayor and speaker announced an additional $3 million for animal care centers, bringing their fiscal year 19 budget to a record $17.6 million. As a result, animal care centers is at a historic 94% placement rate, making it a national leader in the placement of dogs, cats, and rabbits. In 2016, the mayor announced a plan to bring full service animal care centers to each of our five boroughs for the first time, as well as a standalone adoption center next to our Manhattan shelter. Further increasing our ability to adopt out animals, prevent the surrender of animals, and provide critical animal services to our communities. With the support of the City Council, we are now well underway, having locked in sites for the care centers in the Bronx and in Queens. This commitment to shelter animals has been cemented in the past year when we signed a 34-year contract to ensure the stability animal care centers needs in order to continue to deliver positive outcomes for our shelter animals for decades to come. We have also worked with City Council to enact a number of pet shop laws, which ultimately reduce the number of surrendered and homeless animals in our shelters. These laws include a mandate to spay and neuter dogs and cats sold in pet shops, the banning of the sales of dogs and cats sourced from puppy and kitten mills, and the banning of the sales of rabbits in pet shops. And thanks to the council's leadership, all new pet shops and 24-hour veterinary clinics are now required to have a fire sprinkler system. Recently, the mayor announced that all New York City public schools will participate in Meatless Mondays, which will affect 1.1 million students. Not only will our schools, as well as all 11 of our public hospitals, be serving vegetarian meals on Mondays, but all city agencies will be required to phase out processed meats and reduce their beef purchases by 50% as directed by the mayor's Green New Deal to combat climate change. In addition to his many accomplishments for animals used for food and companion animals, the mayor has shown extraordinary commitment to wildlife. The brand new state-of-the-art animal shelter in the Bronx to be completed by 2024 will not only be for companion animals, but will also feature a clinic and education center for New York City's only federally licensed wildlife rehabilitation center. The mayor is also demonstrating the feasibility and success of large-scale non-lethal wildlife management with the implementation of the city's deer impact management plan which has already led to a deer population reduction of approximately 15%. This is a dramatic example of a humane and scientifically cutting edge alternative to hunting and conventional lethal methods of wildlife management. And through the city's Wildlife NYC campaign, we are promoting the safe coexistence of wildlife and people and managing other impacts of deer in our urban environment. In 2017, the mayor was pleased to support a bill that Speaker Johnson was a lead co-sponsor of to ban wild and exotic animals from circuses in the city. Wild animals do not exist for our entertainment, nor do they exist to be made into luxury apparel to be worn when there are modern and synthetic alternatives. First time has come and gone in terms of the fashion industry. A lot of the leading figures in fashion agree and they have stopped using fur. It is inhumane. While we believe there are possible changes that would improve the bill's implementation and effectiveness, the prohibition on the sale of fur aligns with the mayor's perspective on animal welfare. The mayor supports the intro, the mayor supports intro 1476A to make New York City the first city on the East Coast and the largest city in the country to ban the sale of fur. We look forward to discussing and working with the council on the details of this bill. Now I turn to my colleague, Lindsey Green, who will discuss the administration's feedback on the proposed bill. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, uh, Chair Espinal, and uh, Councilman Cabrera. Um, I am Lindsey Green, a senior advisor to the Deputy Mayor for Housing and Economic Development. I focus on policy issues that involve economic development and business regulation, among other topics. Thank you for inviting uh, me and my colleagues to testify on the proposed legislation to ban the sale of fur apparel in New York City. 
As you know, Mayor de Blasio has always been a strong animal welfare advocate. As you have already heard from Ms. Kim, under Mayor de Blasio's leadership, the administration has deepened its commitment to support animal welfare in New York City. Having highlighted those accomplishments and our ongoing partnerships with the council, I wanted to, some, to provide some specific feedback on the bill at hand. Intro 1476A seeks to prohibit the sale of all fur apparel in New York City with proposed exemptions for used fur items or for items worn for religious custom. The administration supports the speaker's bill as it is consistent with our history of supporting animal welfare values. We want to specifically thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your leadership on this issue and for your work addressing animal welfare issues over the last several years. With regards to this specific legislation, I wanna to quickly touch on some anticipated enforcement practices. The administration wants to ensure that the fur prohibition is clear, easy to understand, and enforceable. This will, like, this will increase the likelihood of compliance, which is a benefit to all parties, including businesses and their customers, and presents the best outcome for the broad animal welfare goals of the proposed legislation. We recognize the need for carefully crafted exemptions for use for apparel and the need for religious sensitivity for fur apparel worn as part of a religious custom. In most cases, only the owner of a piece of apparel will be in a position to know whether that piece is used, is constructed from other used pieces, or is worn as a matter of religious custom. As currently drafted, the proposed legislation includes these exemptions, and we believe this language could be a bit clearer. Therefore, we believe uh, that the bill should place the burden of proving that a piece of fur apparel qualifies for an exemption upon the person most likely to have the information needed to make that determination, the person or business who chooses to sell it. This approach will make the bill more enforceable and ensure that only fur apparel that genuinely qualifies for an exemption will remain on the market. We also recognize that this bill, while achieving progress from an animal welfare issues perspective, would impact businesses and workers in this sector. One option we've heard proposed is to allow for a phase in and adjustment period that will maximize businesses' ability to adapt to this significant new uh, regulation. On the merits, it would be a way to allow businesses the opportunity to transition to fur apparel that is used or vintage or high-end faux fur, as have many fashion houses as discussed today. This proposal, as well as others that we expect to come from such businesses that engage in the legislative process regarding this proposal, all warrant consideration. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate that Mayor de Blasio is a strong supporter of animal welfare issues. I want to again uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson, for your leadership on this issue and commitment to animal welfare during your tenure. The mayor and his administration support uh, your bill, Speaker Johnson, and recognize that there are many details to be refined in order to most effectively implement it. We look forward to working with the council to do just that during the legislative process. Thank you for your time. We're happy to take any questions. I want to thank uh, you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. I am grateful to hear that the mayor uh, supports uh, this bill. Uh, and I just want to say um, I'm really proud of the record that we have together over the last five and a half years. The council pushed really hard for that additional funding for animal care centers so that we can get an even higher live release rate of animals that enter our shelter system. We deserve to be a no-kill city, and that's what we have to strive for through our shelter system. We need to build those shelters faster, though. Uh, we've been waiting a while. We need to get them done, especially the Manhattan uh, shelter, and we just finished the upgrades in the Staten Island shelter, which is great. I'm really proud. I'm really proud that uh, we uh, are just figured out the Bronx shelter up in Co-op City, and we are still working on a Queen shelter location as well. And the bills that you mentioned, whether it's the circus bills that I worked on with former Councilmember Rosie Mendez, uh, or bills that were contemplating now on bird safe glass in New York City to protect birds uh, or looking at foie gras and uh, how it's cruel and how we don't need it in New York City anymore. I am really proud of our agenda and becoming a more humane city for animals and I'm grateful for the partnership that we've had. Uh, so I want to thank you for that partnership and for being here today. I have uh, a couple of questions for you. If I can find them. So, um... Um, the, the exemptions that you mentioned, uh, Lindsay, on the uh, religious exemptions that we included in the bill, 
when the administration and the law department took a look at this, did you look at what other municipalities had done in Los Angeles and in San Francisco and other places to come to a place of being comfortable with what you delineated in your testimony here today? Uh, thank you, uh, Speaker, for the question. Uh, we have begun to look at those other uh, jurisdictions. I think there are some additional details to talk through uh, with staff during the legislative process, and I think there's some things to be learned from other jurisdictions' experience uh, implementing. I know it's early days, but I think we have some things to learn and would love to talk about those things with you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chair Espinal, I'm really grateful that you've had this hearing today. I have to run out, I'll be back, uh, but I have to run to a meeting and I'll come back. Um, and I appreciate Councilor Carrera, you being here as well. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I mean, with that said, we don't have any further questions, so thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Kathy Nazari, Solid Waste Advisory Board. Dan Matthews from PETA. <clears throat> Alexi Lim, Limbo, Mi, Lim, sorry, Libor, Libor, Mi, so, Libor Misla. Please, please correct me when you get up there. And we have Priscilla Ferro. Friends of Animals. So we're going to put a clock uh, of two minutes for testimony. You may begin. My name is Dan Matthews, Senior Vice President of PETA. PETA was involved in the fur bans that passed overwhelmingly in LA and San Francisco. Lawmakers are voting to ban fur sales because fur producers operate outside of the law. Unlike other industries that use animals, fur producers do not receive government oversight or inspection to ensure that the animals live or die with even minimal standards. PETA filmed a mink farmer in Maryland who killed the animals by injecting them with weed killer because it was cheap and easy. He had no experience and no interest in veterinary medicine. We filmed a chinchilla farmer in Indiana who genitally electrocuted the animals by clamping their genitalia and attaching it to a car battery. The voltage was not consistent and he laughed when some of the animals came alive on the skinning boards. He had no interest or experience in veterinary medicine. In Korea, we filmed a fur farmer who swung foxes by the tail between two wooden boards and then crushed them to death before exporting their pelts to New York City. In China, we filmed fur farmers who slammed raccoon dogs' heads into the ground, which dazed them but did not kill them. They were skinned alive. Dog fur from China has ended up on racks here in New York City where it was mislabeled as fake. The FTC has cited many retailers for false labeling, but there were no penalties. That's why we need a law banning fur that comes with a penalty. Nowadays in the States, animals are often killed for less conspicuous fur trim or collars, mostly coyotes. They're killed in traps like I demonstrated before, traps that have been banned in 100 countries but are used in all but seven of the United States. That trap was available for $10 on Amazon, and though meant for coyotes, they routinely cripple and kill family dogs, cats, owls, and other wildlife. Like fur farms, trapping is self-regulated. Trappers claim they check traps daily, but if the weather's bad or they just don't feel like it, animals can languish every, for every, days. Just, yeah, just, everybody keep it down. Uh, I'll decide when I want to cut off a speaker. They die of exhaustion, infection, shock, or by being eaten by a predator from whom they can't escape. Some animals even attempt to chew off their limbs to escape. Trapping cannot be regulated because only the trappers know where the traps are. Like fur farmers, trappers operate outside the view of the law, and that is why lawmakers are banning fur. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, thank you, uh, Council Member Espinal and the committee for allowing me to speak. My name is Kathy Nazari. I'm a board member of Voters for Animal Rights and the Solid Waste Advisory Board. The barbarity of practices like skinning an animal alive while fully conscious should be reason enough to ban the sale of fur. What impact does it have on the environment and human health? I included two pages of references for you, so I won't, I won't go into great detail. The World Bank calls fur one of the top five worst industries for toxic metal pollution. A fur coat takes 20 times more energy to produce than a faux fur coat. Don't be misled, European countries have actually banned fur as green advertising because it is false. Fur is heavily dependent on fossil fuels and electricity, is intensely polluting to air and water, kills marine life. Fur traps capture endangered species and family pets. Fur processors have been fined by the EPA and use at least 14 chemicals classified by the EPA, OSHA, and other agencies as human carcinogens causing cancer, leukemia, hormonal imbalances, and respiratory problems as they are absorbed through the skin and nose and remain in the body for 20 years. Forbidden levels have even been found in children's apparel and the American Journal of Industrial Medicine associated fur processing with an increase in women's breast cancer. Fur puts human health at risk both for the worker and the consumer. It has no place in our future or in New York City's Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is about to change everything. Its primary goal is to achieve net zero emissions by eliminating fossil fuels and toxic pollution from our environment, manufacturing, agriculture, and other industries to guarantee clean air and water, and it aims to protect endangered species. By eliminating toxic fuels, no one is saying, uh, fossil fuels, no one is saying coal miners and oil workers should lose their jobs. Green New Deal calls for training to transition these workers to green energy jobs. In the same way, we would like to see the people who work with fur transition to other textiles. How? Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer created the Garment Center Steering Committee, then Speaker Cory Johnson and the City Council recently approved a plan that will help garment workers move into the future. The City and the Council of Fashion Designers of America are launching a $14 million expansion of the Fashion Manufacturing Initiative providing grants to support existing employees with training to work with emerging technologies and upgrade equipment in local manufacturing. What better use than to transition fur workers to new textiles? I've spoken with the leadership at Parsons School of Fashion who are interested in discussion. I have to ask you to wrap up. Uh, can I just finish one more paragraph? The, the, second, the second time I ring, so let's try to wrap up there. Okay, thank you. Hello, I'm Priscilla Farrell, president of Friends of Animals. We were incorporated in New York City in 1957. When I started working here in 1974, my first assignment was to hold a fur protest outside the ASPCA's fur fashion show at a luncheon on Fifth Avenue. That's how far we've come since the 1970s since the heyday of fur in New York City. I had a former trapper, someone with a license, um, here today to demonstrate two traps, but he didn't get inside. So what I want to emphasize is what he would have told you about those trapping devices. The Lakehold trap was invented in 1820. It's a 19th century device. The Conibear trap was invented in 1957. These are sadistic trapping devices. Not only do they close on an animal's limb, the real damage to an animal, the suffering occurs during their struggle to escape. When they're thrashing around in the steel jaws, they rip tendons, they fracture bones, they sometimes chew off their own feet to escape. The conibear trap smashes on animals that are uh, water animals, like beavers. Before they drown in that trap, their pelvises are crushed. They're called body-crushing devices. And although at least one device is widely prohibited outside the U.S., they are entirely legal here. The fur industry is in free fall. This is the time you think about moral arguments rather than weighing everything according to economics. 
the economic value of those pelts, a beaver in a New York auction now commands $10, a raccoon $7, a fox $8, coyotes $10. These are throwaway animals whose lives should mean more. It's important for our humanity to support 1476, and I ask you to throw your full weight behind it, and I thank you so much for indulging this difficult issue. Thank you. Do you have, do you have any questions? Uh, I have one question for, for Dan. In, in your testimony, you uh, mentioned some very um, egregious um, ways that these animals were killed. Uh, is, is that would you say uh, industry norm, or are there regulations around um, whether or not an animal can be killed that way for its fur, for its public? Uh, all the farms are self-regulated. Many fur farms and many trappers do it as a hobby. Uh, PETA has gone around the world with uh, uh, video cameras, and we uh, ask the fur farmers to show us how they do what they're doing. We often say that we're interested in this whole issue, interested in possibly opening a fur farm, and they gladly show us how they do this. This is. Uh, why all these videos that are, have, have changed the world are all over the internet. They, uh, we have been, had to uh, buy out some fur farmers. In Montana, we had to buy out of beaver farms because they had no money and the animals were starving to death. We recently, last year, bought out a uh, chinchilla farm in California uh, where the animals were not getting any vet care. It's, it's a completely self-regulated industry, as, is, uh, as are the trap lines. So there are no regulations regulating how these animals can be killed and whether or not the way That's you saw right. them That's right. It's up to them. It's up to them. It's up to each individual farmer. And again, right. they, it never occurred to them to learn about humane euthanasia or get veterinary training. It's not on their mind. All right. Thank you. I'm going to call up the next panel. And I'm going to ask everyone to please keep your voices down. If you continue being disruptive, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. Uh, everyone's going to have a chance to say what they have to say. Uh, everyone's going to have the chance to testify. And when we get to you, uh, you'll be able to, to express yourself. Thank you. Up next, we have Tom Garcia from Decker Brands and Ten Ted Patricus, Retail Counsel of New York State. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Garcia, and I serve as the Senior Vice President, General Counsel and Compliance Officer at Decker's Brands. I would like to thank Speaker Johnson, Chairman Espinal, as well as members of the committee for the opportunity to testify, testify before you today. Founded in 1973, Decker's Brands is a global multi-brand company that includes footwear brands such as Ugg, Teva, Sanook, and Hoka 1-1. I'm here to testify today in regards to intro 1476A, which prohibits the sale of fur apparel the current definition of fur in the bill means any animal skin, in whole or in part, with the hair, fleece, or fur fibers attached. This definition would prohibit the sale of certain UGG brand products, including our iconic UGG classic boot that contains sheepskin. It is important to distinguish sheepskin products from luxury fur products such as fox, lynx, and mink that this legislation is uh, seeking to ban. Sheepskin leg leather is a byproduct of food production, making it fundamentally different from luxury fur products. On May 8th, Speaker Johnson framed the byproduct distinction in explaining that the current bill would not apply to leather by saying, leather is a co-product of meat, so right now if you're killing mink or chinchilla or a coyote or fur, you're not eating their meat. In light of this important distinction, we believe a byproduct exemption for sheepskin would be included, should be included in this legislation. Simply put, sheepskin is just like leather. It is important to note that the hides would otherwise be discarded or not incorporated into products if they're not incorporated into products. Utilizing them is a more sustainable approach. It is for these reasons that other jurisdictions with fur bans, such as Los Angeles, San Francisco, and the city of Berkeley, have exempted sheepskin from the definition of fur. There's also a bill in the New York State Assembly sponsored by Assembly Member 
Linda Rosenthal, that bans the sale of fur, but includes an exemption for sheepskin in the definition of fur. We are committed to sourcing our material in a sustainable way, as evidenced by our ethical sourcing and animal welfare policy, which is posted on our website. Additionally, Decker's Brands is part of an animal welfare group within the Leather Working Group, which is made up of member brands, retailers, and leather manufacturers that work together to, de to develop industry best practices. We urge the council to amend the legislation to include an exemption for sheepskin from the definition of fur. We look forward to working with the council on this issue. Thank you, good afternoon. Chairman Espinal, Member Cabrera, thank you for having us here. My name is Ted Patrikas. I am President and CEO of the Retail Council of New York State. We're the state's leading trade association for the retail industry, representing member stores in New York City and across the state, ranging from the smallest independents to the nation's best known brands. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today on 1476A. We share the concerns raised in the introduction regarding the sourcing of fur currently available for sale and endorse without reservation the restriction of fur produced without regard for animal welfare. We submit respectfully that product bans no longer are an effective tool to affect permanent chain within, change within the supply chain. Shoppers in 2019 demand choice, and literally within the palms of their hands, they have more options than ever before as to where, when, and how they shop. It's easy for today's shopper to evade any ban on any product. Unable to find what they want in New York City, they simply will go to another state, city, or online to buy what they choose. This council has the opportunity to preserve that coveted customer choice and drive real and sustainable change that would affect the fur marketplace beyond the city's border. To that end, we urge you to incorporate certain provisions found in related measures approved in Los Angeles and elsewhere, including allowing the sale of shearling and cattle hair and an effective date of January 1, 2021. In addition, we think that strictly regulated practices in New York would reduce and quite possibly eliminate bad actors throughout the global supply chain. Codified standards in the sourcing of fur sold in New York City would require suppliers from around the world to accede to certain assessments. And surely suppliers would want their products to be available for sale in New York City, one of the world's top shopping destinations, and would redouble their efforts to ensure they meet the city's requirements. We reiterate our support to restrict the sale of fur produced without regard for animal welfare, and today offer our pledge as an industry to work constructively with you toward a solution that preserves animal welfare and customer choice. We hope to be your partner in ensuring full and rigorous compliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Up next, we have Rodney King, Mark Bauer, Stuart Mitchell, Cynthia King, and Elsa Lebowitz. Good afternoon, council persons. Uh, thank you. My name is Rodney King. I'm here as a private citizen. I'm a native Brooklynite, a husband and father, and someone who comes to you today to speak in strong support of 1476, the measure to ban the sale of fur products in New York City. My purpose today is to speak not only as a proponent for the humane and ethical treatment of animals, but as an African-American man, I'm here to dispel some of the myths that may be propagated here today and stereotypes of how we, African-Americans, and more specifically black men, think when it comes to issues such as this. I come from a people who have too often been portrayed by the larger society in general as people who are incapable of a broad range of feelings and emotions or as incapable of showing compassion for others, much less creatures described as lesser than us, of being not much more than brutish creatures ourselves. African Americans have indeed routinely been denied the ability to achieve the so-called status so often reserved 
often for many white Americans. And so when the obstacles to those achievements are overcome, it is indeed something to be celebrated and cherished. However, immersing ourselves in the outward trappings and raiment of this so-called status does nothing to actually achieve any achievement at all. It only serves to reinforce long-held beliefs that we are backwards-thinking juvenile people who are more concerned with material goods and obtaining the many baubles and trinkets of our former oppressors that were so long denied to us, as opposed to obtaining the true signifiers of achievement, a good education, a good job, decent living conditions, decent health care, and a just and fair criminal justice system, and the respect of our neighbors and peers. Please don't fall for the okie doke Please don't be bamboozled, okay? It is incumbent upon you for you to act upon your conscience and not be intimidated by political fear, by those who would use subterfuge to make you believe that this is somehow a racial or religious issue. Hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me speak here today. <clears throat> My name is Mark Bauer. I am a New York fashion designer. I have a successful business here in New York City. We do not sell or design anything using real fur. I am fortunate to dress some very famous women, like Angelina Jolie, Beyonce, Oprah, Shania Twain, Mariah Carey, Emily Blunt, and Tyra Banks, just to name a few. Many who seek out fur-like alternatives. I'm only too happy to show them. We New Yorkers do not hunt animals for food. We New Yorkers do not live in caves. There is no good reason for us to wear real fur on our bodies to keep us warm. Technology has given us incredible faux fur if we so choose to wear fur. Animals that are bred on fur farms specifically for their skins live in horrific cage conditions. They are anally electrocuted, causing unimaginable suffering. Many don't actually die from this process and are often skinned while they are still alive. In places like China, they are just skin peeled and tossed alive into writhing piles to die a slow, agonizing death. All these poor animals, like us humans, bond and protect their young. They, just like us, experience, fain, experience fear, pain, and suffering. There is absolutely no excuse for cruelty to animals. Anyone that profits from the sale of fur is perpetuating cruelty to animals. Anyone re wearing real fur sends a message of vanity. They just don't care. So I'm asking you, New Yorkers, please care. We New Yorkers are the heroes of compassion and change. Please, New York, be the heroes for these suffering animals and ban the sale of fur in New York. Real fur belongs on an animal's body, not on ours. Thank you. Thank you, honorable council members. My name is Cynthia King. I'm a business owner, a teacher, a wife, a proud wife, a mother, and a voter. I'm speaking today on behalf of New York City Hip Hop is Green. Hip Hop is Green is a pioneering movement led by a team of artists and performers that use the power and influence of hip hop to speak to youth and spark positive changes in their lives. Fur symbolizes inhumanity, captivity, oppression, and violence. We refute any notion that fur has some specific cultural importance, as we know that, unfortunately, status-seeking and materialism belongs to many cultures. We work to empower our young people with things of true value, empathy, compassion, healthy habits, and good education. We teach them to avoid following detrimental trends like the excessive spending, especially on things that they've been convinced represent success, achievement, luxury, but really only empower the owners, the industry, people who do not uplift our community. The fur industry is a cruel and barbaric one. Animal cruelty is linked directly or indirectly with every type of violent crime. Domestic violence, child abuse, spouse abuse, and elder abuse is closely associated with animal cruelty. Perpetuator, per, perpetrators use animal cruelty to control women and children in abusive situations. The connection between animal cruelty and violence is indisputable. The fur industry is animal cruelty. cruelty. We must not turn a blind eye to an industry that perpetuates violence, the exact opposite of what our community needs. 
We must embrace this moment of progress and ban the sale of fur in our city. We know New York City leads the world, although LA is ahead of us a little bit on this one. The fur industry has sunk to a new low. To try to maintain profits and relevance, they feign concern for communities that they see only as a revenue source, not as a genuine ally or partner. Uh, it is common sense that we should try to alleviate suffering whenever we can. We commend Speaker Johnson on his courageous and compassionate leadership, and you all. New York City Hip Hop is Green supports intro 1476. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Um, my name is Stuart Mitchell. I live in the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, the 36th district, district uh, which is Robert E. Carnegie Jr.'s district. Um, the world around us is changing. Uh, people are starting to make more ethical choices concerning the environment and the welfare of other species. People are starting to use less plastic because of the effect it has on our oceans and ocean life. People are, people are starting to gravitate towards more plant-based alternatives to milk and meat because people are starting to realize the ill effects that factory farming animals for meat has on the environment and the planet. A fur ban in New York City is a step in the same ethical direction that all other industries are moving towards. New York has long been considered a fashion mecca. We have always set the pace for everyone else to keep up with as far as fashion is concerned, but unfortunately, this is the one time we're falling behind and everybody else is moving ahead. Think of the impact we would have on the world if we said no to fur for fashion. Fur farms all over the world are already closing. Cities like Los Angeles, San Francisco, and West Hollywood are already on board here in the United States for banning fur sales. Famous designers like Versace, Michael Kors, Armani, Gucci, and so many others are already saying no to fur. We are behind. In 2019, wearing the skin of an innocent animal is unacceptable. There are more sustainable alternatives to stay warm and to be fashionable that don't exploit animals' farm for what is rightfully theirs. Two years ago, my daughter asked me to buy her a Canada goose coat. I told her, Taj, you know I'd do anything for you, but you're not getting that coat. You have, you have a choice. Animals don't have a choice to become a fabric. I explained to her how coyotes are trapped in their habitat and kill for their fur to make the fur trim on the hood. And after I explained this to her, she didn't want the coat anymore, but then she asked me, Daddy, why don't they just use fake fur? And that's a question I have for everyone here. Why are we not using fake fur? Animals are not items, and we have to end this barbaric tradition of skinning them alive for what is rightfully theirs, and I support intro 14... 76A, and I also want to say that as an, a descendant of African slaves who are bought here and used as a commodity, mm -hmm. it is disturbing for me to watch other fellow sentient beings have their freedom taken away from them and used as a commodity for the gain of the monetary gain of others. Mm -hmm. Please hold, hold your applause, please. Um, thank you, yes. Maria Reich, Alicia George, Frank Siller, and Justin Siller, Nick Polagorsis, Polagorsis, Maria Reich, Alicia George, Frank Siller, and Nick Polagiorgis. John Georgiades. May I begin? Hi, my name is Justin Siller, and I am the co-owner of Staten Island Furrier, and we are a brick and mortar store. And um, I understand the concerns of the other side. Um, I will tell you this, I am a father, I am married, I have three small children, I have a mortgage, I have school tuition. We are good, decent human beings who work very, very hard, and if this, goes, if this ban goes through, the psychology that you talked about with the animals, uh, I'm thinking of the human psychology 
of the people in this industry, the more than 7,000 in this city and all across the country, because I can see the writing on the wall right now. Um, we have to be protected. We're humans, and we have to be protected. Thank you. Please, please hold your applause again. Hopefully, this is the last time I would say this. My name is Frank Silla. I'm co-owner of Staten Island Ferry with my son here. Um, I will say that, you know, listening to so many people speak and to the specifics, there is not one furrier here that wouldn't follow better guidelines, that I would say. There is not a store here, a first store here, that wouldn't follow better guidelines, that we could work together to create a more humane way to run our industry, to raise furs, and to take furs. That being said, Many people in here made up a lot of stories on how a lot of pe people raised their furs. They had to go to China to talk about how some furs were raised. This is America, and most people in America raise it the proper way. Those who don't, we should be put away. Absolutely should be put away. That being said, some people here will not stop until you or you can't have a pocketbook or a belt or shoes or I can't eat meat, or decide to have a, a, a chicken for dinner, they will not be happy until that happens. Our fur industry is willing to make changes, to make it a better environment, absolutely. And, and I want to say another thing. Most people in the fur business are community people. They're involved in their communities. I'll speak for our, our story here on, on Staten Island, that we, over the last 10 years, have donated over $150,000 to the homeless and to help feed them and house them in Project Hospitality, which I know many people in, your, in the legislative know all about Project Hospitality and the beautiful work that Reverend Troya does. We're involved in many different levels. Many times you hear about it, many times you don't. We're part of our communities. We're family. It is a family business, generation after generation have been in this business, and a lot of them cannot transfer or cannot be taught something else. This is what they know, and this is what they can do. And you know what? It's, it's a decent business, whether you like it or not. It's a good business, and I don't think anyone has the right to come in here and tell me that I am doing something wrong when I know I'm not doing something wrong, and I care about human beings. Thank you. Again, again, guys, we're not, we're not allowing applause in the chambers. Just raise your hands, shake them in the air. You can do that. Just do not applaud. Thank you. My name is John Georgiadis, and I represent Stallion Inc., a New York City Economic Development Corporation funded manufacturing company. We're a manufacturer and retailer of women's fur coats and ready-to-wear apparel. Our annual sales are approximately 30 million, and we have three retail stores and our factories in Long Island City. We moved to Long Island City. We have 90 employees, and they're represented uh, by council members here. We moved to Long Island City in 2007 and funded our current production facility with financing provided by the New York City Industrial Development Group. The financing was provided because we improved the economic and employment conditions in the area. A number of employees has doubled over the last 12 years. In 2015, Build New York City Resource, Corp Re Resource Corporation refinanced our building with over seven million of revenue refunding bonds. Substantial portion of the proceeds were used to improve our building and provide additional resources specific to the fur business. If New York City decides to ban fur, it will have a catastrophic impact on our operations. We will be forced to close a factory and retail stores in New York City and elsewhere. All our employees will be let go without severance pay and benefits including medical insurance, which are provided to our employees at no cost to them. We will go into default on eight million in obligations on the New York City revenue refunding bonds. All costs associated with our store leases of over $3 million will be lost will be in default of our working capital debt of over six million, and our inventory supply contracts will be abandoned, and that will result in mire of lawsuits. We will default in our multi-million year um, Madison Avenue leases, which will result in hu huge liability. Our 90 employees with families who are dependent on them will lose their livelihoods because you are deciding to put our industry out of business. 
you funded this business with the industrial revenue bonds, and now you want to take it away. How does that make sense? Hi, I'm Alicia George, and I represent Stallion Inc. My speech I had prepared, I can no longer speech that, I cannot speak that. Because after I heard all that was said earlier, it's very disheartening to me. I came here as an immigrant from the Caribbean, and I came here in pursuit of the American dream. And because of the fur industry, I was afforded that. Today, I look and I'm afraid that my dream will be shattered because you have a very small group who are more concerned about animals than a community to me is human life. When I'm listening to everyone more concerned about the welfare of an animal, how about the human beings? There is so much you can do for the community today. When I see homeless people sitting, I see people dying from cancer, and you're telling me you're concerned about an animal that's being caged? Really? I am concerned too. Yes, animal has afforded me my lifestyle today, the death of it. I understand that. I understand, and I give you have the right to care for animals to have them as your pets. I understand that. I love animals too, but you know what? I cannot see how an animal, I love them, I wear them, I love them. Absolutely, I love them wearing them on my back. Yes, I'm a lover of fur. But I tell you what, if you're telling me animals are much more of concern to you than the people you're looking at, the people who have worked so hard to build and give the growth in New York today, my dear friend, Councilman, I cannot believe you are the one that I'm looking for to to make New York the place that I want to be in. Thank you. All right, guys, no clapping. Please. Um, just a quick question. You mentioned earlier uh, about, where you, about uh, fur being sourced from different parts of the world. Uh, where do you source your fur from, and how do you verify that your fur is not coming for, from China, for example? Well, they are fur labeled, and that was something that was discussed today that uh, you said, or some of the experts said, that we can improve on that, and that will be improved upon. So they're, they're fur labeled? Yes, they are. Can you, Country can, origin. Can you, can you uh, drill into that a little more? How do, you, how do you purchase your fur? How do you know where it comes from? When you fur label, where do you get it? Yeah. We have partners that we work with in this city, wholesalers and manufacturers that we buy from that have the country of origin. And then when we sell it retail, we have to put on the tag, the ticket, country of origin, where the pelts are from. Are you able to trace back which farms the, the Do, from? Are you asking me if I go to the farms? No. Uh, that's not what I asked. I asked, are you able to track I don't have which, which fur? Wh well, which I, I, the trust the, my, I trust my business partners, yes, in New York City, who are regulated as they discussed uh, the first panel today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I want to call up Michelle uh, Villa Gomez, ASPCA, Brian Shapiro, from Humane Society of the, of the U.S., Edita Bernkrantz from Night Class, Sugan Goel Agrawal from Gunas, New York. Anna Tagliabu from Peluche. Uh, You may, you may begin. Um, dear council members, uh, I am Sugand Agarwal and I live in Long Island City. Um, I started my company in 2009. My brand is called Gunas New York and um, we, I have been committed to make luxury, vegan, cruelty-free handbags for the modern, style-conscious and fashion-forward women. 
My brand has been awarded the best green handbag by InStyle, best retail bag by Macy's, best vegan handbag brand by PETA. The brand's been featured in Vogue magazine, Harper's, Baz Harper's Bazaar, Let's Make a Deal TV show, um, and a bunch of other TV shows on, um, on Netflix. I'm here today to testify in support for the ban on sale of fur in New York City, with primarily three strong arguments. One, plastics, in my opinion, are a genius human invention. Unlike plastic straws and bottles that are a convenience tool and can easily be avoided, faux fur and faux leather are a genius use of plastics. Using plastics as faux fur is an adaptation of nature, a way to mimic its beauty instead of destroying it. Several innovations in the form of fur made from hemp fibers, corn-based plastic, water-based faux materials instead of petrochemicals, and even plastic made from avocado seeds are now being developed by scientists all over the world. Let's not be a creature of habit rather than rather an evangelist of change, a change that is the need of the hour. Let's stop the abuse of animals in the name of fashion. Point two, ethical jobs will be created. There comes a time when an industry no longer serves the purpose of humankind. We're at this very crossroad with the fur industry. Instead of fearing change, we need to embrace it, innovate, and give our future generations what they really want. There is a clear growing demand for animal-free products. As a small business owner, the growing success of my brand is a clear indication that the millennial and Gen, Gen Z consumers want this change. We want to have nothing to do with garments made from brutality. No amount of regulation in the fur industry can justify the torture, abuse, and pain we inflict upon animals. Point three, designers, um, big and small, do not support the use of fur in fashion. New York is one of the top four world capitals for fashion. What values do we want to stand for? Torture cannot be labeled as aesthetically, morally, and visually pleasing. Animal abuse is modern day slavery. Let's liberate them by creating incentives similar to those embraced through several other green initiatives by our city. As a mom, as an immigrant, um, I want this kind of world for my child. And as a business owner, I know it can be done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Espinal. My name is Adita Bernkrant, and I'm the Execu Executive Director of NICLASS, an animal advocacy and political action nonprofit organization based in New York City. And I'm a resident of Queens. And NICLASS is strongly in support of Intro 1476. And we applaud Speaker Cory Johnson for introducing this important bill that confronts and outlaws the sale of a form of hideous animal cruelty, as we've already heard today. And uh, already mentioned was the citywide Mason-Dixon poll of registered voters conducted this month found that an overwhelming majority of New Yorkers, 75%, support the ban. Um, and the breakdown of people polled was 74% of Democrats, 71% of Republicans, and 79% of Independents all wanted to see the ban of uh, fur go forth. And these polling results, to me, speak volumes about the fact that how we treat animals as a society and as a city is truly nonpartisan. Even people at total opposite ends of the political spectrum agree almost equally that the immense violence and cruelty to animals inherent in each piece of fur means that it should be unacceptable to sell the products of such torture in the year 2019 in New York City. And I don't use the word torture lightly. We've already heard from vets and many other people about the torture that is inherent in fur and the over 100 million um, animals every year that are electrocuted, gassed, poisoned, bludgeoned, trapped in the wild, and skinned <clears throat> just for their fur and the many toxic chemicals that are then necessary to treat the pelts, making the fur industry a menace to not only animals, but the environment. And the animals that these, the agony these animals endure, including dogs and cats and many other wild animals, is undeniable. And how can we continue to justify such cruelty for fur collars, coats, or accessories when ethical alternatives abound? And we've already heard from designers who are doing just that, providing those ethical alternatives. These are the reasons many top designers and retailers are shunning fur and that consumer trends have been declining. And we hope that the committee votes yes. Thank you. My name is Anatalia Bue. I'm the founder of Peluche, a zero waste faux fur co clothing company based in New York City. Today, we can accurately imitate any kind of animal fur existed in nature and even invent new ones. We are in the middle of a fur revolution, or as I call it, a revolution. 
fox, mink, chinchilla, brothel, coyote, rabbit, lamb, all these beautiful creatures don't have to be slaughtered for vanity. In many cases, their fur is used as an accent, not even providing warmth for, clo for clothing. Technology has rendered this obsolete, and now we can celebrate our beloved animals as inspiration with exciting new high technology textiles that have replaced the need to kill animals for fur. It's very simple, there should be no confusion about it. There is no gray area, there is right and there is wrong, and killing animals for fashion's sake is wrong. How can we justify wearing real fur in the 21st century? I have devoted 20 years of my life developing the antidote to, to this cruelty. Before that, I worked in the high-end luxury fashion industry selling animal furs until I had a life-changing epiphany and realized that my industry was really a killing machine, profiting from a barbaric and antiquated trade in cruelty. I remember the first time discovering imitation fur textiles and immediately seeing the vast potential of such products. They are beautiful and innovative, like something from the future. I thought to myself, if we can reproduce something so beautiful that looks and feels like real fur, why do we have to enslave, exploit, torture, and kill innocent animals for vanity? So I began researching and reinvented my career, my career in fashion as a mission not only to create beautiful functional clothing, but to ensure that they're free from cruelty, suffering, and blood. Please, respected member of New York City Council, do the right thing, make the right choice. There is no confusion. Animal fur is immoral, unethical, unsustainable, and completely unnecessary. It's very simple. It's wrong. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Villagomez, New York City Legislative Senior Director for the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals, the ASPCA. I'd like to thank the Consumer Affairs Committee and Chairman Espinal for the opportunity to share the ASPCA's position on fur. While the ASPCA is known widely for a long history of work with companion animals, we believe that all animals should live free from abuse and suffering. Our official policy and position statement states that the ASPCA is opposed to the farming, ranching, trapping, shooting, or otherwise killing of fur-bearing animals for clothing and accessories. For this reason, we support the efforts of the bill sponsors, Speaker Johnson, Councilmember Levine, and are grateful for their leadership in rejecting the for-profit suffering of vulnerable animals for fashion. Consumers need to be empowered to make ethical and sustainable choices. Many designers have been moving away from using fur in the last several years, and many of them have been outlined in previous testimony. Um, bans on the sale of fur have been instituted in Austria, the UK, the Netherlands, as well as Los Angeles and San Francisco here in the United States. We have an opportunity to prevent animals like raccoons, foxes, mink, and chinchillas from suffering from cruel and inhumane treatment at fur farms here and abroad. We applaud your close examination of this important policy question. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Espinal and honorable committee members. As the New York State Director for the Humane Society of the United States, uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to present today and also for uh, the leadership shown by uh, Speaker Johnson. I will keep my statement short and as many people who wish to speak. The HSUS has worked with companies from Gucci, Michael Kors, Chanel, TJ Maxx, and Burlington Coat Factory in order to find a more humane and profitable way for them to continue um, to sell products. When these companies stop and think about it and make such a significant policy change, it's based on the fact that they've come to the conclusion there is not any way to humanely source fur. You, I mean, just speaking honestly and plainly, I had to pinch myself earlier when we're having a discussion that anal electrocution is acceptable or may be considered humane because a scientist somewhere says that. You know, culturally and historically, we have put our faith in scientists who say such things in the past, and at times it has not turned out so well. With that said, consumers, industry leaders, leading animal protection organizations, and constituents applaud the introduction of 1476A and respectfully ask that this measure pass committee. Thank you for your consideration for your service to the people in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, up next we have Reverend Dr. Johnny Green. Robert Cahill, Jack Cohen, 
Kristen Kern and Norman Ambrose. Dr. Johnny Green, Robert Cahill, Jack Cohen, Kristen Kern, and Norman Ambrose. May begin. Good afternoon. My name is Kristen Kern, and on behalf of the American Problem Footwear Association, I thank you for the opportunity to testify on Intro 1476A. AEFA is the National Trade Association representing apparel, footwear, travel goods, and other sewn products companies and their suppliers, which compete in the global market. We represent over 100 companies with corporate offices or headquarters in New York State, which would be impacted by a restriction on the sale of animal skin or fur products. This legislation would greatly impair our company's ability to deliver products that consumers want. The choice of materials used in apparel and footwear products is important, and consumers make educated decisions about the types of products that they purchase. When a consumer demand exists, the product is there to supply that demand, and when demands change, companies adapt. Regulating material choices for companies artificially restricts trade and will drive business out of the city into surrounding areas. Because the demand for fur will still exist, it's likely that most consumers will continue to buy fur, whether it's sold in New York City or elsewhere. Moreover, this legislation will cause a loss of jobs and closure of small business manufacturers in the city. Dictating elements of style and design may also negatively impact fashion trade shows, which frequently travel to New York City and threatens New York City's status as an international fashion capital. This also risks a negative impact on tourism and shopping, a major source of revenue for New York City businesses. Additionally, AFA advocates for the harmonization of regulations at the city, state, and federal levels. Numerous and conflicting regulations from one locality to the next increases the cost of doing business, especially for companies who sell in many different product categories, as many of our companies do. Of course, increasing the cost of business is by requiring companies to track changing regulations, update their compliance policies, and develop new products increases the cost of products for consumers. We recommend that the council reconsider this legislation, which will limit consumer choice, kill jobs, and hurt New York City's economy. Thank you for your time and consideration. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Norman Ambrose, and I am a designer and small business owner here in our great city of New York. Working in fashion has been, been a lifelong pursuit, one that has taken me on an incredible journey of amazing highs and extreme lows. As we can all relate, life can be tough, full of hard times, and when I fell on hard times, it was the help of a local furrier, a, a f family business owner and manufacturer that embraced me and my talents, supporting my label and paying me a working wage. We are in an industry of inclusion and unity, one made up of many races, nationalities, religions, and orientations. We are New Yorkers. Today, I and the thousands of New Yorkers who will be affected by this bill are united to stand up for our livelihood, the environment, our freedom of choice, and for social justice. Fashion as an industry is the second most polluting industry in the world. Every year, only 1% of new clothing made or of, of, is of recycled materials, and 74% of new clothing either ends up in landfill or is burned. The United Nations called upon the general public in a tweet this past February that all of us as a global community need to make better choices when it comes to the clothing we purchase by choosing natural materials. My brand believes in sustainability and reducing the amount of man-made fibers that pollute our environment dioxins, vinyl chloride, dichlorides, ethylene, lead. These are all components of faux fur, the majority of faux fur. And I remind you, they do not biodegrade. Sustainability and the environment are at the forefront of mainstream, in, of, of mainstream industry and major conscious shift is taking place within our society to evaluate the impact on the environment. Our very own Mayor de Blasio has been working on the Green New Deal Calling for the reduction of emissions, as I quote from past Monday, the Green New Deal is here to stay. It's bold, audacious, necessary. He's talking about 100% renewable energy, assuming things can be different. All this relating to reducing pollution in our environment. You call out Trump, what he's doing to the climate. Yet here we are fighting for the right to use a natural material where your proposed alternative is a polluting plastic. How is that helping our environment? If anything, it's a complete contradiction. To give time to fellow members, I will stop there, but thank you for your time. 
Dear Mr. Chairman, thank you for the time to speak today. My name is Robert Cahill. I'm a Senior Vice President, North American Fur Auctions. Our company traces its roots back to 1670, 350 years in the establishment, establishment of the Hudson Bay Fur Trading Company. We currently have operations in the United States, Canada, and Europe. And our company has advocated for and has supported financially over decades the best practices in terms of, of uh, humane trapping standards, which you'll hear from wildlife experts who are here today to speak, and also the development of uh, the ongoing development of fur farming practices. What I would like to say is that trapping is undertaken in virtually every country in the world for many reasons, including scientific research, relocation. These traps are used to capture animals and relocate them, disease control, problem wildlife and ecosystem management. Essentially, wild fur is the byproduct of wildlife management and contributes hundreds of million dollars into the rural economies of the United States and Canada through commercial trapping. And this includes licensed trappers and tens of thousands of indigenous trappers. In fact, Mr. Chairman, it was our company that set those quotas that the speaker uh, uh, talked about in terms of conservation in the early 1800s. It was our company that actually set those up, recognizing populations were uh, reducing. We collect fur from the trappers and the farmers where it's sorted by type, color, size, quality, and sold to the world buyers who use a fur for any reason. Through our auction house, 100% of our furs can be traced back to the person who produces those furs. So that is one of the things we're working through, is taking that traceability system all the way through from that producer to the retailer and to a consumer. And in fact, we have some test cases where we're doing that with certain customers right now. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Agency plays a significant role in the oversight of this, as well as other agencies. And I'll, I would say that the quality of the fur has a direct relationship to the health of that animal that's either raised or produced. The North American uh, states and provinces are world leaders in the development of humane trapping standards and implementing and enforcing wildlife management systems that ensure that the harvest is sustainable. Our company has been here for 350 years and wildlife management will continue in every state in the United States, regardless of whether they're a fur trade. If fur is never used again in a fur coat, the wildlife management will continue. We have multiple examples of states uh, and countries that don't use the fur that are continuing to manage the wildlife at taxpayers' dollars. So what's happening is, and you can hear that what we've heard is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to end and we should save this. The reality is there's countries all around the world. I heard last week the United Kingdom, 400,000 red fox in the United Kingdom are harvested every year. Not one is used. This is management. So it's a case of either it's going to be used I'm by expert people. I'm going to ask you to wrap up. Yeah. But if, it's going to be you, used by expert people. If you have testimony, we can submit it for the record. Yeah, I will. And the, to produce a product or taxpayers are going to be paying for that. And that's the reality that you really need to look into before you make this decision. Thank you. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to testify before the committee regarding my opposition to the proposed ban on the sale of fur apparel, intro 1476. My name is Dr. Johnny Green and I'm the senior pastor of Mount Nebo Baptist Church in Harlem. I'm also the president of Mobilizing Preachers and Communities known as IMPACT, which is a nonprofit civil rights and faith-based organization with a membership of over 300 churches throughout the New York and Tri-State area. I co-founded IMPACT because I felt that the church needed to take a more active role in the life of the community to ensure justice and equality for all people. It is these concerns that bring me here today. I find it troubling that activists and leaders such as yourselves would try to take away our right here in New York City to choose what we can and cannot buy. While citizens here in our diverse and urban city largely populated by minorities, of being stripped of their right to purchase what they choose. People have the right to choose not to wear fur, but fur opponents do not have the right to determine how we reward our hard work. Americans believe in freedom, choice, and prosperity. We believe that with hard work and opportunity, you will be rewarded. For our community that has struggled for centuries to achieve equality and freedom in this country, to be now told what we can and cannot purchase is an insult. Everyone is entitled to their own personal beliefs, whether it be cultural, religious, custom. But opponents to fur are not entitled to encroach on the rights of others who disagree. Opponents of fur do not understand the importance in the black community. 
They do not understand that we have a long history of wearing furs passed down through our families for generations. They do not understand the role of fur as a symbol of achievement in society for our disadvantaged group. Our ability to wear fur historically has been a sign that we've finally become a part of New York society, something we were prevented from being a part of for hundreds of years. A ban on fur is a ban on black culture. For us, this is the pattern throughout history of blacks being told what rights they can and cannot have by the white majority. We cannot and will not stand for this injustice and this discrimination. A fur ban will not only negatively impact the black community, it will have devastating economic impacts for the historic fur industry and the city's entire fashion economy. This will destroy one of the last small businesses run industry in our city. Shouldn't we be protecting these workers who rely on the industry to make money to feed their families? Shouldn't we be preserving small businesses instead of destroying them? I'll wrap it up. In New York City will lose 7,500 jobs and 150 businesses will be forced to shut down if the ban of sale, if the ban the sale of fur. These are small family businesses that are being forced to shutter their storefronts that have been around for generations without fair say. A fur ban would be another way for the city to rapidly gentrify taking jobs away from first and second generation Americans whose parents and grandparents came to this country and worked hard to provide for their families. Thank you, Rev. I have to wrap up. Thank you. Folks, Again. a round of applause. You've been warned met multiple times. All right, thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. John Bar Bartet, Bartlett, Andrew Kaplan, Gia Poli, Ashley Byrne, Desmond Cadogan, To the esteemed city council members, my name is John Bartlett and I live in Chelsea in council member Corey Johnson's district and I urge him to support this bill. I'm here to speak for those who have no voice, the animals. I'm a fashion designer here in New York City, a member of the prestigious CFDA, Council of Fashion Designers of America, and have had my own clothing label since 1992. I am the winner of two awards from the CFDA, Best Newcomer and Menswear Designer of the Year and was also the recipient of the Designer of the Year from the American Apparel and Footwear Association. My work has been shown on runways across the globe and I have sold my collections in higher end department stores like Bergdorf Goodman, Barney's and Saks Fifth Avenue. For my fall 2000 collection, I reluctantly used fur due to the ongoing pressure from retailers and magazine editors who wanted a more quote unquote luxurious product. After many years of being out of fashion, the industry was seeing a resurgence in fur and I decided to jump on the bandwagon and use it. I didn't feel comfortable to be honest and immediately after I showed my collection in Fashion Week, I received a video from fellow designer Stella McCartney revealing the underbelly and violent reality of the fur industry. I've never used fur since then and have realized how heartless, inhumane and archaic the fur industry is. While smaller animals are gassed to kill them only for their fur, Larger animals like foxes are anally and vaginally electrocuted, and this is something the public does not realize. Steel traps are used for coyotes in the wild, another cruel practice, and many customers don't even realize that they are buying a fur-trimmed or fur garment. It is time for New York to embrace a more humane economy, one that reflects the values of the majority of its inhabitants. Our culture and society are evolving in so many ways and banning the sale of fur, an outdated and inherently violent and cruel product, would reinforce New York's stature as the fashion capital of the world and create new opportunities for the fashion industry to evolve along with its customer. There is talk that using fur is more environmentally efficient and green than faux fur, but there's no relevance in this either or argument. For one, raising the animal for its fur is not environmentally sound and causes a good degree of waste and suffering. And many of the new faux furs being developed are environmentally friendly as the demand for them grows. Irregardless, the issue is not real fur versus faux. And anyone using that as an argument to justify suffering is grasping at straws. Thank you.
You may, you may continue. Ready? Hi, my name is Andrew Kaplan. I'm a veterinarian in Manhattan District 6. Gandhi says the greatness of a nation and its moral progress can be judged by the way its animals are treated. As a vet, I can tell you I have firsthand experience with how animals can suffer. I can tell you about the mental breakdown that occurs when animals are crowded in unnatural confined spaces for prolonged periods of time. I can tell you about how traumatic and cruel it is to die by electrocution, drowning, gassing, and direct trauma. I can tell you about the unfathomable act of skinning another living being alive. I own a veterinary hospital on the Upper West Side. Having had enough of seeing my clients bringing their dogs into my hospital wearing fur coats and confronting them about it, I finally placed graphic signs in the window of my office showing alongside the coat that they would soon be turned into animals with their legs crushed in steel jaw leg hold traps awaiting a bludgeoning death by their captors. This in order to educate the community in hopes of preventing them from buying these coats. Having seen one of my signs, one of my clients who might be here today, her name is Andy Golden, owner of Golden Styles, a fur company in Manhattan, felt, felt compelled to reveal who she was. Incredulous, I asked her what she felt was the difference between her dogs that she loves and the fur-bearing animals that her company tortures in her business. To that, she had no answer. I then asked her how she would feel if dogs became the object of the fur industry in the United States and if her dogs were taken from her to be killed. Again, she had no answer. I last asked her if she had ever visited the fur farms of her business and experienced the torture for herself. She says, I could not do that. I asked why in her answer, because it would be too disturbing. I suspect any human being with feelings, i.e. all of us, given an opportunity to witness in person what we do to these animals on fur farms and in order to capture them in the wild would find it at least disturbing and at worst downright disgraceful, shameful, unspeakable, contemptible, and uh, at, w at worst. And if you don't, you would certainly be in the minority. The majority find this practice reprehensible and therefore it must end. We must allow our conscience to guide us. Um, I've listened to the prior testimony uh, f and, and I wanna uh, uh, th make some emphasis on the fact that these animals are being tortured and killed for fashion only. This is not necessary and just because we can doesn't mean we should. And finally, animals are not trapped for conservation. They're trapped for money. The, con the trappers don't wake up every morning saying, I'm gonna go work on conservation. They do it because they wanna make money. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Byrne and I am an associate director with PETA and a longtime resident of New York City. Over the past decade through my work with PETA, I've had a front row seat as consumers have rejected fur and as designers and retailers have responded to the demand for clothing that is ethical and eco-friendly. I've also uh, been on the front lines of the grassroots movement to educate the public about fur here in New York City. And I can tell you firsthand that so many people now who are purchasing fur are doing so without knowing that it's real. I can't tell you how many people, when approached on the street and told that their, their fur collar or their, you know, their fur keychain is real, will break down crying, they'll be disgusted. I've seen people take off their trims, throw them away. People are so upset. So many people just assume that, that something like that would, would, just, would not even be real fur. So that's one reason why we see this as a consumer protection issue. We know that most consumers don't want real fur. Um, designers and business owners who continue to use abused animals in their collection are a dying breed. And the future of the fur industry lies in innovations like faux fur made from moda acrylics or hemp that don't harm the planet or the animals who live on it. And many designers, retailers, and brands formerly in the business of selling fur have found that they can do quite well without it. For example, this past winter, a designer named Kim Cantor, who was the former di creative director of Jay Mendel, launched a line of sustainable faux fur outerwear ca called House of Fluff. She used the skills that she had initially developed in the notorious fur atelier to create her collection, citing a desire to produce fashionable, luxurious products without the untenable cruelty to animals and extreme environmental damage that she could no longer ignore in the fur industry. The collection debuted at Saks Fifth Avenue, and in just a handful of months, it has received accolades and attention across fashion press and business press, all saying the same thing, that an ethical approach to fashion is good for business. 
There is no reason why others cannot and should not follow suit. With so many options that are warm, beautiful, eco-friendly, and cruelty-free, there is no excuse to cling to something as outmoded and cruel as real fur. Thank you. Thank you. Hit the red button on the microphone. And remember to say your name before you give your testimony. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Gia, and I'm eight years old. I am here today because I am in support of intro 1476. I think that it is cruel to keep animals in filthy cages, electrocute them, and sometimes even skin them alive, all because they were born with a fur coat. As you could see, there are many people here today that want to ban the sale of fur because animals are in pain, they are dying, scared, and being killed. That's why we want you to support the animals, join us, and to make a difference. Thank you. Um, hello, uh, honorable concert council members. My name is Desmond Cadigan from Harlem. I've been a PETA volunteer since the 90s, and I have participated in many for anti-fur protests here in New York. As a gay black man, I am also a longtime advocate for both gay and civil rights. I was surprised when I heard that a preacher planned to protest this bill because some black people like to wear fur coats to church. This bill doesn't preclude anyone from wearing fur. Also, I follow Black Lives Matter and the NAACP, and I've never seen the right to buy new fur coats in any civil rights agenda. I saw the flyer that Reverend Green posted urging his followers to get on a bus to City Hall for what he called a free field trip, a free lunch and a chance to win a $250 American Express gift card with no mention whatsoever of the fur issue. As someone who volunteers for causes free of charge, I came to City Hall that day to meet this group and ask questions. I have the utmost respect for views other than my own and look forward to having an exchange of ideas, but the group was stage managed and neither I nor a reporter were allowed to talk to anyone other than the appointed spokesperson. When the group got off the buses, they were handled they were handed homemade, post, homemade protest signs by white pro fur lobbyists. Whether money changed hands to stage a stunt, God only knows. There are so many serious civil rights issues that it's demeaning for African American community to be used as smokescreen for the predominantly white fur trade. The fur trade attempted to inject the race issue last month at a hearing for the bill to ban first fur sales in California, Chris Holden, an African-American assembly member from Pasadena, said that he found such attempts insulting. In pledging his support for the bill, he said, to suggest that there's a cultural connection to this issue trivializes the point, and it focuses on a divisive issue that is not accepted by me, or, and it doesn't sell with any African-Americans I know. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you all for testifying. Uh, I'm going to call up the next panel, um, and I'm going to be strict on the clock uh, for, for many reasons, but mostly because we have 150 people who are left to testify. 150 people uh, at two minutes is about five hours. It's, it's going to be about five o'clock in a few minutes, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I am not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to be respectful of everyone's time. Up next, we have Honorable Thomas Cohen, Stephen Conant, Nadim Walt, Walt, Walter, or Waltel, Lenny Khan, Lou Ressi. Uh, those who, who have testimony can actually submit uh, their testimony for the record, and it will be treated as if you spoke on the panel uh, for those who, who have to leave. Oh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm sorry that the other members of the committee are not here. Uh, 
would have been nice to address them as well. My name is Thomas Cohen. I'm a four-term elected trustee and police commissioner from Long Island. I'm also the president of the Cheston Foundation of the Fur Industry of the City of New York, an 80-year-old 501c3 charitable organization that has been providing financial support to elderly and infirm fur workers. I'm a first-generation American and a third-generation furrier. I've been employed in the fur industry in the City of New York for 36 years, and I can assure you that I'm totally familiar uh, with the sale and the use of fur and related products, and I also understand the passion uh, behind this proposal, but I also know that it's a mistake. This proposal is an overreach on the part of government. The marketplace should determine what industries survive and which industries die. Dinosaurs were not legislated out of existence. Crime hasn't disappeared in New York because of restrictive handgun laws being enacted. As officials, you should know that you cannot legislate conduct or impose your personal beliefs upon the residents of the city of New York. This a proposal is about one thing and one thing only, and that's intolerance. It's intolerance on behalf of a group of individuals who are opposed to the livelihood and the, uh, the industry that I proudly support. I'm old enough to remember when paper bags were blamed for the destruction of millions of trees, and politicians determined that plastic bags were the solution. A ban on the sale of fur garments and related accessories will not achieve any of your intended goals. Determined fur buyers will take the Long Island Railroad to Nassau County, Metro North to Westchester, New Jersey Transit to New Jersey. Your actions will only force the closure of small companies and the loss of jobs and simultaneously decrease tax revenues in the city that it so badly needs. I ask you to look at the portrait of George Washington that's over there. And on the ceiling above everyone's head, there's a comment, and it's a quote, and it says, our commercial policy should hold an equal and impassionate hand. George Washington, this bill is not impassionate. Thank you, sir. My name is Steve Cowett. I am the co-owner of Henry Cowett Incorporated and Madison Avenue Furs. Our address is 118 West 27th Street in District 3. My brother and I are third generation furriers. I've been in the fur business for 42 years. Our business dates back over 80 years. Our business employs five full-time workers besides my brother and myself. If you pass this fur ban, these workers will lose their jobs and we will have to shut our doors. All of us are over 50 to 60 years old and a tough age to be looking for new types of jobs as we have been involved in the fur industry for the majority of our lives. The ban is almost criminal in nature as the Speaker of the Council and his backers will be closing thriving multi-generation business, family businesses. They will be putting thousands of workers on the unemployment line. They will lose millions of dollars of tax revenue for the city. They will add many more empty storefronts to the already saturated, to the already saturated city. This ban will take away our constituents' freedom of choice. Over the last few months, we have heard from hundreds of our customers asking the very question, how dare they take away our choice of fur? How dare they take away our choice of freedom? They are also asking the question, what comes next? Leather, goose down, silk, wool? Peter's got wool uh, uh, campaigns against wool? Where will it end? Speaker Johnson refused to speak to our industry nor has he visited our stores and businesses. He was invited. He, however, has spoken to a representative of PETA. Their agenda and goal is the total elimination of all animal use. They are against animals used for medical research that find cures for life-threatening diseases. They are also a tax-exempt organization who wants to put my tax-paying business out of business. We ask the council, and especially this committee, do your research and not base your decision on strict, strictly emotion. We all believe in humane treatment of animals, but how about humane treatment of humans? Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Nadim Wahid, and I'm the owner of Daniel's Leather. I had a written speech, but I ripped it about 20 minutes ago after hearing so many lies from the other side. Just to give you one example, one lady over here said that a fox pelt cost $10. If it would cost $10, I'd be a millionaire by now. It costs about $125. So there were a lot of things that were being said that are not true at all. I thought that I was listening to Donald Trump. <laughs> there, are, there are about 7,000 jobs, and I'm surprised that the one theme that is constant that I see, they talk about animals. I'm an animal lover. If you go on my Instagram page, there are 20 pictures of my dog. What about the humans? 
not one of these people mentioned anything about the people that would be suffering from this. Families, so if it's 7,000 jobs and each one with a family of four or five, imagine how many people we are talking about. Another lie I heard was that these people can be trained to do something else. That is not true. Um, for, to give you an example, there's a Russian couple that I worked with, 70 year old. All their lives they have made mink hats. That's the only thing they know. They have made a dignified living and now they're gonna be told to do something else? That makes no sense. Third thing is that I think that it is a slippery slope. Today they are starting with this thing. I have dealt with these people, they protested in front of my store. To them, even a service dog for the blind, they think it's animal cruelty. So where do they draw the line? So you should ask them, nobody asked them this one question. How do you feel about lamb or cow or egg or chicken? Then you should have seen where they're really coming from. Thank you. Hello. Hey, uh, my name is Louis Ressi, and uh, I've worked with Mr. Waheed here for 20 years on Orchard Street, uh, and I'm pro-abortion, just like a lot of everyone in here is as well. Uh, I just had to get that out. Uh, yeah, the, I just want to say the company I work for, uh, I just don't see the representation of the, uh, the, the consumer because uh, we're talking a lot about ethics and, and morals, but this is, uh, this is a consumer affairs committee. Uh, I don't see the representation, like as I said. Uh, if you were to look up our small company, uh, we've been around since 95. Uh, we have about 160,000 followers on social media, on Instagram. 95% uh, of those followers are New Yorkers. That's your constituency. Those are the people who are buying from us, who are following us. Those are the people who uh, vote you into your seat. And uh, I think any vote uh, for this fur ban is uh, a vote against your constituency. Thank you. My name is Leonard Kahn. I'm the last of 14 related cons who are in the fur business. I'm 91, and I joined my father's business after graduating from Penn State in 1947. And except for army service during the Korean War years of 51 to 53, I stayed in the same industry. During these years, I came to appreciate the difficult, hands-on, technical work that went into the making and marketing of our product. All involved, employer and employee, were like family. We depended on each other. I was able to put two sons through medical school and my daughter through college, after which she became a teacher. I appreciate my clients, many third generation, who are so loyal and enjoy the warmth and beauty of fur garments. God gave humans the right to choose what is right for them. This bill, if passed, will take away that right, and in so doing will deprive many hardworking people of the ability to make a better life for their families. And that is inhuman. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all. Can we give this to you? Uh, yeah, you could leave with the sergeant arm at the front. Just again, for the, for the record, if anyone has any testimony they want to submit, they can leave it at the front desk here with the sergeant arms. And it will be treated as if you testified up on the dais. Thank you. Are we picking from my opinion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, up next, uh, we have Michelle Cubero, Angelina Poli, uh, Leanne Hilgart, and Sharon Disco Discorfano.
Thank you. You, you. you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Angelina and I am 11 years old. I'm from Staten Island. I'm here because I'd like to grow up in a world where we don't torture beautiful sentient beings just to wear fur. Wearing animal skin is cruel, outdated, and involves pain and suffering you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. The animals do not deserve this kind of treatment. Whether they are shot in the head, anally electrocuted, trapped in wire cages, or skinned alive, it is extremely unnecessary and wrong. Brands such as Gucci, Michael Kors, and Coach have gone fur free along with many more. And if they can, so can you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Leanne Maley Hilgart. Um, I live in District 34. I just want to say thank you to our council member, Antonio Reynoso, for co sponsoring this bill to ban the sale of fur in New York City. This is a very special day to me. Um, when I was six years old, a girl down the street got a rabbit fur coat for Christmas. I didn't know anything about anal electrocution, fur farms, or that it took 40 lives to make that coat. But I was friends with the rabbits in my neighborhood, and I knew that many like them had lost their lives for this coat. It was hard for me to understand how, and at 10, I used my social studies fair report to research fur farming. What I found was so awful um, that I knew I needed to dedicate my life to saving animals from industrial cruelty. So 10 years ago, I started Vote, a pioneer vegan fashion brand to make winter coats warm enough for Chicago winter without the use of any animals, also sewn in New York City. I filled our coats with high-tech textiles like Primaloft Eco that keep astronauts and Arctic explorers warm so that there's no reason for innocent animals to lose their lives for fashion. There have been so many amazing cruelty-free winter coat companies that have followed since then. While still many people have no idea how a fur coat is made or how many lives are lost so tragically, as people have become educated, the demand for ethical fashion has begun to grow intensely. 50% of Americans prefer responsible brands, and two-thirds of millennials do, and it's growing. Plus, a recent study shows that 9.3 million vegan fashion hits, social impressions, were made over a 12-month period. I understand there's concern for the workers who currently make fur as a living. Fortunately, as fur making declines, this new type of luxury fashion, ethical fashion, prioritizes local and living wage production. So ethical fashion doesn't just include making things cruelty free or good for the environment, but also often prioritizes making apparel locally, um, supporting our city's garment district and artisans with living wage jobs, as my label has for sev several years. When I was 18, I participated in my first Fur Free Friday, and it's so exciting to be here today. The world is ready for the new era in fashion, where we are creating good through our industrial systems, using business to make the world a better place, not murdering 40 animals per coat. As a leader in the world, it's time for New York City to ban the sale of fur and begin the end of this barbaric, outdated industry to usher in a new era of ethical standards in fashion. Good afternoon, my name is Sharon Discarfano. I'm a New York City resident, member of the New York State Bar, and of the New York City Bar Association's Committee on Animal Law. I'm here testifying in a personal capacity in support of Intro 1476, prohibiting the sale of fur apparel. As an animal protection attorney and advocate, I have numerous times shared my story of a naive 16-year-old Sharon on a school trip to the Soviet Union when I purchased a fur hat as a souvenir. I share this story to underscore how each of us can and must change our consumer behavior as our own understanding evolves. I no longer purchase or wear fur because I now know what I didn't know then, how millions of animals are bred to die on fur farms every year, as we've heard today, how they're confined to tiny wire cages for their entire lives, how undercover investigations have documented horrific cruelty, including animals being skinned alive. With that individual knowledge comes the responsibility to make more humane choices. And when that individual knowledge becomes common knowledge, our laws need to reflect and enforce the collective belief 
a cornerstone of any civilized society, that cruelty simply is wrong. Opposition today has been focusing on the impact this ban will have on businesses. I appreciate that as the hub of the fashion industry, New York will be especially cautious about a ban similar to ones approved in Los Angeles and San Francisco. However, leading design houses, as we've heard today, including designers such as Gucci, Versace, Burberry, Michael Kors, and Coach already have renounced the use of fur. Publications such as InStyle and London Fashion Week have banished fur from their pages. As always, continued success for businesses will depend largely on their ability to adapt to the changing needs of customers rather than clinging to outdated trends. Thank you. I want to point out, just also given just a little extra time, as a member of the New York State Bar, the exemptions included in this proposed legislation do make a fair and balanced approach to addressing animal welfare concerns while being respectful of religious customs and practical in terms of already existing fur apparel. And furthermore, the penalties for the violations are necessarily proportionate to the considerable price tags of fur apparel. Dollar amounts need to be high enough to deter those Thank who you. might otherwise you deem submit the risk that. of we'll, we'll definitely take a look at it. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you so much. Hello. I'm Michelle Cabrero. I'm from Queens, Middle Village. And I'm deaf. And there is no, I have some questions for everybody. I'm just wondering if If I had my own business, I want to, I'm wondering how would you feel if I sold your skin? What if I ripped your skin from your body? What if you were left for dead in a trap? How would you feel? If I stole your babies and sold them? How would, how would you feel if your hair was ripped out of your head? How would you feel if you had to chew off your own hand for survival and to escape that trap? That is the reality of the fox. and the chinchilla, and the minx. And if you support the fur industry, that means the blood is on your hands. And just imagine being trapped for a long time in a small, teeny tiny cage. Your body is aching, you can't move. Can you imagine this? So that's all I really want to share. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you, thank you, thank you all. There are some on here, see. Wanna go up to the next panel? Frederick, Fred, Frederick Gelb, Michael O'Brien, Jacob Roberge, Alexandros Politis, Frederick Gelb, Michael O'Brien, Jacob Roberge, Alexandros Politis. Norma McDonald, Nicholas Sekas, Vincent Serechi, Ariel Colas,
You may begin. Um, is this on? Yeah, okay. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Alex. <laughs> my name is Alexan Josephotidis, and I'm a 17-year-old high school senior and an incoming freshman as an honor student at Baruch College right here in New York City. Now, the proposed fur band has played a huge role in my college decision. Although I'm beyond grateful to have received a full scholarship through Baruch, I was forced to leave many more enticing opportunities on the table due to the financial restriction they would apply on my family if this fur band were to pass. Now, the reason I share that story today is because between all this debate whether first should be used in fashion or not, I feel a very important group of people seem to be forgotten in this equation. Those people are the sons and daughters of those that will be affected if this ban of, fur, ban of fur were to occur. In other words, we have truly failed to ponder how we were affecting the next generation of hardworking Americans. For example, I aspire to become a lawyer, and my brother recently became a certified teacher for the Department of Education. Both of us were able to pursue our dreams and conquer lifelong goals thanks to our parents' hard work, dedication, and success in the fur industry. So as I stand before you here today, I don't only fight for the hardworking men and women in the fur industry. I fight for those who are merely too young to fight for themselves. I fight for the dreams of every son and daughter that simply has no control what their parents do to make ends meet. Today, as I stand up here, I fight for our future doctors, our future lawyers, our future teachers, and our future engineers. Now, for those who are looking at me and don't get the full picture, I'd like to ask a simple favor. I'd like every mother and father to go home today and ask their kids what their dreams are and take special notes of how their faces will light up talking about that dream. Now tell them their dreams are nearly unattainable thanks to you not being able to provide for them. And once again, their facial expressions will tell you the full story. But this time, their faces will be filled with fright and anguish. That's a conversation no parent and no child should ever have to experience, especially in the greatest city of New York City. So in the shortest of terms, the proposed fur ban is robbing our youth of opportunities and crushing their dreams in the process. Now that's what I call inhumane. Good afternoon, my name is Norma McDonald. I'm North American Sales Manager for OWS since 2009. OWS is a globally accredited, totally independent laboratory with 31 years of experience testing more than 10,000 samples for determination of physical and biological degradation in a wide variety of environments, including marine waters. In May 2018, OWS concluded 30 days of biodegradation testing of four natural furs and one faux fur in accordance with test methods ISO 15985 and ASTM D5511. These methods have been proven to simulate and accelerate the anaerobic, meaning without oxygen, biodegradation process that occurs spontaneously in a landfill over decades. <clears throat> the test prescribes placing the samples into inoculum coming from a commercial facility treating solid waste that would otherwise go to a landfill. The test measures biodegradation on the basis of biogas that is produced by the microbial activity. These tests were performed in duplicate and included a blank and positive control, and all requirements for a valid test were fulfilled. The biodegradation of each of the natural furs started immediately and then reached a plateau during the 30 days of testing, showing partial degradation. The rate and extent of biodegradation under anaerobic conditions was similar to other natural materials, for instance, newspaper, wheat straw, and oak leaves. Many natural materials require fungi to completely biodegrade, which are not present in an anaerobic environment. Biodegradation of the faux fur never started. At the end of the test, a biodegradation percentage of 0.3 was measured. The slight positive result is attributed to natural variations in the biogas production of the inoculum. Therefore, it is concluded that the faux fur is not biodegradable under these conditions. In addition, testing showed that the natural fur samples readily disintegrated within 30 days. The skin fell apart and disappeared, but the hairs still remained since proteins in hair are more resistant to decay. Additional research is recommended to test biodegradability under aerobic conditions, where oxygen and fungi are present, to complete a comparison between natural and faux fur. I apologize. Go ahead, sir. Council members, my name is Ariel Collis. I'm an economist with Capital Trade Incorporated, an economic consulting firm based in Washington, D.C. I was commissioned by the International Fur Federations of the Americas to estimate the impact to New York City of a proposed ban on the sale of fur products in the city. The results of my research are summarized in a report 
a summary of which has been sent to all council members, but the report can be made available to any council member that requests it. My research found that if the proposed city ban were enacted, in the first year of the ban, the city would lose up to $850 million in revenues from businesses that sell fur products and businesses that earn revenues from fur sellers. The city would lose up to $76 million in sales taxes on these revenues. It's estimated that up to 7,500 men and women would lose their jobs in the city in the first year of this ban. However, the ban would remain in effect not for one year, but for the foreseeable future. Over the first 10 years of this proposed ban, the city, the city would lose up to $7 billion. My estimations of losses come from first-hand interviews and surveys submitted by businesses that sell fur throughout the city, as well as financial disclosure firms from, fur, from firms that sell fur. My research shows that businesses affected by the ban include 150 retailers, wholesalers, manufacturers, and service providers who earn the majority of their revenues from fur. If the proposed city ban were enacted, it's anticipated that nearly all of these fur businesses would move their operations from New York or close down their business entirely. This assumption is based directly on responses from survey participants. 97% of respondents, representing 99.8% of the revenues among the respondents, stated that they would close their store or move operations from New York City if the proposed city ban were enacted. These are largely family-owned and operated businesses that would be closing down and relocating. Based on my research, most of these businesses were second or third generation family operated businesses that have done business in New York City for on average of 47 years. I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to testify today. Um, more of my testimony is available for, for your review. Thank you very thank much. You. Could you please uh, share how you conducted your analysis, all that just information for us with your testimony, if you could include it for us so we can take a look at the tax revenue, the survey, all of that would be helpful for us. Certainly, uh, the report um, will be included and submitted to the to the panel. Thank you very much. Dear members of the New York City Council, my name is Nicholas Sikis and the proud owner of a small fur business here in New York City. My council member is Justin Brennan. It is here, it is with great sadness that I stand here before you today. Sadness because I am starting to feel that my own city that I live and work in, the best city in the world is becoming unrecognizable. When extreme and radical ideologies help influence policy and ultimately our culture and way of life. You see, it was exactly my age now, 55, that my immigrant father, the founder of his own fur manufacturing company, was facing his own crisis. At the time, I was employed in the aerospace industry working as a systems engineer. As the eldest of three siblings who were still in high school and college, I quit to come back to the type of work I grew up doing, part-time since the age of 13. I believe it was Speaker Corey Johnson who said that it was the right thing to do when, he, when asked why he introduced this bill. Well, is it the right thing for someone, anyone, to decide what a person should wear or eat? People have their own cultural beliefs, economic, and personal reasons to consume a product. There is no right or wrong, just an opinion formed based hopefully on sound information. The fur industry is in the fashion capital of the world. Loving and respecting the animals is a cornerstone of our heritage, something that the activists like to distort. We understand that the only way to achieve the quality in pelts brought to market requires the highest of animal welfare standards. When did the mandate to create jobs get replaced with one that destroys jobs? When did the belief that one could work hard to try to achieve the American dream get replaced with a selective reasoning? When did the future of our business depend on political headwinds and not the marketplace and common sense? On the news last week, it was said that about one garbage truck worth of textiles is burned or placed in a landfill every second. Every second. Fur is natural, sustainable, biodegradable, environmentally friendly, and recyclable. We are part of the circular economy. My wife, who now works with me, also came from the garment industry. Together, we strive to provide all that our customers wish for in products and services. Our retirement and livelihoods completely rely on this business, as well as the people who work for us. It will be devastating, as it would be nearly impossible to start completely over at this point in our lives. It is difficult enough to operate and maintain a small business here in New York City, but to now have this taken away with a stroke of a pen seems unconscionable. I would like to remind everyone that we enjoy living in a democratic and capitalist society, that awards us certain personal freedoms and lets markets determine if a business is viable enough to continue. 
This government's role should be to adhere to these values and not take us down the wrong path of history. You have a duty to all citizens of this great city and nation to uphold these truths and not fall victim to extreme views that do not help our fellow brothers and sisters. I ask you, I implore you, to oppose this legislation to ban first sales. Please, do the right thing. Thank you for your time. God bless America. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Vincent Cerisi, and I am general counsel of the Echo Design Group. On behalf of Echo Design, I thank you for the opportunity to testify in this hearing. Echo Design is a family-owned and operated enterprise in operation since 1923. Today, Echo Design is one of the world's leading designers and manufacturers of accessories and home products. We sell our product in both wholesale and retail capacities to department stores and specialty stores, as well as to consumers directly through catalogs and the internet. Echo Designs develops, produces, and distributes market-leading fashion accessories driven by print, pattern, color, and texture, including scarves, wraps, hats, gloves, home products, handbags, swimwear, loungewear, beach, custom design products, and other fashion accessory items, utilizing the best fabrics and materials available. In addition to Echo branded product, we are the longstanding licensee of a renowned American brand in the fashion accessories category and design and manufacture product for many other prominent brands in the industry. We employ over 120 individuals in New York and New Jersey. Fur, shearling, and calf hair leather are routinely utilized by Echo Design as key components of the articles that we produced and sell under the Echo and other well-known brands. A ban of these materials would significantly impact our business and that of our customers. As such, we respectfully request that this council carefully weigh the ramifications of this legislation and its far-reaching effects on the lives of business owners, employees, and consumers who will be detrimentally impacted if this bill becomes law and effectively rob them of their freedom to make a choice in a country that was founded upon freedom. Thank you. I want to thank you all. I have a question for the gentleman who's here who spoke about uh, his business that he runs with his family. I want to thank you for being here today. Um, I apologize for the folks that testified when I was out. I was in a meeting that I couldn't miss, but I planned on coming back to hear from people who run uh, these fur businesses. So uh, thank you for, for being here today. I wanted to ask you um, <clears throat> the, the skill set that is used by uh, your, your family, your workers, to be able to manufacture garments and uh, sell garments. Is that not a skill set that could be used for other products that are not uh, fur-based products that are synthetic materials or other materials that do not involve the fur of the animals that we've talked about today? Are the skills so uh, particular and specific that it could only be used on fur and not any other type of garment or material that could still allow for the manufacturing of items that would still have a market in the marketplace, as you just spoke about. Yes, I was asking you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe the answer is uh, that they are not uh, transferable. Many of these, especially uh, in the manufacturing part of uh, making a garment, when you're actually working with fur itself, there are special machines, mm -hmm. there are special methods from start to finish that take years to apprentice and learn, and those are skills that really don't apply to anything else but using that specific machine to s mend the pelts together and, and to uh, be able to match the pelts, and it takes years to understand and know how to uh, do these things that these people who, the, the, the force, the labor force, is trained and working specific, specifically in that, uh, in, that in their, in their skill set to apply and very, I, I, I don't know what exactly to what they can put that. It's not, it's not rolling out lining or anything. That's only a part of it, right? That's the finishing part of the, the garment, if you're making a garment, uh, there's accessories or what have you. But the actual handling of the product um, is very unique. So it sounds like it sounds like we're not going to agree on one aspect, which is okay. Which is, um, I mean, I I do, of course. You could tell from my opening statement and from the questions that I asked earlier in the earlier panels. To me, this is a 
welfare issue, a humane issue, an issue of wanting to ensure that um, animals are treated properly and not unnecessarily um, killed just for the purposes of wearing them for what many would consider to be a luxury product. And we may not agree on that, but where I'm trying to understand if that is, if that ends up being the, the belief of the council, not just of me, but of my colleagues, how do we do things and to support family-owned legacy businesses that as you, I think, very articulately spoke about, a part of the American dream and wanting to be here and support a family and employ jobs, societies and governments evolve all the time and things that we used to find we were okay with, and I used an example earlier of, we used to think selling ivory was okay and then we decided that wasn't appropriate. What are things that we could do to support businesses and small companies who we want to still have manufacturing jobs and still have retail businesses, what could we do to support the industry, maybe not in the exact way that it exists right now, but are there ideas that you have on what we could do to continue to support businesses that are trying to do this type of work but would be potentially open to evolving and getting support to do something not exactly the way it is now, but something along those lines. Uh, again, you're directing that to me? Yes, to you, sir. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, maybe I'm not the expert on the panel here to address that entirely, but I think earlier um, one of the programs for Mark, I think, addresses a lot of this. Look, if I may. Please. Do you agree that we should protect certain animals? Yes. Do you believe that we might have the right to own pets? Yes, I, own, I have a pet. Do you believe that we might use animals for consumption to eat? Yes. So, but I, believe there are but I believe there are limits. I understand that, but not, I, not, I carte, also not carte blanche, but yes, I, go ahead, sorry. And I also believe that maybe there's animals that we should also try to avoid, right? These are animals that I'm scared of. And so the, ability, the, the, the distinction and maybe discrimination, if I may say, to prohibit wearing of animal skins when it's also part of what I mentioned, the circular economy, because we're using, we're using the entire animal. We're not letting it go you know, to waste. There's the makeup industry, eyelashes, compost, fertilizer, uh, pet food. It, 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 these animals have to be treated right for, the, for, for our industry because the quality of the pelt is dependent on it. So, yes, there's many things, absolutely. Everything I think was touched upon tonight, today, um, from coming up with better methods. I, I hear what you're saying, but my, I guess the, the, the difficult thing for me to bridge, and I have the conversation, I know he's still there, in the back with Mr. Oten, uh, is this would be a self-regulated um, system that is set up and I think given the, again, we may not agree on the exact language you would use to describe it, but given the, what I consider to be very upsetting evidence and footage I've seen in the past, I mean, some of the folks want to say it's all propaganda and it's all made up. I don't believe that it's all propaganda and it's all made up. I believe there are bad actors that are doing bad things. And if we allowed a self-regulated system I'm not sure we would get to the heart of the matter, which is how do you live in a more humane society? Now, I agree with you. I'm not someone who doesn't, who believes, you know, we're going to tell people they can't wear leather or eat meat or, or have certain uh, animals that uh, operate in their lives in some way. Uh, but I think that there are limits and to try to figure out what those limits are is really helpful. But in the, what I heard from Mr. Oten earlier uh, is a self-regulated system that has not really been tested anywhere else and where there's a disagreement just in the testimony that I had and the back and forth I had with him on science and on what certain scientists believe is humane and other scientists believe is inhumane, 
it becomes a difficult thing to achieve. And that's why I was trying to ask the question a few moments ago is, are there other more ethical, what I would consider to be, more ethical fabrics and materials that evolve us away from fur farming and from the trapping of animals, which in my estimation involve a level of cruelty to still support an important manufacturing industry, but at the same time says we're not gonna needlessly, unnecessarily kill animals just for the purposes of wearing them. We may not agree on that exact topic, but I'm trying to figure out are there programs, are there incentives, are there government grants, are there machines that could be used that we could continue to support the manufacturing sector, but not in the exact way that it exists right now? So if I could briefly answer that. I think, I think uh, many, there's a lot of valid questions there, and there are probably some solutions, and I think that's probably the dialogue we should be having. I think a ban doesn't make sense. We all probably know that. We're probably the oldest, um, you know, we've been cl clothing people since the beginning of mankind. Is that right now? Is that, does it make sense for 2019? Maybe not, but we can have an intelligent conversation on what do we do to, to make sure that if, if this is still something that people still want in some way, they have a, a reason to want this, whether it's culturally, for whatever reason, that those voices aren't just stamped out. I, I just think you just can't go one to the uh, one way to the, one way or the other. It has to be some kind of compromise to figure out the best way where animal welfare, which we believe uh, has to be at the highest standard, that that has to be incorporated. And it, and there are third parties, not n if, not your not either side taking part. I, if, if if there was a uh, respectfully, I am I am I think it's good that we're having this conversation and back and forth. If there was a way to achieve that, which hasn't I haven't seen yet, that would be a I think good conversation to have. But part of the concern that I had is today, even on that earlier panel when I was having that back and forth and we asked questions about the size of the cages that minks were being held in, if they're an average of 24 inches long and they're being held in a cage that is 36 inches long, these are things that I have very significant concerns over and I felt like there, was, there hasn't been full transparency from the folks that I was asking the questions to, oh, I don't know the answer, I don't know the answer to that, if we're gonna have a conversation about these things, I think we need all the facts on the table. If there are certain misleading videos, I don't wanna see them. I wanna know the facts. Yes. And I feel like we should operate factually on how things are. And to me, factually, if animals are being treated a certain way, I don't feel comfortable with that. At the exact same time, I don't want significant job losses, which is why I'm asking, are there things we could do as a city and as a government to continue to support family businesses, legacy businesses, to evolve, to still give something that's marketable and attractive to the public that moves towards a more humane society? And that is the balance that I am trying to strike, but I don't feel like I've been given a path to achieve that at this point. I was trained as an analyst before I, I was doing, came, had, had to come and do this. And I think that what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I think that we all have to explore on both sides to get the real facts. Because on both sides, if, if I may, we, there's a, some in, misinformation or maybe it's not clear. Uh, it's cloudy. I think that is first and foremost. And once the facts are laid out and everything, then you can put together a path to move forward. Uh, but prior to that, to just, you know, cut something off without knowing that, you can't. It's I, facts are really important to me, yes. and I really want to operate in that way. Yes. So if there is information that hasn't been shared with me, though I have been having conversations with furriers, um, and they have been trying to give me information, but again, I felt like today some of the the earlier panels that I was at, I don't feel like there was a level of transparency or level of self-reflection. I mean, I, I said, are there any, do you think there's any abuse going on? And the answer I got earlier was no. I mean, that is shocking to hear. You can be semi-self-reflective and say, you know what, there are some bad actors, 
They're ruining the name of our industry. We need to do a better job. We want to root them out. We want to, I didn't hear that. And, and that was one of the major representatives speaking on behalf of the industry who was here today. So it feels hard to have an intelligent conversation about this when there isn't that recognition or self-reflection involved. And so I'm happy to continue this conversation. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day and of course how emotional this is for you to be here today. And I appreciate the panel for being here today and sticking around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Jaina Sisbaro, Dr. Eileen Jefferson, Eleanor Mulbegott, yes. and we have a, Bru a Brumis Guard, Ecopel Fofer. Jana Sisbarrow, Dr. Eileen Jefferson, Eleanor Mulvergott, Brumice Guard. Nora Constance Marina, Paola Gavino, Katarina Travasso, Paola Gavino, Nora Constance Marino, Katerina Trabazo, All right, you may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Nora Constance Marino. I'm an attorney. I'm a former first lieutenant uh, JAG officer in the United States Army Reserves. I received an honorable discharge. I'm currently a commissioner on the Tax and Limousine Commission, although I'm not here in that official capacity today. I'm here in my capacity as a concerned citizen and also the president of an organization called the Animal Cruelty Exposure Fund. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, any of the testimony that's been given. It's already very late in the day. So I, I just want to point out a few things, a few points that are follow-ups of other people's testimony. First of all, I want to clarify something. An attorney for um, the opposition to the bill <coughs> stated um, that Lemon versus Kurtzman, which is a 1971 U.S. Supreme Court case, um, holds that this type of law would be in violation of the Establishment Clause, it wouldn't. Uh, my practice, my law practice specializes and concentrates in constitutional law issues and civil rights violations, and that's simply not true. I can't explain that in a minute and three seconds, but it's not. Um, I understand that people are worried about losing jobs and losing businesses, but Evolution sometimes just dictates that. And as the speaker said, it, there are times when inner reflection is necessary. Um, yes, we've decided ivory isn't appropriate, and there have been laws put in place in that. Years ago, a husband could legally beat his wife. The, the expression rule of thumb comes from the fact that a husband could beat his wife with a rod that did not exceed the width of his thumb. We decided that wasn't right. Laws evolve and change with society, and if New York City is going to be the progressive city that we want it to be, we have to engage in progress and realizing that animals are sentient beings. We are the dominant species on this planet. We have an obligation to other animals. And there's no choice here. We don't have to choose. You, can, you have to care about humans or animals. Guess what? We can care about everybody. And I'm in full support of this bill. It's a humane bill. It's a progressive bill. And New York City should be leading the way with these types of bills. Thank you. Thank you. 
My name is Caterina Trabazo, a professor at St. John's University. First, thank you uh, for introducing 1476 and the opportunity to speak in support of this bill. I recently learned that a few individuals are calling this a racist bill. It's unfortunate that anyone would use race to defend an industry that represents apathy, cruelty, exploitation, oppression, slavery, and torture, all which are not excluded to humans. I'll remind these same individuals that fur is used as a social status symbol of luxury and vanity, mostly worn by white privileged women. It is criminal for anyone to support an, an unimaginable cruelty, in, cruel industry, especially when we do not need to wear something which represents exploitation. Like humans, animals are not commodities. Another excuse presented was the loss of jobs. Like many other things, jobs, jobs evolve, jobs are not secure, nor should they be when it involves oppression. Remember that slavery was a business and legal and a personal choice. The fur, uh, this is one of the reasons the biggest names in fashion are no longer using fur. To the furriers, this is not your demise, that this is an opportunity to create more jobs with many new different alternatives. Fur is antiquated and wearing it in 2019 appears primitive. Be on the right side of history by ending the sale of fur. You can do this, New York City. Thank you. Hello, thank you for... Hit the, hit the button on the microphone. Oh. My name is Paola Gavino. I'm a canine behaviorist in New York, New York City. So almost all of us share a very special affinity with individuals of other species. Many of us share that bond with fur bearer animals. We share our lives with dogs and cats at home that are direct relatives of animals used in the fur industry. Thus, it's so painful to walk the streets in, of New York City during winter and see their skins on this place of, on this place of department stores, thinking that could be my dog, a member of my family. While animals sh that should be free displayed as things, fur is only beautiful in its original owner. That's why I'm speaking out today in support of Intro 1476. Each year, over 100 million fur-bearing animals die miserably in fur traps, many leaving their babies behind to die of starvation and other equally inhumane deaths. What we have been hearing here about fur farmers treating the animals humanely is a totally false. The truth is there's no humane or, res or respectful way to slaughter an animal or someone just for something so vain and selfish as a fashion garment. As a stewards of this planet, we have to be more empathic towards other animals and try to make their lives better. Although we don't think about it, their lives have a meaning and a purpose, and that's thus the life, as does the life of each of us. Their lives is their only thing they have. Lives they experience through their senses and emotions, through their, through their interactions with others and their environment. Animals used in the fur industry have been deprived of all of this. They have no autonomy whatsoever, no natural environment. We have robbed them of everything that is natural for them. Th thank you. Sure. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my views here. My name is Arnaud Brunois. I represent the company Ecopel, the leader in luxury for fur. We work with many internationally renowned fashion brands based in New York. After having reviewed carefully everything that is at stake, we think a ban on the sales of fur products is a good idea for several reasons that go far beyond mere commercial reasons. Bans already exist in other areas. They provide a frame and have a positive impact on society. For example, more plastic bags bans are being implemented and they have demonstrated their positive impact. Evidence shows that smart and judicious bans can shape greener and more responsible consumption patterns. 
burns and the trade of endangered species also already exist and are a very good thing. Wild animals are protected, protected, sorry, while it is still possible to have the look of fur from these species, thanks to the imitations available in faux fur. If a ban on the sale of real fur products would be voted, that would not mean the end of the fur look. It would just mean that there are new ways to present old ideas. Vegan leather is booming. Emerging startups are creating textile made from apples or silk made in a petri dish, injecting a new energy in the way fashion is done today. Regarding animal welfare, it's, even if we do not live in a vegetarian world, reducing the number of animals we use is positive. The scientific community, for instance, has long adopted the concept of reduction when it comes to animal testing. The concept of reduction is key. Fur bands help the textile industry to reduce its use of animals. In 2018, a 20% reduction in animal exploitation has been reported, which means millions of animals saved. So our vision is more recycling, more biofabrication, and less factory farming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for testifying. Appreciate it. I'm going to call up the next panel. We have Susan Romano, Eugene Seo, or Sale, Eugene Sale, Farah Daruvar, Donald Levy, Eric Hannerman, or Eric Hannergan. And again, uh, you can submit testimony at the front desk here if you cannot stay. We are also taking testimony uh, through email until Monday, uh, which you can uh, email to the speaker's office. Or if you cannot email, you want to write something and bring it in, uh, the, well, the, 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 the speaker's office will be taking it, uh, taking it until Monday. Head, uh, Ed ha ha Haweva, Matt Peck, John Pecanis, John Pecanis, Matt Peck, Ed Haweva, Stacy Paner Panarevs, Tinsy Stru Strum, Tinsy Struer, Leanne Barbs, you could begin testifying. Thank you for letting me speak. I am in. Uh, I live in Council Members Keith Powers District. I'm a small business owner. I've been in the fashion industry since I was seventh grade. And I am very much, I have passion for this industry and I have passion for the fur industry. I, had, I have rewritten this speech, but I have to rewrite it over and over again. I want you to understand the people in this industry are elderly. Please keep your voices down and they won't be able to use social media like you and I can. They can't speak for themselves. They will not be able to go find another job. I am in the apparel industry and I wanted to be present here so that you can hear me. Even in the apparel industry, salespeople can't find a job, yet alone you want someone that has only been working in, the, in this industry for 50 years or 40 years to go do what? They can only do washing floors. These are. Imagine your parents building a business with their bare hands, and then all of a sudden, the committee that I find in my committee, you're here to protect me as a small business owner. You're gonna take that away from me and from them. You talk about insatiate beings. You pass the most progressive, reproductive, anti-abortion I mean, abortion laws in New York. That is amazing. 
it is amazing that I have the right to choose when to, have, when to abort the child. But you're telling me that I cannot sell for that child is also 24 weeks and that is definitely a living being. You passed the most amazing ban to protect our environment and that's plastic. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. But then you promote anti, I mean, you're against the environmental at the same time. All the chemicals that you are saying that goes into faux fur, it takes 100 years for that to disintegrate. Please help sustain the garment center, sustain our businesses. Don't just think about parents, your parents. We are not professional politicians. I am here to let you know that I have worked since I was in seventh grade. Thank you. And I'm very proud of it. Thank you for testifying. Hello, Council, all of you. Who's here, who's not? Thank you for listening to our testimonies today. My name is John Petkanis. I'm 42 years in the second generation business. Very proud, very thankful for what was passed on to me and the industry I, I work in, I live in, literally live in. I have 10 employees, that's my family. My next to family, other than my blood, that's my family. And I support them and they support me and we support one another. They can't go find a job because they've been with me for 20 years and guess what, 20 years they never had unemployment. If you put out this industry now, you're gonna have thousands of people on unemployment, I promise you. And back to the beavers on the state flag, swimming downstream, if you don't have Department of Conservation, you better get some engineers because you're gonna have a lot of flooding, I promise, okay? It's freedom of choice. Let the small businesses continue. They built this country. They really did. And you're shutting us down for personal goals of certain people that have the wrong facts. The facts are totally wrong. I invited the whole council to my factory showroom. Nobody ever called me and asked, I'd like to come down, I'd like to make an appointment. I'll tell you all about it. I could do it blindfolded blindfolded. I buy skins from the auction. I know what grades are. The farmers, the farmers produce top quality because it's to their best interest. Their best interest is to get the better dollar. Yes, it's about money, just about politics. Politics is about money too, making the right decisions, you know? So please, come get the facts. We got the facts for you. Thank don't you. don't let us down. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for letting me speak. My name is Tina Struve. I come here from Denmark, and you talk a lot about the facts. Uh, I've seen so many facts here today that are not true and that I cannot recognize from my job from home. I am a veterinarian. I am the head of veterinary diagnostic department at Copenhagen Fur in Denmark. Copenhagen Fur is one of the largest fur auction houses in the world, and we pass the vast majority of the European furs to the USA. I'm here today to oppose to the ban and rebut welfare concerns. I have a PhD in epidemiology, which means surveillance of animal health and preventive measures. I have worked with mink in seven years, making sure that our mink get the best conditions through evidence-based research. Our standards does not allow any animal production unless the welfare can be maintained at an excellent level. And well-kept healthy animals equals better breeding results and a higher quality of the fur. In my job, I go to visit the farms and I work with the animals in all seasons. And I find that the animal welfare are very high. And that is because minks are allowed to mate naturally. They build a nest before they deliver. They give birth unrestricted, and they nurse their own youngs. And when it all ends, they are euthanized in a humane way just outside their cages. All this means that there is a very large potential for animal welfare. 
and therefore the farmers just have to take very good care of their animals to make sure that this po potential is fulfilled. In Europe, we have a welfare system, which is also part of Fermark. We have independently measured the actual welfare state of mink. It's an uh, external company who measures the welfare. We don't self-regulate. They've measured the mink uh, welfare on 2,700 mink farms in Europe. Based on very low levels of problems, the welfare turns out to be at a very high level in most farms. Openness and transparency are key in Danish mink farming, and our doors are always open to visitors. We are very proud of our animal welfare, and we welcome you all. If you visit Denmark, come see for yourself. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Leanne Barnes, and I'm a handbag accessories designer with operations in Los Angeles, Atlanta, and New York City. And today has been quite eye-opening in a number of different ways. I use both faux as well as what I call real, genuine hair on. And the proposed legislation I'm a little bit confused on because it says that the New York City proposed legislation says it applies to any animal skin in whole or in part with the hair, fleece, or fur fibers. Now, my understanding with the Los Angeles law is that that would not include hair on, cow, or shearling, or fleece, so I can produce there no problem. I am an ethical designer, and I believe in full sustainability and circularity. Can you expound upon what this, is this true that the law would restrict me and ban me from using hair on cow and shearling? As it currently is drafted, yes, uh, but the staff can get back to you if you have further questions or suggestions. Um, well, I just, I thought in their very first testimony with a veterinary that was speaking on behalf of proposing for the ban, she had said and stated clearly that animals that are used for food, their skin is a byproduct, and that's the skin that I use, and that skin I use on these bags and I use every scrap, even down to this little hair tie that's made by survivors of domestic violence. So I'm a huge proponent of using the entirety of a species and the well-being of animals. But I would hope that this law will be amended so that it won't prohibit me from participating in New York's amazing trade shows at the Javits Centers to help me sell my products to the world and be a beacon. Um, New York City offers so much and offers so much inspiration. I hope that you all <coughs> will take a look at the bill and make the right recommendations and not ban the promotion and businesses that flourish here in New York City. Okay, thank you. Your testimony is all recorded, so the staff will uh, over, over, will look at all the testimony given today. Any questions? I don't have any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next panel. Thank you. Roberto Bonelli, Nicole Hall, Nina Jackal, Paloma Iglesias Soto, Paloma Iglesias Soto, Drew Carnegie, Linda Mann. Or Jill Carnegie, sorry. And Linda Mann. Jill Carnegie, Linda Mann. Okay. May I begin? Uh, dear council members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Nina Jackal, and I'm the founder of Lady Free Thinker, a nonprofit media organization that publishes news and grassroots actions to build a more compassionate world for all species. Our readership of millions of people includes tens of thousands of subscribers who live right here in New York and care very much about animals and would like to see this bill pass. Um, I would like to testify wholeheartedly in support of Intro 1476 because the plain truth is that we no longer live in a world that requires inflicting barbaric torture upon animals for clothing. From coyotes chewing their own limbs off in a desperate attempt to escape steel jaw traps, 
to raccoon dogs living their short lives in pain and filth before being electrocuted and skinned alive, the fur trade is undeniably cruel. The rest of the world is waking up to this brutality and taking steps to stop it. New York has already, already fallen behind cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco, which have already banned fur as the fashion capital that the entire globe looks to when deciding what to add to their closets, New York City has a responsibility to send a message that animal suffering is never in style. There are two very clear choices here. New York City can take the ethical, commendable, and progressive step of banning fur sales or it can cling to the past and continue to endorse violence against animals simply because people make money selling fur. I believe that New York is better than that, and I hope that you do too, and that you will do the right thing by voting to pass intro 1476, ensuring that New York remains a leader in not just fashion, but in compassionate legislation as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, council members. <clears throat> My name is Roberto Benelli. I run an animal rights advocacy organization called the Animals Battalion. I have been a full-time animal rights activist for 11 years now. The one issue which compelled me down this path was a never-ending slaughter of animals by the fur industry. The opposition will tell you that this is simply a matter of consumer choices. What the fur industry truly is, is legalized brutality. The fur-bearing animals used by this industry are killed in numerous horrific ways, from steel traps that crush their bones to snares that choke them to death to anal and vaginal electrocution. Animals raised in fur farms experience malnourishment, disease, and forced cannibalism before they're killed. In countries where there are no animal welfare standards, these animals are even skinned alive or bludgeoned to death. A simple Google search will show you videos of everything I just described. I ask you to honestly see for yourselves. This is an industry that runs on animal abuse. The animals killed by the fur trade are no different than the companion animals you have at home. The fur trade victims are simply the free-roaming counterparts of the dogs, cats, and rabbits who are part of your families. If there were nothing wrong with the fur industry, its defenders would not hesitate to show you how their fur is produced. They do not do that. Nor do these family businesses show their children the process of how the fur is obtained. To their objections, I respond by saying I, like many of them, like many New Yorkers, am also a working class immigrant who has one time faced unemployment. That has never been a justification to support animal abuse. Council members, you have one question to answer. Is New York City an example of civilization or savagery? Because if we are to be leaders for the rest of the world, we cannot allow the brutality and vulgarity of the animal abusing fur trade in our city. I implore you to support intro 1476. Thank you for your time. Hello, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Jill Carnegie and I'm testifying today as a resident of Hell's Kitchen and a local business owner. Thank you to my council member, uh, Speaker Corey Johnson for championing this bill. My company is New Moo Vegan, which is currently headquartered in Brooklyn, and we have created and produced non-dairy mozzarella cheese. I'm excited to report that we are fully funded and have incredible distribution partners lined up to take New Moo Vegan cheese nationwide this summer. And what we have found is that the largest and smartest dairy companies are clamoring to work with us. And the reason is because they are finding that the dairy industry is completely unsustainable, both environmentally and financially. And I bring this up today because we are seeing that writing on the wall with the fur industry as well. If we can take something as quintessential as the slice of New York City pizza and replicate it in an ethical way without sacrificing taste or texture or experience, then I see no reason why we cannot remake or make over, if you will, an industry that you know, New York has always been proud to be a header on, which is fashion. And New York City is also an example of consumerism to the highest degree, which frankly I don't have a big problem with as a business owner, but that also means that we need to acknowledge conscious consumerism. Labeling issues have been brought up many times today, and that's a very, very big concern for conscious consumers who are overburdened with researching the nuances of labeling across so many industries with every decision that we make. 
When we are in a city like New York, which is not only progressive, but also a sanctuary city for humans, sometimes we need to face the fact that it is necessary to legislate compassion. And we need to take leadership and show consumers a better way. So thank you so much in advance for your support of this bill. Hello, my name is Paloma Iglesias and I'm a resident from Harlem. I moved to the city eight years ago and it's been eight years ago where I was walking down in Union Square on a cold December and got informed in a demo about the vile truth of this industry and the cruel and unfair standards that are placed for these animals that just want to live just like us. I mean, we're just lucky that we're born human. If we were born, what if we were born a fox or a mink? I'm pretty sure you wouldn't want to be skin. It's common sense. Coming from a warmer place, I even thought that fur was banned in the 90s. <laughs> Seeing all these gruesome videos and having the information at hand, it baffles me that people can still do this. I'm pretty sure that we all got introduced about the horrific acts of fur from even in the children's movies from 101 Dalmatians, and I'm pretty sure most of us were in favor of the puppies to be safe, alive, and away from the vain and evil hands of Cruella de Vil. This is something that has been longed for, especially in this progressive city. I'm in favor of this law to pass, and I'm coming from Puerto Rico. I've been eight years surviving the cold temperatures of NYC just fine without the use of fur due to the amazing technology and so many brands that are out there making the changes for consumers to be able to have what we need to stay warm, because that's the point of it, right? Everything that I've heard here comes from privileged people profiting off the lives of most vulnerable beings in our society, the animals. Privilege is when you think something is not a problem because it's not, it doesn't affect you. They don't see fur as a cruel because it brings them profit. The reality is that this industry is going to end regardless. Most of the furs in the city are sold in department stores. If they first face out furs, no jobs are not going to be lost. The small stores specialized only on fur in the city can move on other textiles. Full fur is the future. There's no excuse to use the fur of innocent defenseless animals for a fashion statement. It's an ego and all for status, useless and all about money industry. It's 2019. It's time to stop dragging the past into our future. A future generation does not want it. We, we are smarter than that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Mann, and I come to you as a person who had a wonderful career as a buyer of women's clothing. My career spanned an amazing 40 years because I chose to adapt to changing times. And now, these are times that call for change. We live in a time when it is no longer possible to deny what is happening. We can't say we didn't know, we didn't see. So I ask you with great respect to respect those who, although they cannot speak with words or cast votes, they speak more importantly to our hearts. I ask the fur industry to not mistake my passion for ignorance, and I ask them to not insult us with talk of sustainability, humane slaughter, or ethical fur. The truth is extremely different. Albert Schweitzer said, we have no right to inflict suffering and death on another living creature unless there is some unavoidable necessity for it. So it is on that note that I ask you, for the ones whose paws are crushed in steel traps, for the ones who are skinned alive, and for the ones who are anally electrocuted, why, if you have the power, wouldn't you use it to save a life? If I may paraphrase, whoever destroys a soul it is considered as if they destroyed an entire world. And whoever saves a life, it is considered as if they saved an entire world. You have been given a great, great gift. You have the opportunity to save the world. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Ka Karen Giberson, Jackie Oleman. Peter Speliopopoulos, Carla Dawn Burley, Karen Giberson, Jackie Kleiman, Peter Speliopopoulos, and Carla Dawn Burley. Harriet Nathan, 
Victoria Saporis. Jason Rogowski, Virginia Bor Boris O'Hara. Okay, great. You may begin. My name is Karen Guyverson, and I'm the president of the Accessories Council, a 320 corporate member not for profit based in New York. New York is the hub of our industry, and most of our members are headquartered here, have stores here, showrooms here, or participate in trade shows here to sell their products. We are, in fact, headquartered in the same building as Speaker Johnson, and we share the space with over 20 companies that sell and manufacture fur products. I have some serious concerns as the law is currently written. The title Fur Apparel does not represent the scope of what would be covered. In fact, as written, it covers shearling, hair on calf skin, and other food first items. These are not materials that our industry has traditionally defined as fur. So notifying our companies about this potential bill has been very challenging. In fact, most every designer that's been mentioned today that has given up fur, uses hair on calf skin, and many of them use shearling. Hair on calf skin is leather. It is a one step difference in processing the leather compared to the shoes that many of the people in the room are wearing. I'm concerned about the rush to push this legislation through. We know there will be at least 7,500 jobs lost, and we haven't had a reasonable amount of time to fully understand the economic impact of this bill as it considers these other materials. In addition to the job losses, we know that New York residents and our companies will do business outside of the city where they will undoubtedly purchase other items, buy food, and spend their dollars. Mostly, we're concerned about the slippery slope of a ban. We've heard many suggestions as the Furmark, and we endorse the choice of materials. Hi, my name is Victoria Tsapuris, and I founder and owner of uh, BSNU Company. Um, our store located at 208 West Story Street. It's a, a District 3, and our councilman uh, speaker, Kyle Johnson. Uh, we're a family-owned small business. That's my husband, and I have been uh, running for over 24 years. We mainly specialize in uh, high-end shirling coats, fur leather, and accessories that locally manufactured right here, right in New York, and we are selling goods, that accessories and fur and shirling right from our stores, fr fr right from our store. Um, and I'm here today to ask you and just really, really give you this message. Please, I ban the fur ban. It's gonna hurt a lot of people, a lot of families. And it's uh, these people, it's not, uh, most of them, it's not that young people anymore. They can uh, find, go and find jobs very easily. It's, uh, they, it's, uh, it's uh, not, it was before bringing it up, like it's how easy gonna be find a job. It's almost impossible. And that people, it's they like 47, 45, they have to go and study for something else. And like in my case, I have my husband and me in the same business, and it's a lot of, like you heard before, it's a family business where the husband and wife, the same business. We don't have another income coming. So it's like, a, what does that mean for us? It's like we're gonna woke up one morning right after this ban, gonna, if it's gonna go for effect. So, and we just have no job. We don't have no next month to pay rent, like our, our insur medical insurance, our daughter college, and any, any expenses. So it's not, I'm not talking just about me. I'm just talking in my, in my family. I'm talking, for example, for every single person. Just don't think about the number, 7,000 and a half, uh, seven and a half thousand people gonna lose their jobs. It's a really much more. Think about their family, about the kids, about the older parents. 
also I have a really Th thank you I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up yes please. appreciate it thank you okay um, hi my name is Harriet Nathan I currently live in Ben Callis's district um, I had my story prepared um, for days but it appears that the truth um, and New Yorker stories don't really need to be heard uh, many lies have been told today but here's the fact this industry is made up of proud, talented, and hardworking people, multi-generational, and family businesses. I was in a different industry when I was younger. I was a woman in, in big corporate industry, and I left that to come to this industry. I chose this. It was my choice to do this. I now work with my husband, and I have a small business in New City. But it seems that the council is looking to close many small businesses, including mine. My husband and I have put our blood, sweat, and tears and money into this business that we won't be able to sell that the proposed fur ban wants to shut down. We recently moved back into the city to achieve our dream of living here again and be closer to our business, back to the city that we love, that we thought was a proponent of small businesses. But if this ban goes through and we lose our business, we will not be able to stay and afford to live in New York City. The end of another dream for us. We're too old to get another job, to start again. We have tirelessly worked here um, in New York City for many years. We don't have a safety net. We only have our business. We have no other jobs, and our lives are 100% entwined. We've given all of ourselves to work here in New York City, to live here in New York City, the city that endorses small businesses. So now what? What do we do? Please don't shut us down. Please. Thank you. Arthur Goldstein, I represent the Accessories Council. I uh, just want to clarify um, one remark uh, that was made earlier. Um, the fur mark um, was described as self-regulating about three times today. It is on top of government uh, regulations, uh, and it is independent. So it's not like uh, the, the industry is controlling this whole process. It's whatever the rules that will be set up when the fur mark is in place. It is not self-regulated. That's just a key point I wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you. We'll call the next panel. We have Vanessa Soldano, Vivian Barna, Ellen Resnick, James Scottle. Joshua Catcher, Michelle Poli, Matthew Schwartz, Linda Obuchowska. You submitted testimony? Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Erica Scheinart, Laura Lepardo, Leonardo Ang Anguiano, Rebecca Wolf, Rebecca Wolf, Elizabeth Carrado. Vichelis Nicole. Okay, you can begin. Good evening. My name is James Scotto, and I'm a physical education and health teacher at a small school in Manhattan for grades 8 through 12. I come here in strong support of 1476, and um, I have to say, no matter how many times I hear a fur supporter, or industry members state that it's humane or acceptable or they love their animals, I feel like I'm in an alternate universe. Um, under no condition should any of this barbarism be occurring. <clears throat> this becomes especially true in a society that considers itself civil and progressive. The fur pan becomes even more urgent considering that this mass amount of suffering inflicted upon the most innocent and defenseless amongst us is all perpetrated so that someone can feel fashionable in a fur coat 
or put on a hat with a fur pom-pom on it. I'll never forget the day I looked into the fur industry and watched undercover videos. I was in shock for days. A few days, I could barely speak. I cried. I felt nauseous. I couldn't process the fact that what I was seeing was actually legal and happening to animals all day, every day. Animals who are abused for their fur are sentient beings who have complex emotions and feel pain and suffering, just like the companion animals who are beloved me members of many of our families. Fortunately, humans have skills to find employment and fellow humans to support us through transition. We don't experience the agony of being stuck in a trap or intensively confined or getting anally electrocuted or being skinned while still conscious. If it's humane to absolutely brutalize animals for fashion, as the fur industry members have said, then finding a job seems relatively trauma-free. What do the animals have? They have nothing but unimaginable suffering and misery. The only ones coming to lend a hand are those who will further brutalize the animal. If people in New York City in the near 2019 are okay with this, then there's no way we can call ourselves as a society civilized or progressive. The legality of fur is, no question, a horrific statement about our humanity. Thank you. My name is Erica Scheinart. I reside in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Thank you, council members, for giving me an opportunity to speak to you today. I want to thank City Council Speaker Corey Johnson for proposing this legislation that would ban the sale of fur apparel in New York City. I also want to thank my council member from District 39, my Park Slope neighbor, Mr. Brad Lander, for co-sponsoring Intro 1476, the Fur Apparel Sales Ban. Thank you so much, Mr. Lander, for supporting innocent animals who undergo so much agony to become unnecessary fur coats for humans. You are giving your voice to those who have none, but who, if they could speak, would certainly say, please save us from this horrible life and terrible death. I sincerely hope that all your fellow council members follow your example. This is the ethical and humane thing to do. The fur sales ban is especially personal to me because my great uncle was a furrier in Brooklyn in the 1930s through the 1970s. My mother, who was in her late 80s, remembers that our uncle made her mother, my grandmother, a fur coat with her initials inside. When my sister and I were very young, he gave us what I remember were mink tails that we used for our Barbie dolls. I was too young to understand that then, the terror and pain those minks went through. I now know that these beautiful animals lived, in an, lived an awful life in a cage and died a horrendous death by being gassed, drowned, electrocuted, or skinned alive. I loved my great uncle, but if he were alive today, I would have to ask him how he could continue to make fur apparel, knowing the torture of these sentient beings with feelings of despair, agony, and pain, just like ours, went through all their lives just to become a fur coat, a hat, or the trim on a pair of gloves. My mother and I discussed being, my being here today to speak in front of you. She, the niece of a furrier, grew up to become a lover of all animals. Can I continue? When no, I, just, just, this is because of the fact that we still have uh, I just wanted to read my people. last paragraph. It's important to okay, me. Okay, if you could do it quickly, that would be great. One of my personal heroes is the great founder of the ASPCA and the Humane Mo Movement here in New York City, Henry Berg. Henry Berg memorably said, men will be just to men when they are kind to animals. Please, council members, let's again show the world that New York City is a leader when it comes to being just and compassionate, both to men and animals. Please support and pass this animal protection bill into law in New York City. Thank you very much for listening. And, sorry, just hit the button, button for the microphone. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be rude by cutting anyone off. It's just trying to respect everyone else's time. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking to the rest of the public, and I appreciate it. I think I'm done. Um, but just, just, just being fair to everyone else here, uh, I, I'm, I'm not cutting you off because I'm trying to be rude, only because I want to be respectful of everyone else's time. Good, good evening. Thank you for having me tonight. My name is Nicole Fischelis. I live in Manhattan. My council member is Mr. Keith Powers. Although I'm born in France, I have worked for American store and retailer my entire career. 
starting in Paris, then in Europe for an American buying office who represented the biggest store in America, such as Saks Fifth Avenue, Neiman Marcus, Bergdorf Goodman, and Marshall Field. I moved to New York to become the vice president of Saks Fifth Avenue. Then I went to work for Ferragamo as their worldwide fashion director, and then finally with Macy's as a group fashion director and forecaster. Today, I have my own consulting company. My life has been involved with fashion and fur, and my family has worked in the fur business from Paris, London, New York. Fur has been part of generation of my family, and I am here to oppose this bill that could end this part of my life and my culture. As a child, I watched my father and his team and admire the craft, the beautiful craft of the handwork and the passion that has been passed from generation to generation. A fur is not a fast fashion, it's a dedicated craft that has survived wars and conflict and provided families with income over the generation. The fur business has also contributed to the prosperity of the New York fashion and luxury business. Fur is part of the image and savoir-faire of an industry which gained worldwide recognition as made in New York. Fur is part of the New York history and heritage. It's part of its culture and the thousands of immigrants who have worked and contributed to the economy of this country. When I was at Saks, I worked on the global image of the company and I discovered and brought many designers to America. I also supported a lot of American designers from their beginning, which are now recognized uh, companies and designers. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not finished. I know, but because of the time, we have to move forward. I'm sorry. You can submit that again for the record and it will be treated. Can I just say one more thing, please? If, I, we, just for timing, we can't. I'm sorry. My name is Vanessa Soldano. Uh, I was born and raised in Staten Island, New York, and I currently live in District 49. My designated council member is Deborah Rose. Unnecessary animal cruelty is all around us. However, it is more apparent and undeniable in certain industries than it is in others. The fur industry is one of the many animal abusing industries that is completely unnecessary in New York City. Not only are there superior, cruelty-free, and eco-friendly alternatives to fur, but there is an entire nonviolent, growing industry that focuses on creating compassionate fabrics and making compassionate fashion and beauty choices, choices that don't rely on anally electrocuting, leg trapping, drowning, neck breaking, skinning, and ultimately killing harmless, innocent animals who deserve respect. The cruelty-free fashion industry is one of great opportunity for those of you that are concerned about your money, despite the fact that there should be more prevalent concerns on your minds. If you are here because you're concerned about money, please be reminded that fur industry money is filthy. Fur industry money is blood money. Fur industry money exists thanks to people in this room paying other people to deliberately hurt and torture non-human animals, just like the pets we see walking the streets of New York City, just like the pets a lot of us in this room take care of and protect at home. What do you buy your families with the money made off of this torture? Would you want your child to bring videos of anal electrocution to show and tell? What kind of world are we continuing to create for our children? How can we teach them that hurting a domesticated dog or cat is wrong and illegal and wearing the fur of another animal is beautiful and legal? One more thing, I'm sorry. In America, freedom of choice Thank you. is questioned when there are victims involved. Thank I'm you. not the only person with these questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for testifying. And again, I do not, I'm not trying to discourage anyone from coming back here again. I really value your time. Thank you for testifying. I do value your time. Um, feel free to come back to City Hall anytime. <laughs>
All right, can, you, can I just get a show of hands? Who's here to testify in support of the bill? And who's here to testify against the bill? Okay. All right, Mark Goodman. Mark Goodman. Marvin Nguyen. Adrian Landau. Jen Othanos. Robert Englander. Aurora James. Timothy O'Hara, Peter Avazis, Peter Liakos, Lauren Cabralissa, Marcelo Zar Zarniak, Gary Zeltzer. Okay, yeah, all right. You can begin. Hi, my name is Jen Othanos, and my family has been in the fur business for over 30 years, and I've been full-time with them for the last three. Myself, my father-in-law, my uncles depend on this business as their source of income to provide for our families. This is all they've ever done, and without this, I don't know how mortgages, rent, or bills will be paid. Um, passing this fur ban will rip the rugs from under working-class people. My family is a family of immigrants. Immigrants who came here for the American dream and until now have been living it. They've been working hard to provide for their families and to send their children to schools. They have worked hard to provide for their families and continue to work hard to provide for them. New York prides itself on being a sanctuary city for immigrants and immigrant families. What you're doing is threatening to rip away these Americans and these immigrants of their livelihoods. The skills my family have are not transferable to other industries, despite what other people have said. And it's disheartening that city council members consider the jobs of these hardworking Americans as a small percentage of the city, implying that they don't matter, as the speaker showed in the video in the beginning. The polls stated in previous testimonies were collected online. I had to show a furrier I work with how to use Uber. So his voice was not heard in those online polls. He's also, an a lot of immigrants, a lot of people in the fur industry are green card holders, also people whose voices are not, are not heard to fight for their, their livelihoods. And it's disappointing as a New York City resident that only two council members are still sitting here when we started with seven. My family matters, My, our jobs matter, and this is disrespectful and disheartening. Is there, a, and also, is there a humane way, a humane way to tell my 57-year-old coworker who just finished chemo treatment that he's out of a job and has to start training in a new field? And then one last question is, all red meat sold in New York City from cows whose skin is then repurposed for leather. Is that a, is that a bill in New York City, a mandate in New York City that all, right? So I just see that as very, and extremely hypocritical. Thank you. Council members. Oh, thanks, Jim. Council members, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Peter Avassis, and I'm a proud member of the. And a I am a proud member of the New York City fur industry. My father and my grandfather brought me into the fur industry on 7th Avenue, 30th Street, 40 years ago. And one of the ideals my father instilled to me is that all people are entitled to their beliefs and their opinions. I know that New Yorkers believe in free will, free, think free thinking, and freedom of markets. A fur coat is just as much an expression of one's free will and individuality and taste as a diamond ring, a crocodile bag, or a cashmere coat. Why is the city council considering forcing a ban on fur when I can say that no one here in this room is forcing anybody to buy or wear a fur coat? A free market will determine what products are bought and sold. The market will become less free if the city council bans the sale of fur. I ask the city council to redirect their energies toward issues like poverty, education, crime, and transportation. I heard plenty of that beforehand today, listening to you guys. There's some major stuff that you guys are working on. And that's where we feel you should direct your energies. Uh, I ask the city council to please keep the market free and do not force a ban on fur in New York City. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Dear council member, member, my name is Peter Liakos, and I've been part of this industry for 48 years. My family history is in the business date back hundreds of years in Greece. They came to America in the early 1900s and continued their fur business in New York City. They became U.S. citizens through hard work and long hours and supported their families and contributed to the community. In 
In 2003, my oldest son, Thomas, finished his third year medical rotation at Graduate Hospital in Philadelphia. Shortly thereafter, he started feeling stomach cramps. My wife and I went down to the hospital to see what was going on. When the doctor came out to talk to us, we read his face. He told us he had stage four stomach cancer with the tears and crying and, and asking the Lord for help. Thomas, what he had, he knew he would die in six months. Despite what my family was going through, I could not stay with my son as much as I wanted to. We had to make sacrifices because of the job. My wife had to stay with him. I had to get back to workers. I had to continue the production in order to pay for the bills at the time with the cost of $50,000 a month of rent and salaries to keep going. My brother, who was a doctor, got my son into Sloan, New York City. Sloan treated my son Thomas with experimental drug tested from animals and chemotherapy for six months. He started feeling better, so he took his wife-to-be a 10-day trip to Greece. And, but on June 12, 2005, my son Thomas Michael Liakos passed away 13 days before his 29th birthday. <laughs> Today, all I have is my family, all the workers who depend on me. They're all I have to keep going. I've been working full time since 1971, and I proudly continue my family business. Thank you, sir. Man, will cause the, my six workers to lose their jobs and shut down the business of the fur market. These people would not be able to get jobs elsewhere. Fur is a unique factor in train skills and non transferable. Thank Please you, thank think you, sir. of our workers and think of our families that would just be destroyed. And thank you for listening to me thank and you. God bless. That word is about family. Think about our families. It's about we, we heard it. Thank you. Uh, we, we heard his, we heard his story. People, about thank you. Good, af good afternoon, my name is Gary Zeltzer. I live in Brooklyn and council member Heim Deutsch uh, is the councilman of my district and I urge him to support the bill. I wanted to address him directly but he's not here. He made a statement uh, stating that his concern was this bill would increase the level of anti-Semitism against Jews that wear strimals, which is the customary fur hat that certain married uh, Jewish men wear in the city. Um, I wanted to be honest about that and say if you're anti-Semitic, you're going to attack a Jew whether he has a hat on, a, ca a baseball cap on, or no hat on. So I don't think there should be any type of concern as far as uh, anti-Semitism goes uh, w in regards to this ban. The other statement I wanted to make was, if you ever Google men's vegan jackets, there's a lot of ugly jackets out there. There is a massive demand for, you know, cruelty-free clothing out there. Outside, somebody asked, uh, asked me, what do you guys wear, plastic? The answer is yes, the company's called Matt and Nab. They're highly successful and they make very fashionable clothing. So there is demand and if people enter this business uh, you know, with the vegan mindset in mind, I think you're gonna make a lot of money as well. Because there again, a lot of us vegans, you know, we have good jobs, we're, right, we're ready to spend money on good products. The problem is there isn't that many products out there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Hi, my name is Mark Goodman. Hi, my name is Mark Goodman, and um, I just want to bring a little perspective here. It's a fact that of all animals killed for human consumption, less than 2% of for furs, less than 2%, all the rest are killed for food. That's right, 98% of the animals that are used by mankind are to eat. I don't believe um, banning of the sale of meat would be something that this um, council would consider. Um, so if council can be a little self-reflective here, I think you might agree that this initiative is discriminatory and a little hypocritical, or maybe a lot hypocritical, and will f um, inflict severe hardships on a lot of hardworking families that have multi-generational businesses. This will put them out of business, and it has real, real consequences, as you can see. These are 
people who are, I don't know, not. Be, so um, I, I ask that you don't bow to the pressure of well-financed lobby groups that have used aggressive tactics that frankly use a lot of misrepresentation and fake information. The amount of pain this would cause to hardworking families cannot be understated, and personally I find it, um, I find it cruel and outrageous. Um, our country was founded on the fur trade and to ban it would be as un-American as giving up the freedom of choice or the pursuit of happiness. This is a pursuit of happiness issue. I think it's government overreach and it's a really bad idea. Um, and lastly, I really got upset when, when um, Corey was conflating conservatism with this bill. There is nothing there's no conservatism. It doesn't protect animals. It's, it's not a good bill. Thank you. No for a ban, please. Thank you. We'll call the next panel. Uh, Kirk Miller, Christina Detmer, Eva Didia, Maureen Medina. Kirk Miller, Christina Detmer, Eva Didia, Maureen Medina. Christina Liu or Christina View, Heather Greenhouse, you may begin. My name is Kirk Miller and I live in central Harlem. My council member is Bill Perkins and I urge him to support the bill to ban the sale of fur in New York City, intro 1476. <clears throat> 400 squirrels, 249 ermine, 200 chinchillas, 120 muskrats, 80 sable, 65 mink, 50 martens, 30 raccoons, 22 bobcats, 12 lynx, or five wolves. This is what it takes to make a single fur coat. What is a life worth? The trim on your coat, nothing, or everything. Millions of mostly wild animals are killed every year for their fur. Most are raised in tiny cages with deplorable conditions where disease, self-mutilation, infanticide, and other psychotic behaviors are commonplace. Others are trapped in the wild in painful traps only to be electrocuted and skinned alive to preserve their fur. Those who insist that the animals are not suffering are spreading bald-faced lies in the interest of making a profit. To date, there are no real laws protecting these animals. This is not a religious issue. This is not an ethnic issue. This is not even a partisan issue, as been pointed out. The Mason-Dixon poll shows that the 75% of New Yorkers who agree with this bill are evenly split between conservatives and liberals. This is an animal abuse issue. This is an environmental issue. Fur farms are huge polluters, dumping raw feces into lakes and rivers, along with formaldehyde, chromium, and cyanide-based finishes. Thankfully today, we have quality and affordable alternatives to wearing fur that involve little if no suffering and far less pollution. If we can prevent or diminish suffering and waste, then why not? If we can transition to more compassionate fashion, why wouldn't we? The bottom line is there is no excuse. Thank you. My name is Christina Detmer, and I live on the Upper East Side in Council Member Keith Powers District, and I urge him to support this bill. I have friends on both sides of the political aisle, including far left and far right. We have spirited, heated debates about a variety of controversial issues. This is not one of them, because this is this one issue and I think this is one of the few issues I can say this about, we have complete, unanimous, blanket agreement that killing animals for fashion is wrong. 
Legislatures across the country are increasingly prioritizing the well-being of animals, such as hot car laws, which we've all heard of, divorce and custody laws protecting the animal's best interest, and laws including animals in domestic violence protection orders. Society is changing its view of animals, and New York City should be at the forefront. We are blessed to live in one of the most free countries in the world, the United States. But even in the US, our freedom is not unlimited. The notion that we have unlimited rights to do whatever we want is absurd. Laws govern our behavior all the time. I can't drive 80 miles an hour on First Avenue or go to Duane Reed on the corner to buy opiates or DDT. Plus, the fear of going too far isn't a reason for not banning something that we agree is wrong. So we shouldn't ban anything cruel just because of the fear of overstepping? Also, this bill does not prohibit the wearing of fur. You can wear fur every day of the year. You can wear fur to come and visit City Hall. And I am going to venture to guess that nobody is going to go into your closet to confiscate your fur items. But this bill is taking the stance that New York City will no longer be a party to this industry's exploitation of animals. And no one even disputes that the fur industry exploits animals. Thank you. My name is Maureen Medina, and I live in Brooklyn. My council member is Carlos Manjaca. I'm asking you to please support intro 1476. I work in social services and help veterans find housing and employment. I say this to demonstrate that yes, we do care about people, but also to say that people with the right resources and opportunities can adapt. They can improve their situation and quality of life in spite of the barriers and trauma they may have faced in life. Animals are not that fortunate. Those opposing intro 1476 are concerned about their profit and self-expression, their fashion statement and status, and their personal choice. But they are forgetting someone. Rather, they are forgetting over 100 million victims that are abused and killed for their fur every year. Their execution is planned the day that they are born. It's simple. The only ones with the right to fur are the animals themselves. All of us here at this point have learned about the horrors that occur in the fur industry. When you consider what's humane, please ask yourself, would you want this done to you, your loved ones, or your pets at home? What I have to say is only a reiteration of what supporters of Intro 1476 have already expressed. Animals are not commodities. They are not products. Their bodies are their own. And the fact that we use traps to capture them is indicative of how we force our personal choice on them. Traps and cages are inherently meant to hold someone against their will. Those opposing this ban are directly supporting and promoting violence and oppression. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor and must be demanded by the oppressed. And since the animals cannot speak for themselves, since their screams are drowned out by humane washing, we will speak up for them. Thank you. Please have compassion and support intro 1476. Thank you. Uh, my name is Christina Liu, and I live in Brooklyn. I am a constituent of Council Member Brannon. As an animal lover and someone who also works in social services, I am here today to ask the City Council to support Intro 1476. Like the many people who stand before you in support of the ban, we can all agree that fur, the fur industry is an outdated, cruel, bloody, and murderous industry that profits off the bodies of sentient animals. No animals should be forcibly bred and have their life taken away from them, all for the sake of a fashion statement. The reality of fur farms is that these animals live in deplorable conditions. From the beginning of their life to the very last moment they are killed. There is nothing humane, ethical, or sustainable about using fur. There is nothing fashionable about an animal being skinned alive, animal electrocuted, drowned, or caught in snare traps. As you know, the fur industry is changing. So many high-end designers like Burberry, Galliano, Versace have turned their backs against the fur industry because they realize the cruelty that goes into making fur. 
Many of these designers have realized that fashion today should be socially and environmentally responsible and have chosen ethics over cruelty. They are staring towards a future in an industry that does not include the unnecessary killing of an animal. We need to stop the cruelty. We need to show empathy towards the suffering of these animals in the industry. There is no reason in 2019 that as progressive New Yorkers, we are taking a step backwards by wearing cruelty where cities like LA and San Francisco have taken the advanced steps to ban the sale of fur. Those that oppose the ban are only concerned about money. They are only concerned that they will not be able to make a profit in an industry that kills and murders innocent animals. They are stuck in their old ways and refuse to acknowledge that new technology and fashion is creating other sustainable and alternative means to fur. My question for those who oppose the ban, could you explain to your children what happens to these animals that are used for fur? Would you show them the graphic videos of animals being killed? How many of your children would be appalled by what happens to these animals? As a society, people have lost their connection with most animals and commodified them. Animals are treated as mere objects and considered products. For those who have pets as, at home, do you consider Thank your dog or cat as mere objects? Would you subject them to the conditions that the animals face on these farms? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Heather Greenhouse, and I'm on the board of Voters for Animal Rights. Um, I'm going to address a couple of the outright lies the fur industry relies on to defend their brutal business. One such lie is that fur is sustainable. That's honestly laughable. Um, it was ruled as false advertising by several European countries, and they are prohibited from making that claim in many places. The truth is that fur is toxic and unnatural. To prevent the skin from rotting, they use toxic chemicals, which are among the world's top five worst for toxic metal pollution. They pollute the air with greenhouse gases, water with ammonia and phosphorus, and rely almost entirely on fossil fuels. There's also nothing natural about forcibly breeding wild animals, confining them to barren cages, and denying them every single natural instinctual behavior before gruesomely murdering them through anal or vaginal electrocution. Another popular mistruth they're spreading here in New York City is that this bill would cause severe job loss. This animal killing machine represents only 0.5% of fashion jobs in New York City and their skills are transferable to ethical materials. Regardless, fur is a bloody barbaric business that future generations will look back in horror and shame. All industries continuously evolve for ethical, environmental, and economic reasons and this is no different. They have a choice to move on with the times or remain in the dark ages. The grandiose claims of job loss are ridiculous when the real issues are ethics, morality, progress, and innovation. Animals are not objects, commodities, and their body parts are not products. The fur industry is on the wrong side of history, and they know it. Only greed and profits drive them, but we have the truth, and we are fighting for justice. The passing of intro 1476 would represent a huge step in the right direction for New York City to show that we are as ethical and progressive as we claim to be. There is no right way to do the wrong thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for testifying. Up next we have Ryan Holt, Lester Wasserman. Nathan Semmel, Meredith Shriver, Rockwell Schwartz. Father John Blahos. Riaz. Box. Okay, you may, you may begin. You may begin. Hi, my name is Ryan Holt. I represent the producers in North America of fur products, so the, the uh, Canadian and American producers. I think some of the things that need to be addressed are the fact that in the United States itself has had a certification program in place since 1988. The Canadians have also had a similar uh, process in place since 1990. These things have not been brought to, our, to, a, to any kind of a fruition in this process. The fur mark that they talk about is actually a conglomeration of these animal, animal issues, animal 
welfare issues that are being put together under an umbrella. That's why there seems to be some confusion about why this layout has happened. The American system, North, the United States system itself has been adjusted seven times over the last 30 years that I've been involved with it to reflect both uh, advances in animal science as well as being able to address concerns brought on by public scrutiny. It's a very vibrant industry. It's a very well cared for industry. If, depending on your stance, it's either the second or third oldest uh, occupation known to man if you're a farmer. Um, we have a, a proud tradition of taking care of what we, what we raise, our animals that we raise. I've had several conversations with many people that have the same standards as I do that are actually in this room that are, that are supporting this bill. The only difference is when we get to the, to the use of the product, that's where we separate our views. Our, our farming community has great respect for the animal. We're penalized for any defect or any dirt or anything that happens to these animals. There's, it makes absolutely no sense at all to, to take any shortcut uh, we have been certified by veterinarians up until the last few years, until we've moved into this third-party uh, objective inspection system. Uh, we have um, the utmost respect for this, for this body being able to have control of itself, but to be able to, um, I guess, compare all farmers to a few bad players would be similar to committed to uh, comparing all government employees to what happens in Washington, D.C. I don't think any of us in here want to do that. But we just need to achieve balance and need to understand that farmers do love their animals, farmers do respect their animals and have nothing but the utmost care. And it really, it really boils down to a, a position of choice. Hi, my name is Rockwell Schwartz, um, and I'm here today with my dog, Biscuit, um, and we live in your um, district, uh, Chairman Espinal. Um, we are here today to represent the millions of animals who cannot be here to testify on their own behalves. Um, we are a city of animal lovers. There are over 1.1 million pets in New York City, and over half of households have one or more pets. This is why when people hear the biscuit was abandoned in a grocery store with no lower jaw and a broken front leg, most people are horrified. And this is why for most New Yorkers, the thought of someone intentionally breaking biscuit's leg is condemnable. We understand his pain and fear. Yet intentionally breaking animals' legs is standard practice in the fur industry. Likewise, the thought of electrocuting Biscuit or gassing Biscuit to death or in any way intentionally inflicting harm on him is a heinous thought. Yet these are all standard practices in the fur industry. Likewise, if you were to ask most New Yorkers if they would choose to kill Biscuit in any way, even the most humane way, just so that they could wear his fur, you'd be hard pressed to find a single person who isn't horrified by the thought. Yet, this is the foundation of the fur industry. The only difference, fur's violence is, in, is inflicted on animals who are out of sight and out of mind. Dogs just like Biscuit abroad, coyotes, foxes, minks, or rabbits domestically. Each one feels just like Biscuit does. Each one values his life just like Biscuit values his. If we wouldn't sell Biscuit's fur because he was born a dog, there is no justification to sell another animal's fur because they were born the wrong species. I will end today with two statistics. One, it takes most mammals approximately three years to decompose after death. We prevent fur from decomposing by applying toxins that induce allergies, cancers, and hormonal imbalances in humans. Two, there are 51 members of the New York City Council. It takes approximately 50 dead animals to create just one fur coat. If those animals could testify before you, and again, this is a room full of humans, but if those animals could testify before you, we know what they would say. Please, we don't have to die. Thank you. My name is Meredith Shriver, and I'm a New York City resident in District 7. Fashion has come a long way in recent years. A growing number of designers realize the negative impact the industry has had on animals and the environment and are taking steps to repair that damage. Luxurious, eco-friendly, and sustainable fur-like fabric not only exists, but are nearly indistinguishable from the skins of innocent animals. 
That ability to ethically evolve, improve our practices, and be environmentally considerate while causing the least amount of harm is the bedrock of a civilized society and something for which we must always strive. How could anyone justifiably condone a practice that profits off the torture and death of screaming animals, especially when cruelty-free alternatives readily exist? The clothing we wear can make a statement without causing harm. Just ask Versace, Gucci, Michael Kors, Armani, Tom Ford, Stella McCartney, and the growing list of other designers who have committed to fur-free fashion. All these designers and the 75% of New Yorkers who support this ban know that fur, whether a coat or an accessory, comes from the bodies of innocent animals who were barbarically killed. Killing a living being who does not want to be killed is by definition inhumane, period. Many against this bill divert to the same argument, that no one has the right to push personal opinions onto anyone else. Where that logic falls apart, however, is when there are violent consequences like producing fur. I proudly joined Speaker Johnson, my councilperson Mark Levine, and the other city council members who support this bill. I stand with the millions of animals callously murdered each year for a fashion statement who, aside from human greed and selfishness, could otherwise live full lives. For those opposed or undecided, I implore you to delve online and see the atrocities of the fur trade. View the horrors for yourself. New York City should never stand for or condone such violence. A vote against this ban is a vote for animal abuse and cruelty, and New York is better than that. Thank you. My name is Nathan Semmel. I understand the fear and uncertainty of the fur merchants in this room. I do. But to the council, I say these three things. One. They have been on notice for years. Animal rights legislation has proliferated. Just look at the circus bill passed by this very body two years ago. We've seen fur bands in LA, San Francisco, during London's Fashion Week and others. Top designers in their business have, out, have been outspoken about the cruelty of fur, declaring they will never use it again. So to be unprepared for this, or worse, unwilling to change, they really have nobody but themselves to blame. Two, stopping animal abuse is a moral obligation. And unlike in the past, high quality alternatives exist so that image and ethics are not mutually exclusive. Three, before the, before the fur ban, I never heard a single opponent dispute or utter a peep about the very impetus for this bill, animal cruelty. All I've heard is me, me, me. I'm thankful to my council member, Mark Levine, and the 75% of New Yorkers who support this bill because it is right. It is about compassion. It's not about money, politics, or tradition, which should never be a reason to continue to do something unethical. Council members have a choice. Protect the mink with an electric rod jammed into her rectum, or the mink merchant who has refused to even try cruelty-free alternatives. Protect the mother coyote trapped for days in a steel leg clamp, or the Canada Goose Corporation trying to convince a generation that social status and projecting wealth is what's most important. Protect the baby fox who has every inch of her skin peeled from her still living body, or the shop lying to its customers about it being ethically sourced. Protect the rabbits jammed into cages for their enti entire miserable lives, or the souvenir shop selling them as pom-poms on a hat or a keychain accessory. Protecting the profiteers over the abused would be contrary to the compassionate and progressive trend that is the hallmark of this body. My name is Mitchell Edelman and I am the Global Vice President of Dennis Basso and Jay Mendel Stores, which employ over 40 people on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I come before you to ask a question which is bigger than the issue of fur issue. It's the issue of freedom of choice. As one gay man to another, Mr. Johnson, how would you feel if we were here today voting to ban gay rights? Living in America gives us the choice to choose whether or not to wear fur. It is the essential, fundamental American right to choose. For someone who has spent the last 40 years in the fur business, which has provided my partner and I a wonderful life, I find it absurd that I am standing here today fighting for the right to ask the board not to ban fur sales in New York City. I believe we should not be wasting taxpayer money and time on an issue that most New Yorkers would find baffling to take away their civil liberty, their right to choose. As a man who has lived in the greater city of New York my whole adult life, I see the hardships of my fellow New Yorkers are faced with every day. We should be voting to help the homeless, 
helping the veterans who fight for this country and are unable to steady income. Our education system is in havoc. Most of the younger generation is fighting to have a decent education. The lack of funding for public service is devastating, which is why I do not understand why fur banning is the current top priority. Mr. Johnson, to me, my friends, clients, and colleagues, we all believe that this seems like a way for you to make a name for yourself. Please make time to help improve New York City, which you have been elected to do so. Stop taking away people's rights to make their own choices, whether to wear fur or not. Respectfully, yours, Mitchell Edelman. Thank you, thank you for testifying. It's 7.05 p.m., just for some housekeeping. How many of you are, are planning on testifying? Can you please raise your hand? Okay. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a five-minute break, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll come back. Uh, again, we're going to take a five-minute break. If you have testimony and you'd rather just drop it off, it will be treated just the same as if you're reading it. You can also email it to the speaker's office, and you have till Monday to do that. Uh, we're going to take a five-minute break. Thanks.
All right, we're, re we're reconvening. Uh, I want to call up the next panel. We have Lester Wasserman, Florence Anthony, Richard Tax, Ryan Holt, Erica Dingman. Lester Wasserman, Florence Anthony, Richard Tax, Ryan Holt. Oh, I think we called already. I'm sorry. Erica Dingman. No, we have it. We have it. Ramon Contreras, Stamatis, St Lilikakis, Alan Tax, Laura Taylor, Okay, let's begin. Hi, good evening. Thank you for your patience this, this, uh, today and this evening. My name is Steve Lilakakis. I work at American Fur Center here in New York City. It's a second generation fur company. And I gotta tell you, there's, one th there's a few things. I had a speech prepared for today, but I'm gonna just go off the speech altogether. The hypocrisy that's in this room today is uh, it's unbelievable. We're being called cruel by an organization that actually kills puppies and kittens and throws their dead bodies into dumpsters. We're being called immoral by an organization that was in this room today, touting how they shut down the circus industry when three weeks ago they lost a court case for staging videos. What's amazing to me is how this organization infiltrates this circus abuses an animal and pins it on another industry and it's perfectly legal. Then we have another guy that comes into this chamber with a, a steel leg trap, which is actually illegal in most states. The hypocrisy is amazing. And then you hear about designers who are out of fur, and yeah, a lot of them pulled out. They pulled out of a certain type of fur. They didn't pull out of the fur industry. When you pull up the meaning of fur, it's a fur-bearing animal. Doesn't matter, and I agree with you guys on some stuff. It's leather, it's suede, it's anything that has hair on it. And if you're gonna make a ban in New York City, you should ban everything. Not just a particular type of fur, because it, they're all fur bearing. Now, if you wanna ban fur, ban meat, ban dairy, ban poultry, ban eggs. This is the end result of what they're looking for. So if you're gonna cave in to a small minority group that's gonna come into this chamber and try to impose their will on us, then go all the way. And just one more thing that I wanna say. Thank, thank you, thank okay, you. Okay, thank you very much. This hearing wants to make me cry, not because of the animal extremist. Corey Johnson comes in here to push his agenda grandstanding for two hours, gets up and leaves after he is done talking. What about listening to his constitutes? I am not proud to be a long-term New York Democrat. Speaker Johnson mentions this week, leather will not be banned as the animal is not eaten. You mentioned in this hearing, it's okay to kill animals to eat. piece of paper go. Okay, I'm gonna just have to wing it then. I'm here to talk that many fur animals are eaten. That hasn't been discussed here yet. Rabbits are eaten. Afghan lamb is eaten from Afghanistan. Chinese raccoons are eaten. Chinese mink are eaten. American raccoons are eaten. All of these animals are eaten that are fur animals, and this has not been talked about. Okay, and they're on the band. There are many other leather animals that are not on the band that PETA states, I lost my quote, that they are killed only for their skins, including ostrich, snakes, alligators, etc. And they are not eaten on PETA's ban. So why are our animals that are eaten on the ban and their animals that 
that are, are not eaten, they are allowed. Thank you. Okay, additionally, Uggs, who is trying to get out of this and get an exemption because they say they're leather, it's not actually true. There's a quote from Uggs in their own website that says the animal is primarily not used, uh, is eaten, but it's not all. Thank you. This needs to be discussed. I would start with good afternoon, but it is evening now. So good evening, and thank you for the committee for the opportunity to speak before you regarding the proposed ban on the sale of fur apparel in New York City, intro 1476. I am here to ask you not to waste our time and resources on fur, but instead focus on what really matters, keeping our community safe. My name is Ramon Contreras, and I am the co-founder of Youth Over Guns. Youth Over Guns was formed in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting amid the national outcry for gun violence prevention solution. We demand that leaders and other stakeholders invest resources into local grassroots gun violence prevention organizations that work towards reducing gun violence in communities of color. Our founding members include high school and college students from across the, from across the city who want to be safe from gun violence at school and their communities. In November 2018, we partnered up with New Yorkers Against Gun Violence, and in June 2018, Youth Over Guns marched across the Brooklyn Bridge as 10,000 people. We carried a casket to symbolize the deaths in our community. We marched to demand evidence-based safety measures in our schools and in our communities that are more effective than policing, prosecution, and incarceration. We also marched because deaths and injuries in communities of color are barely given a second of any mainstream media outlet. Today, the City Council is examining whether to, per to permit the sale of fur apparel in New York City. Yet in downtown Manhattan, it is still legal to purchase guns and ammunition, and ammunition, and while the New York City Council task force, and, and all while the New, York City City, the New York City Council task force to combat gun violence is listed as an inactive on the City Council's website. It both shocks and saddens me that we are refusing to take action on the most serious challenge facing our city, gun violence. If our leaders want to strive to make New York City a true city upon the hill, and if we're focused on setting an example across the country as a truly progressive city, then why not ban guns and tack with a 30% increase in homicides across our city? It disgusts me to see what we are hiding from, that we are hiding from the issue of serious importance. A fur ban is historically discriminatory and a tactic to distract us from the real issues at hand. Let's prioritize what matters to our communities and make sure true progressive values are at the forefront of the party. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Laura Taylor. I'm visiting from Accra, New York, which is a rural community outside of Buffalo. I'm a SUNY fashion business instructor and a PhD student at Iowa State University studying fashion sustainability. Uh, my research focus is on pre and post consumer textile waste. I hope the committee finds my testimony helpful in deciding on this multifaceted uh, issue. In 2015, the textile industry generated 16.03 million tons of waste. Out of that waste, only 15.3% was recycled and 10.53 million tons landed in um, landfills. That's uh, EPA uh, 2018 report. The fashion industry generate, generates tremendous pre-consumer and post-consumer fabric waste each year, which negatively impacts the environment. At the pre-consumer level, fur manufacturers use cutting and sewing practices that minimize waste. These practices developed over time as a result of the high value of fur and the economic benefits of using the entire fur. The value of faux fur is significantly less as uh, synthetic acrylic is uh, inexpensive to produce. Less emphasis is given to zero waste cutting and manufacturing techniques in the production of faux fur. This produces higher waste at the pre-consumer level. At the post-consumer level, real, uh, real fur, um, their, the life of the garment is extended because it is typically passed down, where faux fur is typically uh, thrown away. At the disposal level, synthetic textile waste is hard to be safely burned due to its chemical composition, and it's uh, difficult to be buried in landfills because of its uh, slow decomposition rate. Uh, faux fur in landfills increase synthetic fiber particles in our soil and water. In contrast, natural furs decompose. Today we've heard that uh, enforcing this ban could hurt humans, 
and not enforcing this ban could hurt animals, and I'm suggesting that because of the lack of decomposition of synthetic particles that having a ban that on fur that does not also address the economic, environmental, and um, societal aspects of synthetic fur thank, is thank, bad for both. Thank you. Got it. Hello, my name is Richard Tax, and I'm here with my son Christopher. I'm a fourth generation furrier. Chris is hoping to follow me in the family business. We employ people, pay rent, and pay our city taxes. This is actually a very simple matter. This is a matter of choice. If you don't like fur, don't buy it. Protest it. That is your right. That is a right given by America. This, is, this should not be a governmental issue at all. Make no mistake, these people are coming to take away your fur, leather, down, fish, meat, milk, eggs. Yes, your New York pizza. Someone mentioned that today. Your right to fish and hunt. And yes, animal medical research that has saved tens of millions of people. They admit this. They have been applauding it all day long, OK? The argument that other cities are banning furs and that some de designers are using it is not a valid argument. This is just like saying to your mother, well, my friend did it, so so can I. Okay. This is called personal liberty and freedom of choice, which is the basis of our, gov of our great nation. And the, and the talk of workers transitioning to other jobs and the city taking care of them is a farce. They will be for completely forgotten by the city and the designers if this ban passes. To think otherwise is completely naive. Okay. I certainly do not believe that 75% of New Yorkers support this ban. I would like to see the questions asked the conditions and the conditions that the poll was, con was conducted. I assume it was funded by the anti-fur people. The animal extremists have equated furs to slavery many times today. Those are the type of people pushing this ban. Choice, choice, choice. Well, I still have that choice. I'm taking my son out for a nice bloody steak now, which is we'll get a thumbs down from everyone else here. But until the government decides to legislate against that, I'm able to. Council member, I would gladly like you to read my shirt. Uh, you have to read, sir, you have to sit down and you can't approach the dais and s speak, speak to the microphone. Can you, can you read it? Microphone. Can you, re can you yeah, read it? Yeah, I, I, I got 2020 vision, I can okay. see. Well, uh, this is a quote by Thomas Jefferson. Can you read it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, it? I got it. I got it. Can you read it for the record? You, I think your time is up. Can you, but that, can you please read it for you a can re, You can read it on the microphone. I'm okay. not here to read your shirt, man. Okay. A government big enough, a government big enough to take away everything you want is strong enough to take everything that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, up next, we have Pratiksha Patel. Patel. Patel? Yeah. Patel? Pratiksha Patel. Sylvia Heisel. Farah Salman. Meredith Shriver. Nathan Semmel. Thanks. Irene Gaudi. Rockwell Schwartz, John De Leonardo, Stephen Walsh, Chris Tapp, Leah Amanatitis, Amanatitis, Corey B, Mac Schmidt, Nicole Damon. Marianne Prasad, Kristen Berger, Caitlin Safferite, Rachel Eisman, Sherry Ramsey, Quiet Teresa Russo, Andrea Katz. Blair Marshall, you could begin. Okay, so I cut mine pretty short, but I submitted it for you guys to yeah. read your opinions. Um, I just wanted to say my name is Nicole Damon, and I'm a tenure resident of Williamsburg, Brooklyn. 
so city council member Antonio Reynoso is um, a district uh, council member. Um, basically, uh, when I was a kid, uh, my aunt said to me that um, animals were a test of our character. She said that we must treat them with kindness and not because they have rights, but really because they don't, because they're completely and totally at our mercy. So some people argue that wearing fur is a personal choice, um, but this is not considered the animals who, whose life had value to them. Um, in the name of fashion, we have condemned them to a life of confinement, monetized their bodies, and then labeled them do not dry clean. No one, I don't think anyone would want this to happen to their cat or dog. Um, so just because we've always done something doesn't make it right. And certainly no uh, tradition where excuse me, I'm very nervous, where cruelty is inherent is one worth keeping. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Pratiksha Patil. I live in Brooklyn. I am a small business owner, veterinarian, and co-president of the PT of PS32, my children's school. My councilman is Carlos Menchaca. Thank you for the opportunity to, to let me speak in support of the fur ban, oh. intro 1476. I've included animals in my circle of care and compassion from a very young age. As a graduate of Purdue University Veterinary School in 2005, I wholeheartedly accepted a professional oath to protect and do no harm. In 2010, I joined the National Disaster Medical System, serving the United States as a veterinary medical officer to widen my circle of care and compassion to include strays and farm animals caught in disasters. My role also includes caring for canine working dogs. I'm here today to broaden my circle once again. I, I consult on cruelty investigations, interpreting body posture, eye and ear positioning, and other cues to educate my audience on the stress and inhumanity of confined living conditions. I have reviewed the Fur Commission USA site and have seen the cages in seemingly endless rows across many buildings. Per numbers cited, in the US alone, three million mink were caged in, in 2017. Though the site claims that these animals are domesticated and are used to living in cages, living in a cage itself is a form of torture. Nothing thrives in a cage. I understand some of you may think about this issue through its economic impact. I too stop and think about my neighbors and others in this industry. I think about their livelihoods and have care and compassion for them. But I know that, given all of my experiences so far, that banning the sale of fur in New York City is the right thing to do for the animals and for the people who kill, cage, and skin them. Constant exposure to violence can be traumatizing. It's an injustice to the laborer who earns their living by locking cages and sharpening knives for their fellow humans. There is no glamor in this industry. Thank you. My name is Blair Marshall. I live in Queens, and my councilman is Peter Koo. Historically in this country, the most vulnerable have been overlooked and made use of. But we have seen the truth and amended our laws. Animal rights is one of the next frontiers. Animals are uniquely unprotected. They have no voice in the legislative process. We are their voice and we must be their voice. It is so important to remember defenseless animals are utterly dependent on us humans to be ethical and to not exploit them. To quote from the beloved children's book, Black Beauty, we call them dumb animals and so they are for they cannot tell us how they feel, but they do not suffer less because they have no words. We must listen to their pain. We must pass this bill, thank you. Hello, my name is Stephen Walsh and I live in nearby Long Island and I strongly support Bill 1476A to ban the sale of fur in New York because fur production is cruel to animals, unnecessary and environmentally unsustainable. unsustainable. Each year the fur industry kills millions of animals while they're still alive, subjecting them, them to electrocution, poisoning, gassing or neck breaking. Over the years, many fashion designers have stopped using real fur after realizing 
the intense cruelty and suffering animals have to endure. It is 2019 and people are now in favor of fake fur and other cruelty-free alternatives. Those who argue against the fur ban are selfish, money-centric capitalists who do not care about the animals. Freedom of choice should not apply as long as there are victims within these evil industries. The majority of New Yorkers, from what I've read, up to upwards of 75% support a ban on fur. As a progressive and compassionate state, we should align our actions with our beliefs and vote yes to ban fur. I urge New York to support this bill. Thank you. Good evening, my name's Sherry Ramsey, and I'm testifying as the policy advisor on legislation and animal cruelty for the voters for animal rights. I'm a New York City resident, and I live in Helen Rosenthal's district. I'm also a licensed attorney in New York, New Jersey, and Virginia, and I've also served as an adjunct professor teaching animal law here in New York at New York Law School and Cooney Law School. I support Bill Intro 1476. When I teach animal law to the students in my class, I spend a lot of time talking to them about animal cruelty. I take time to go over all the laws, and I'm very proud that New York is the first state to have enacted animal cruelty laws around the country, and many states modeled those laws. And I talk to them about some of the cases that I personally either prosecuted or helped prosecute of, of animal cruelty, and explain to them how our laws are enacted to protect animals. But inevitably, when we get to the part of the text, where we talk about fur, and I show them the videos. Undoubtedly, the students start to raise their hand and ask me how this horrible treatment of animals could be legal under our laws. The students get very upset when I show them videos like we saw today, and also some are even moved to tears. They cannot understand how this conduct could still be legal in our country. Um, they remind me that I just told them that in most states in this country, gassing animals is illegal. Why? Because it's considered horribly cruel. It's a terrible way to die. And so they can't understand why, if it's illegal in most states to gas animals at shelters, why is it legal to do it to animals here? How could we possibly conscience anally electrocuting animals? And I explained to them that's because the pelt's the only thing that matters and they can't understand that. Um, so sadly, I'm sort of unable to answer their inevitable questions on how this needless cruelty can still be legal. So I urge you to support this bill so that I can tell my next class that this cruelty is in fact illegal, at Thank least you. in New York. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, I'd like to start off by saying my name is Rachel Edgemont, and I reside in Belrose, Queens, New York, and my district council member is Barry Grodenchik. I'm here today, like everybody else on our team, here to ask you to please support Intro 1476 to ban fur in New York City. I believe it's high time for elected officials to discuss the issue of current interest namely the very urgent problem of animal abuse. Every day we hear about organizations and industries moving away from conducting and using animals for scientific research and or for profit. It is not surprising that mass media helps with the spread of alternative normative policies that prove how important animal protection is. But your animal cruelty laws are not enough for the protection of these animals. Therefore, many feel they can get away with the infringement of such laws and continue their path of abuse against the innocent segment of society, one who are and will always be dependent on our protection. I lived a life of privilege. As such, for most of my adult life, I have worn furs and skins of animals. On a day, on one day I realized that this privileged life I was leading felt incongruous and incompatible with the culture of humanity and morality that I thought was inherent in, to civilized life. Treating animals should orient towards only, not only animal laws, but also our own moral norms 
animal protection should be a priority for every self-respecting human being. Finally, I need to express to you that there is no need to be cruel to animals to stay warm or to look glamorous or to even combat malnutrition. If you choose to set aside this matter, you will have only shifted the animal cruelty discourse central to the U.S. national story. Thank you. And you will be responsible putting Thank you. humanitarians against non-humanitarians. And when these policies are being dis debated in your legislators, will you, which side will you be on? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next panel, we have Jeffrey uh, Geters. Jeffrey Getters, Geters. Charles uh, nu Nucleus Neo or Neocloas. Kim Salvo or Kim Salvio, Stacy Lippin, Samantha Ortiz, Terry Gravy from Fur NYC, Ta Terry Granny. Dimitri Filipidis, Thomas Lax, Alina Goikman, Ritalin Foreman, Eddie Ed Edry Wan, You can begin. I want to thank the council for the opportunity to sit before them and uh, discuss this matter. I'd also like to thank everybody who's here today for sharing their views, whether no matter which side you're on. Um, both sides needed to be heard. Um, I happen to be a vegan. I'm not a vegan. I happen to be a person who has a vegan diet. Um, I've been in the fur business for 35 years, and what I'm seeing today is I'm hearing two valid sides. Um, New York has always been a leader in the world in policy and, uh, and leading the way. I think that what all of us need to do is look ourselves in the mirror, think about both sides, and our council person, Corey Johnson, said something earlier. He said, if we could find a way to work this out, we should. I think that that's what needs to be thought about. Uh, I'd like the council to consider that. It's, I know furriers for a long, long time, and I don't know any furrier who wouldn't be, uh, who would have an objection to working things out. So I'd like for the council to consider that. Um, again, no furrier is that I know of, and I've been in the business for a long period of time, and we talk behind the scenes. No furrier that I know of has ever thought about being cruel to animals, and that's not their agenda. Um, and <laughs> lastly, I'd like to say, is we all need to look ourselves in the mirror again. When you point the finger at somebody else, you're pointing three back at yourself. I've seen a lot of anger on both sides today. And again, you, this is not the United States that I know of. This is not the country that I know of. And we need to consider getting together and working this out. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alina Goichman, and I want to say thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I will be testifying on behalf of Ivel International, a family-owned business that was started by immigrants. My father has been working in this industry his entire life and continued to do so when he immigrated here as a refugee. He dedicated his entire life by investing in this industry with his hard work, six days a week from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. This ban will cause him to lose his company, Ivel International, and he will no longer be able to support our family. His employees, who are over 50 years old, would lose their jobs and would not be able to find new ones, and in effect, also not be able to support their families. His business, as well as hundreds of others, will immediately go bankrupt and cause financial loss to so many people. 
Please don't take our freedom away. After all, this government is for the people and therefore should respect people's choices and their lives. This is an emotional, personal, and economical decision that will impact many lives. Many family-owned businesses in the fur industry will cease to exist in New York City. Families will suffer immensely because of the financial loss that would directly affect them. The critical concern of all the people who testify today is to support their families. As a child of an immigrant family who came to this country because of all the freedom and opportunity it offered, the decision of the fur ban would suppress our freedom of choice and in effect put a financial burden on my future as I study in college. As a first-born American, I value and cherish my country and hope that the decision will not limit my opportunity to succeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eddie Brown. Uh, I'm uh, living in Queens, and I'm a 30 years old. Uh, I'm, I'm, th I'm in 30 years in purposes between Hong Kong and USA, and uh, I'm an American Chinese and a family of four, and I will lose my job and many of American Asian related person making a living in the fur industry between USA, Canada, and Hong Kong are uh, lost their job. And now I don't understand because how animals support and human living. You worry about animals but not very a child. I came to America because it's a country freedom of choice, not to telling what can not and what can wear. Human eat beef and chicken, then where's the pet get their meat? come from. Many American Asian especially love to wear fur. I have emailed uh, my friends and family and business acquaintance and signed a petition, four pages to uh, 80 people to Ms. Marion, uh, the legislation director against fur ban. Please stop the fur ban. And more human to put resource in gun ban, not fur ban. Uh, Stop the fur pan. Thank you. My name is Rita Lynn Foreman, and I'm here today to speak on behalf of the Humane Education Committee of the United Federation of Teachers. We work with hundreds of teachers throughout the city to turn key humane education into their classrooms and teach our youth to demonstrate empathy, compassion, and kindness toward people, animals, and the environment we share. Today we have an opportunity to come together as global citizens and ban the unimaginably cruel act of the industrial scale killing of animals for their skin. Animals suffer immense pain and torture for humans to wear them. These innocent animals endure horrors that we would not wish on our worst enemies simply because people like the way their coat looks and feels. Luckily, technological innovations have already provided us with so many alternatives to fur that are cruelty free. I'm skipping a lot because a lot of it has been said in time so limited. Humane education educators work hard to teach our youth to be caring and considerate of all sentient beings. How can we do this effectively when our laws support industries that ask youth to dampen their empathy and be consumers of harmful products like those offered by the fur industry? Our laws must model the values that we want our youth to emulate. Help us follow the state mandate of humane education laws and support the end of cruel practices, practices by supporting intro bill 1476 and a just, sustainable, and equitable future for all animals, humans included. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for testifying. We have Jill Laurie, Sarit Shmuel Levitz, Frederica Miller or Mueller, Catherine Casey, Margaret Lee, Joyce Friedman, Yu.
Yuki Endo. Mitchell Adelman. Dolores Ferraro. Dolores Ferraro. Okay. Yeah, we may begin. Hello, my name is Jill Laurie. I am a licensed clinical social worker. Today I am here as the voice of the animals. Thank you, council members, for holding this public forum where the cries of the animals can be heard. Those of us who have been fortunate enough to have relationships with animals know that they experience pain just as we do. We also understand their capacity to love and offer us unconditional love. With that comes a moral responsibility on our part to protect and eliminate practices that cause them pain and suffering. In the case of fur used in clothing, this cruelty is perpetrated for reasons of fear, greed, vanity, and ignorance. The brutality that we as a society inflict on animals has repercussions beyond the pain of the animals. We are all interconnected, human and non-human animals. Just as when you toss a pebble into a body of water, it has ripple effects throughout, so does our cruelty towards animals boomerang back to us. Our desensitization to the suffering of other living beings perpetrates violence and compromises the fabric of our society. We know in our hearts and souls that no good can come from it. Rather than a choice between humans and animals, this is a choice between love and fear. So council members, I ask that as you review today's testimonies, you be compassionate enough to listen and hear the pain and suffering of the animals, wise enough to see the big picture of what condoning barbaric practices towards animals creates for all of us, humble enough to admit that we have been wrong for tolerating the, the abuse of animals, and courageous enough to act to remedy this injustice and pass intro 1476A into law. Thank you. Hello. <clears throat> My name is Catherine Casey. I'm a Midtown East resident in Keith Powers, District 4. I support intro 16, 1476, and I urge uh, uh, the committee member Powers to do the same. Unfortunately, <clears throat> the fur industry is by definition a violent and abusive one. That's the bottom line, and that's why it needs to go. We see storms of public outrage at, at news reports about dogs thrown from cars and lions killed as trophies. Yet that and worse is being done every day behind closed doors to millions of animals, and we call it an industry. Let's also call it institutionalized cruelty for profit. It's time for it to go. I'd just like to say for the record, others have, have focused on some of the more grotesque aspects of the abuse of the fur industry. But add to those the idea of being a wild animal immobilized for the whole of your blighted life with no hope of reprieve. That's no small thing. That's real, relentless torment that's an undeniable tool of the trade. Some have claimed a ban on fur would somehow violate our freedoms. The suggestion is obscene. Freedom doesn't or shouldn't mean freedom to indulge our vanity at the cost of other creatures' skins. Haven't we learned by now that brutality is seldom an earmark of freedom? Does anyone really believe we have the right to inflict a lifetime of desolation, fear, and pain on a sentient creature just because we want to? or that one's desire to flay another being for a status hairband should be protected or honored in the name of freedom. Common decency screams that we have no such right. Every incl inclination to mercy screams no. And by the way, someone had mentioned earlier uh, that nobody is representing the viewpoint of the consumer here. We're all representing the viewpoint of the consumer because we're all consumers. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Chair Espinal and members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs. My name is Joyce Friedman, and I'm a constituent of Council Member Karen Kozlowitz. I'm on the Board of Directors of Voters for Animal Rights, and I'm a former social worker. I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in support of 1476. I encourage the members of the committee and the full council to, for one moment, focus on the one basic fact this, of this issue and to ignore all these attempts to obfuscate the fundamental fact. Right now, at this very moment, there are tens of millions of animals suffering, becoming psychotic in cages, screaming in pain and traps. Right now, semi-aquatic animals such as beavers and their families are struggling in underwater traps they find themselves caught in, in which they slowly and painfully drown. These animals are why we're here today in support of this bill. So please, when considering your vote, think of these individuals, individual animals and please weigh the pain and suffering of them against the claims made by the fur industry and its supporters. For example, a veterinarian who gets paid by furriers says that animal welfare is high in Denmark on fur farms. How is it in any way humane to keep a wild animal in a cage and then kill them? It is quite simple, the fur trade is animal abuse. Personal choice, not when sentient feeling animals are being tortured. We all know, and you all know as lawmakers, that laws exist to restrict many of our choices. We can name thousands of laws that restrict our choices for good reason. And for the business owners who've made a living from this barbaric industry, they can sell clothes and prosper um, by using other materials. Experts have said skills are transferable, but the main point is businesses evolve and we evolve. People with support must adapt. For the millions of wild animals suffering and barbarically killed, this means everything. This bill means everything. So as council members, you have this incredible opportunity to take a stand against animal abuse and cruelty. We trust in your humanity and wisdom. Please lead us to a more humane world. Thank you. Thanks for giving us the opportunity today to speak and for staying so late. My name is Rebecca Milvich. I live in East Village, Carolina Rivera's district. I'm an accessory designer and I work in the fashion industry in Manhattan. All laws, trades, and societal traditions must be re-verified all over again by every generation and every individual for the sake of human rights standards, community health and enrichment, and to respect the ecological balance which includes the sentient beings that depend on our intellect and compassion to have a rightful livelihood. As every generation carries certain misconceptions, excuse me, delusions, prejudices, and inherent practices and in industries, only through constant rediscovery, unbiased research, and education can mankind and our society truly advance. Fur and skin is not fabric. These furriers don't actually know what this proposed bill is all about, as the majority of them have never been to a fur farm themselves. They turn the cheek and use words like strict regulation to hide behind greed. Wild animal welfare is not a concern. Only the quality of the skins and pelts are important. No real vet would recommend that a wild animal be bred in a cage, period. It is an industry that is regulating torture, not welfare regulation. There's nothing ethical about using animal skin or fur, even if the skin is a byproduct. I hope the designers here today and the council will recognize this as a fact. The furriers that are distraught have it easy compared to the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of animals that have been tortured for them, for their families, to make money off of vanity. I don't feel sorry for their business owners or the employees. They have had a lot of time to prepare. We have a problem in this society and it's called violence. I'll leave it at there. Thank you. You can go listening to the Jackson High of Queens and and volunteer for the Korean I can rescue non profit organization working with the South Korean adult access at the ship Korean dog 
at the New York City for adoption. <coughs> I suppose Speaker Cody Johnson to the interview 1476 to a cell phone of your fight in New York City. Your fight is not sustainable. No, no. And Nigeria, Pantagonia is not classic. And it is near expensive price as the candles. Fight industry are thinking Fox Fox would be replacing the other that many people will not wait is the year of Fox. At the end of the way, Fox industry, I can make money without using either Fox. Fox industry, I can search the Fox free store without selling Fox Fox. But it don't call Fox story a case when Fox free, if this place can do it, also can a century 21, a burning deal, law and tailor, South West Avenue, Off West Avenue, North Stone. Next is, if the fight is banned, they can partnership with the Pentagonia, with the Awe, Far Free Fashion Designer, and to sell their clothes at this major Japan store. At this photos below, below a dog's fan in China that sent dog fights at this grocery advice as other animals. And dogs are stolen from people's yard. Majority of the people around the globe uh, uh, are in support of farming in New York City because they are under no. no. Uh, and again, all New York City Council members, including Speaker Cody Johnson, at the basic Cody Kennedy desk addition even at the Union Square at this Saturday, if possible, at the need to kill Cody dogs at this desk fund, a dog need fund. At this reason, why? Uh, 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 the need to be a brand, even if you have an African white dog and, and coyote in the, you should not wear the alpha. Respecting your study, you can know. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to call the next panel. Tina Utse, Angelo Anastasio. Gal Galatia, Galatia As Aspro, Eric Ruskas, Ligia Silva, Pablo Nav Nav Navarrete, Pablo Navarrete. Hi, good evening. My name is Ligia Silva. I came today because I want to say to you people, I, I want to protect my job. I work for, in this market in 17 years, and I have three little girls I want to support. So if I lost my job, what can I do? I asking those people for fair rent. They come in to me and give me money for pay the rent, for pay the future for my daughters, how I go into my daughters and say, honey, I'm sorry, you can go to the study, the college, because mom lost the job. It's no easy in this time to find job. So please, I don't want to like a fox all in my, in my thing. There I have more people in the same place, same thing like my life. I want to say those people can help to the other ones. Why not continent in not close the business, close jobs for people. Why not help for people that come into the jobs? Why not help to the people live in the street? We prefer animals or we prefer humans? God, when creates the war, give to animals for what? For some reason. I don't want to say something else, but please, I'm really appreciate you give me opportunity to talk about this, but I want to give future to my daughters. Thank you so much. All right. Um, any, 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 any furriers that that uh, submitted a, a card and didn't get called? Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. So everyone who I'm going to call up next are all in favor of this bill. Being that's all that's left here. Oh, that's what's indicated on on this list, of course. Um, 
Again, if you want to leave testimony, you can. It's 8 p.m. Um, I think we've all heard it all. I'm sure everyone wants to say it as well. Uh, but uh, you can leave testimony at the table or you can email it. Uh, with that said, we have Jeffrey Munch, Maria Camilla Burst Bur Burstica, John Christopher, Rebecca Milvich, Habari Brisport, Christina Gavino, Lola Columbus, Michael Dolling, Donnie Moss, Louise Hazel, Yeah, we we'll have a few here. I'm just, all right, so let me just call these names up. The, the, the table's full, but let me just call names to get the idea who's here. We have Cindy Kaplan. Is she here? Okay. Miss Denise Walsh. Greg McGonagall. Marilyn Zucker. Okay, all right, you, you'll be the next and last panel. So, did you submit? Okay. Uh, cool. Yeah, All right, so um, hello, my name is Jabari Brisport. I live in District 35, Lori Cumbo's district. Uh, I want to thank you for your time here. I'm a public school teacher and a board member of Voters for Animal Rights. Uh, I want to thank you again for listening. I'm speaking in favor of Intro 1476. Uh, let the record state that I am a black man. I've been black my whole life, I promise, I swear. Um, and I want to say that no one in my big black family that I know of wears real fur. Um, my mother has this fake fur coat that she wears wears once in a blue moon. I have a winter coat lined with fake fur. It's actually made, um, it's a very soft material named Satifur, made from hemp fibers and uh, recycled bottles, and you didn't need to murder anybody and rip their skin off to get it. Um, so it's weird to me to hear that the fur industry is saying that banning fur is racist. It's, it's weird that people who look like me were bribed with a $250 Amex card and to coming to City Hall last week and holding up signs for a photo op. And it's sad that people who probably really needed that money were used and tokenized last week. And you know what's weird, but I actually find it not surprising, our, our country actually has a long history of using black bodies to further agendas. Um, however, uh, I rest assured knowing that any black person with a knowledge of American history can understand that sometimes an industry needs to die. Because sometimes that industry is being propped up by predominantly white people, predominantly white men whose main argument is that they'll lose their job and they don't care that that job requires making someone scream or that the job requires making someone bleed or that the job requires making someone die. New York City is a progressive leader in so many respects, but we're not in the 21st century when it comes to fur. So I sincerely hope the city council votes to bring New York City into modern times as opposed to sustaining an industry started by cavemen. Thank you. My name is Donnie Moss. I live in Council District 3. I, I support the bill. And I'd actually like to point out, Councilmember Espinal, that the vast majority, if not all of the people who remain in this room, Ha or support this bill, but we have nothing to gain or lose personally if this bill is passed. Yet the fur industry, which profits off of this uh, trade, th they're gone. So I'd like for you to convey to your fellow council members on this committee that the people who stayed until the end to testify were supporters of this bill who had nothing to gain if it, if it passes or doesn't pass. Um, I'd also like to dedicate just five seconds of my time uh, to for a moment of silence for the 100 million victims of the fur trade who will die this year. The veterinarian from Denmark, uh, she said she worked for the fur, she, she was a fur industry representative, said uh, she complained that there was a lot of misinformation being spread. I don't know if you remember that testimony. And in her next breath, she said that animals in the fur industry are euthanized. Euthanasia is an act of kindness reserved for sick and dying individuals. The fur industry doesn't euthanize individuals, they murder them. And it's this kind of humane washing that leads unsuspecting consumers in New York City to buy real fur thinking that they're doing something that's okay. This industry is built on lies, which is why it's hidden. 
Uh, I don't, uh, Council Member Espinal, I think that one of the fur industry reps said that you were invited into the showroom to see how they work. But have, the, have you been invited onto a, a fur factory farm where these animals are intensively confined and spin in circles because they've gone insane? A, a mink who spends, uh, who lives on 2,500 2, acres, an aquatic animal, is, is confined in a cage for life? That was just the beginning. Hello, thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Lula Columbus, and I am a New York City consumer, um, and I just wanted to add my two cents. Fur is completely unnecessary in today's society. We are not walking around naked like our ancestors once did. Today, a fur coat is considered a status symbol and or fashion statement. And let's start calling it what it really is. It is a skin coat because the fur rests upon the skin of the animal that which it is torn. Most of the time, this happens while the animal is still alive and conscious and completely aware of what has just happened. Its helpless, bleeding body is then thrown into a pile with other skinned animals, some still conscious, while they lay there in excruciating pain until they eventually expire. This is the material of horror movies. It should not exist in a civilized society. Many top designers and retailers have already realized this and gone fur-free, and technologies exist to produce eco-friendly faux fur. We stand you before you today asking you to finally put an end to this brutal, outdated atrocity by passing Intro 1476. Send it into the past where it belongs. Thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Dolling. I'm a Park Slope resident, and I fully support Intro 1476. I'm on the board of directors of Tamerlane Sanctuary and Preserve in New Jersey, whose founders are current residents of Tribeca and fully support this ban as well. Our mission at Tamerlane is to rescue and protect animals who are abused and neglected, and as a preserve, we are dedicated to the conservation and protection of wildlife. On our 336-acre sanctuary, we are home to coyotes, rabbits, and fox, the same animals that the fur industry would love to turn into a fur coat, a pom-pom on top of a hat, a pointless trim on a coat, a keychain, earmuffs, or a cell phone case. We are lucky enough to live side by side with these beautiful animals, and we are honored to protect them. I have seen what leg hold traps can do to a mother who was out looking for food for her children. I have seen coyotes missing feet and limbs, covered in blood, guaranteed to die a slow, painful death because they were so desperate to escape a trap. I have seen how the fur industry tears families apart. I have seen how the greed of the fur industry destroys lives, and I have seen how compassionate people cry when they see footage of what the fur industry does to these animals. At our sanctuary, we give tours to the public, many of whom travel to us from New York City. And on these tours, we educate people about the mistreatment of animals by human hands. What we see from our outreach is a generation who is turning away from animal cruelty. We see a generation turning towards compassion and justice. And we see a generation that is turning away from fur. We at Tamerlane urge the City Council to follow in the footsteps of other great cities and ban the barbaric fur industry from our own. When Trump was elected and people feared for their freedom, the leaders of New York City declared that we would be a sanctuary city for all who needed protection. From one sanctuary to another, please protect these animals who cannot speak for themselves and support Intro 1476. John. Oh, thank you. My name is John, and I'm from the Bronx, and I want to thank you guys uh, personally for giving us this animal shelter that we needed for so long, for so many years. State-of-the-art animal shelter, I understand, too. I mean, we're moving up, you know, not just any run-of-the-mill shelter. You know, we're, we're going to be a shining example to others of what we got and what they can have. And with this bill, we can also be that same shining example to others of what we've done and what we recognize and what we can become down the road. Not just us, you know, uh, but the little, the little ones, the little kids, you know, who are growing up now, you know, who need 
an influence on them, to make them better people than we are, you know, make this world a better place. And what better way to influence them? Uh, ra you know, we, ra we just by showing them that it's not just about us, okay? It's not just about us. It's not just about people, okay? It's about, you know, it's about the little hamsters. It's about the little mice. It's about the, the, the you know, that the animals we're killing in Africa that they may never see in real life because we still consider animals to be dumb animals. They're stupid. They don't know anything. They're not like us. You know, they're idiots. We throw them in a cage and we use them, you know? I mean, that's pretty barbaric thinking. And anybody who's actually had an animal look into your eyes and look into you, not through you or past you or at you, but into you, knows that they're just like us, you know? And, and let's go, 1476. Okay. Let's do it. Thank you, guys. Cindy Kaplan, Denise Walsh, Greg McGonigal, Marilyn Zucker, and yes. What, what's your name, ma'am? Felicia Greenfield? You, you may begin. You may begin. Good evening. My name is Cindy Kaplan. I am a native New Yorker, and my council representative is Alan Mizell. I am here as a representative of the voiceless innocence, the animals of planet Earth, in support of Intro 1476. It is well known and settled that animals not only have intelligence, they have emotional lives and experience physical pain as we humans do. The question is not can they reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Why should the law refuse its protection to any sensitive being? Jeremy Bentham, 1789, An Introduction to the Principles of Morals and Legislation. The bottom line is there is no rationalizing the torture of living sentient beings. It is unconscionable, no ifs, ands, or buts. As for displaced workers, my own heart goes out to them. Let's discuss how we can help them too, to transition, segue, sustain themselves during the transition. But as a civilized, progressive, ever-evolving, compassionate culture, society, and great city, banning the torture of animals must trump economic issues just as economic benefits never justified slavery. Many of the anti-ban arguments made here today, such as how it's economically vital to a certain segment of the populace, and how it is an important cultural aspect for the African-American community, could, not have been, could have been made in support of slavery in the American South once upon a time in this country. Wrong is wrong, and the time is here for the abolition of fur. This is an historic, monumental, defining moment in New York City history. Please vote your conscience and be on the right side of history. And thank you so much for giving us all this chance to speak and for listening to us. Thank you so much. All right. Hello, my name is Greg McGonigal. Uh, as a former resident of Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, I'm very happy that council member Justin Brannon is supporting intro 1476, and I encourage his colleagues to do the same. When I look at the other side, what I notice most is the mention of jobs and tradition. They feel if the sale of fur is banned throughout the five boroughs, they will have the, be the victim of something unjust. In reality, that couldn't be further from the truth. In the grand scheme of things, the actual victims are the ones without a choice or a chance. The ones who are bred in fur farms with virtually no space to move throughout their abbreviated lives. The ones who are caught in their natural habitat, left for days in traps without food or water, only to eventually be shot in the head. The ones who are skinned alive or anally electrocuted so they can be draped on a human's body, even though there are countless alternatives that are not only more affordable, but are extremely more ethical. The other side is worried about their livelihood. 
They want their fellow citizens to believe that if fur is banned, they will not have the ability to work in any other field that is less cruel. If anyone in this room believes that, they must give these men and women more credit. It may be easier for them to do what they have always done, but as we have learned time and time again throughout the history of our nation and the world, tradition doesn't justify something that is flat out immoral. There are countless opportunities for these individuals to work in fields, including apparel, where people would be happy to spend their money in a more conscious manner, including everyone in this room. However, as it stands right now, these men and women are contributing to something which is a blemish on our great city. We have an excellent opportunity to do right by everyone, and I sincerely hope that justice is served for all involved, including the true victims who have no say in this room tonight. Thank you. Thank you, members of the committee, for allowing me to speak in favor of the proposed bill to prohibit the sale of fur apparel in New York City, intro 1476. I also greatly appreciate that Council Speaker Corey Johnson and respective members sponsored this important and compassionate legislation. My name is Denise Walsh, and I'm from Bayside, Queens, District 19. My New York City Council member is Paul Ballone. The time has come to stop selling fur which is a product of the horrific killing of animals such as foxes, coyotes, minks, rabbits, and yes, even millions of dogs and cats in China. It is a fact, and it is the truth, that each such animal will suffer an unspeakable and barbaric death. It's awful. And prior to, the animals suffer tremendously by being kept in miserable wire cages on so-called fur farms. Wild animals love to roam for miles every day, but in these facilities, they are denied their natural existence, instead are perversely confined to small cages. How terrible. And those trapped in the wild fare no better. They will suffer alone until the trapper arrives to bludgeon them to death. Terrible. Further, in the US and other countries such as China, there are simply no animal welfare laws and regulations to protect these vulnerable fur-bearing animals being held captive. Think about it. The persons on the fur farms or trappers can do whatever they want, and, and indeed they do. They go on to kill these animals in the most excruciatingly painful manner and do so with complete impunity. Many persons have decided not to wear fur because it inflicts a hor horrific and painful death on the animals. Countless designers have dropped fur as well. The cities of San Francisco, Los Angeles, West Hollywood, and Berkeley have enacted bans on the sale of fur apparel. A recent poll showed that 75% of New York City respondents support this citywide law to prohibit the sale of fur, and I ask the committee to please always remember that. In concluding, as a society, we owe it to ourselves and these innocent, helpless animals to finally say no to the atrocity of torturing animals to death for their fur. As a fashion capital of the world, New York City can lead the way in making this happen. I respectfully request that you co-sponsor and support Intro 1476, the ban on the sale of fur apparel in New York City. Thank, Thank you. you for your consideration. <laughs> My name is Marilyn Zucker. I'm a teacher and a member of many animal organizations, including Anonymous for the Voiceless, in which we expose the horrific fur industry as well as other animal industries. Um, I'm going to go a little off my speech here, so let's see how it goes. Um, imagine you live near a large building. One day you enter and discover that your neighbor has been hoarding dogs. Row after row, cage after cage, hundreds of dogs, filthy wire cages with no room to move, no bedding, no diversion, filled with terrified dogs. They wait in cages until the day your neighbor drags them out with a choke, with a choke pole, clamps the snout shut, thrusts electrodes up their vaginas or into their anuses, and he electrocutes them to death. These dogs are foxes. Or imagine your neighbor prefers to torture cats. He breeds them, and they spend their lives in small, filthy wire cages until the day he gasses them. And then he skins them, and suppose the cats survive the gassing. He skins those cats alive. These cats are mink. You'd be horrified. You would call the police, and the abuse would make the news. We love our dogs and cats, and we know that they feel and suffer as we do. But we have somehow allowed the fur industry, an industry that exists through nothing but greed, to convince us that compassion should end with, with our pets. This industry is nothing but an industry of lies. Um, in preparation for today, I went on many of the fur industry's own websites, and I found that not one of them had true transparency. None of them showed the actual gassing, clubbing, um, 
drowning, trapping of the animals. They only showed happy animals in rows of cages. Um, they didn't show the babies taken away from the mothers before they were fully weaned. They didn't show any of the true uh, torture that goes on in behind the scenes in the industry. And thank you. Hi, thank you again for your time. My name is Felicia Greenfield. I'm an Upper East Side mom, a Keith Powers constituent, and I'm here to speak for those that don't have a voice. In the 80s, my mother actually worked in the fur industry. It seemed wrong as a kid, but if my mom was doing it, I figured it couldn't be that bad. And then I grew up. It's incumbent upon every person, especially those with your power to directly affect so many lives, to question everything. With the advent of the internet, we can no longer say, we didn't know it was wrong. The excessive physical and emotional cruelty inflicted on hundreds of thousands of sentient lives for the sole purpose of making a profit is disgusting and beneath the dignity of any decent human being. The greatest city in the world can no longer allow this. I spent time over the last week on social media reading posts and getting trolled by the fur industry. With complete honesty, I can say I didn't find one argument against this ban without a reasonable solution. The end of a family dynasty. My family's electronics business, started by my grandfather after World War II, shuttered recently because we didn't keep up with the times. We had to move on. Job loss. These textile skills are transferable, and we're in one of the fashion capitals of the world. So do what you do with any material that does not bleed. Freedom of choice. A, they're forgetting about the animal's choice. B, their choice is devastating to our environment. C, laws by definition regulate the actions of a community's members. C, smoking ban, plastic bag ban, loud music ban. D, if your choice requires the murder of innocent lives, it needs to be taken from you. Let me finally point out that every single person that was here from the fur industry were representing only what was best for themselves. Those of us still here to help the helpless have nothing to personally gain. We've given our entire day and evening just to implore you to make the only right, moral, and just decision for the greater good. So, arba le chaim y no excusa para maltrato animales. Gracias. Hello, thank you Council Speaker Corey Johnson for sponsoring the bill to prohibit the sale of fur apparel in New York City and to all who have supported it. My name is Elizabeth Argeve. I am a native New Yorker and I also have immigrant parents and I represent Total Liberation New York, an organization who's committed to shining a light on the exploitation and oppression of animals, giving them a voice and coming to their defense. Millions upon millions of animals are murdered needlessly by cruel and barbaric means each year only to end up little unrecognizable bits of fur to later be stitched together and sold for profit as fur trim, hats, coats, novelty items, or other useless trinkets. While there were counter arguments to try to introduce culture, fashion, or tradition as a valid excuse to this conversation, these arguments lack actual reason. Let us pause and consider where we'd be today if we stood by silently and did nothing in the name of progress based on these reasons alone. There appears to be a disconnect and unwillingness to accept any form of change or to experiment in new technology, sustainable fabrics. Perhaps it's having no vision for a cruelty-free future. Is that really what we want? This is a completely unacceptable model for New York City, especially when New Yorkers are calling out for a compassionate and humane city. West Hollywood, San Francisco, LA, and Berkeley are only the beginning of a growing trend of forward-thinking cities in the US to ban the sale of fur. New York must be next. We must be next because decent society cannot continue business as usual in the name of vanity, profit, and brutality. We must be next because the world looks at us as a fashion leader, and we must respond without hesitation that New York City is banning the sale of fur. I thank the City Council for their time and consideration for our city, our citizens, and the animals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the evening is not over yet. We have one more person, Shelby. Thank you. Good, good evening. 
Uh, my name is Shelby Harvey. I live in the Upper East Side as a constituent of Ben Carlos. And I'm speaking um, on behalf of myself as well as an eight-year volunteer speaking on behalf of the Voiceless Wild Animals that I helped to rehabilitate as a wildlife rescue center um, volunteer in, um, on Long Island for um, a great part of my uh, youth and teenage years. Um, I'm going to go ahead and skip a lot of the information that's already been touched on tonight um, by other uh, members as I have submitted my, my testimony as well, and that can be read. Um, but I do just want to um, implore my council member, uh, Ben Kalos, to take a stand on this matter. Um, I encourage him to um, support 1476 and move forward um, with the rest of those who have already done so to, um, to this point. And um, I hope that New York City can remain as one of the um, forward-thinking progressive cities that we have stood up to be. Um, in times previously and join Los Angeles and San Francisco um, as one of the um, forward-thinking and progressive uh, fashion industry leaders today. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for staying behind to listen to us. <laughs> My name is Desiree Matos. I'm a social worker and I'm also the president of a nonprofit organization called Keep Me Warm Dog Houses that gives free shelter to dogs that are being neglected in their owners' backyards, not allowed to live indoors with their families. Um, my council member is Barry Gudenchik and um, in favor of intro 1476. The fur industry has been in business for hundreds of years. No one really knew how these furs were made or even gave it a second thought. Today, with the accessibility of the internet and Google searches, we know all too well about the torture and slaughter of beautiful, innocent animals for their fur. We know about the fur farms, where animals are kept in filthy, cramped cages, where they're denied everything that is natural to them. We know about the excruciatingly painful and horrific torture and slaughter for so-called fashion and status. There is nothing glamorous about this blood trade. What has been done behind closed doors, far away from the fancy fur shops and away from the public view can now be seen with a simple Google search and a click of a mouse. Now we know, the secret is out. No more business as usual, turning away or ignoring the truth. Those who buy fur, those who manufacture and sell it have blood on their hands. They didn't give these animals life and they should not be allowed to take it from them. A great majority of humans possess the ability to feel compassion, empathy, sorrow, and regret, especially for those who are defenseless and voiceless. A new day is dawning, and we are evolving and realizing that just because an industry has been around for hundreds of years doesn't mean it should continue. It's wrong, inhumane, cruel, and barbaric. We don't need to wear fur. There are many alternatives that don't involve skins of animals that are just as warm and fashionable. In the words of Dr. Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. We know we can do better for the animals. Today is the day. New York City is the place. Fur Free NYC! Woo! All right, taking advantage of the last few seconds. <laughs> All right, with, with that said, um, I'm going to get home to my cat, Betty, who's been alone Yay! for over... 12 hours now. She's probably going crazy. So uh, this meeting is adjourned Thank and you. the process is this is the speaker's bill. I'm sure he's going to go through all the testimony with his staff and then uh, we'll have updates Thank from you. the staff. Thank you.